Preface to California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Seidel. California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. Preface. That appetite comes by eating, I have found to be as true in the matter of geography as in the affairs of the table. After long wanderings among the incomparable forests and mountains, and by the romantic shores of the most scenic and diversified of our states, I fell an easy prey to the beckonings of the other principal feature of California's topography, the dreamy, dreary desert. Long ago, on short expeditions into and across it at various points, I had fallen under its inexplicable charm. Now I determined to know it more closely by daily and nightly intercourse through months of travel in its sun-blasted solitudes. Gaining the experience I desired at the price, certainly of some discomfort, and possibly of a trifling degree of danger, merely enough for spice. This volume, then, is the fruit of over two years' continuous camping and traveling on the desert. It might more exactly be named Colorado Desert Trails than California Desert Trails, since there are, within this state, other expanses of desert, such as the Mojave, contiguous on the north to the region I describe, which are not touched upon in the book. But there seemed a danger of confusion in the other name, since, on a casual site, the word Colorado in the title might give the impression that the subject matter was some region in the state of that name. The tract I deal with is, in truth, unfortunately named, though the misfortune is accidental, since when it was labeled in 1853, there was no state of Colorado, and out-and-out -out Coloradans might justly petition our common uncle that the mere suspicion of harboring a desert should be lifted from them and the odium plainly fixed upon the rival tourist-claiming nephew, California. The book might have been made of more instructive value, no doubt, had the writer been a man of science, naturalist, botanist, or geologist, for in all those fields and others that are outside my range the desert is full of matter. Yet it may not be unfair to say that the observer whose interest is trained upon a certain aspect of nature may be to that extent incapacitated as regards the more general or purely scenic bearings of his surroundings. And so these discursive notes may possibly bring to the reader a truer, though in some ways less explicit, impression of the country described than would be the case if they came from the pen of one who was even a fractional savant. For somewhat the same reason, Little is here said of the really remarkable agricultural developments which in the past few years have come over the considerable portions of this intractable seeming region. I am no farmer, and know little of potatoes or alfalfa, poultry, pigs, or cattle, until the stage when they issue in finished product from the kitchen. Thus I may seem to ignore what to the practical mind must appear to be the chief or even the only items of value. I do not forget those imperialites and coachellans who made hopeful suggestions. I guess you'll boom up the section now, won't you, say? Finest land in the state, and so on. Nor their puzzled or pitying glances when I made the only possible reply, that I did not, could not, and would not boom, was, in fact, even averse to booms and boomers and was more enthralled by desert sunsets than by desert dairies, astounding as these might be. In a word, it is the desert as desert, God's desert, not man's, that engaged my interest, and that, as I this moment call it up before my inward eye, seems to me the most memorable in its totality of impressiveness of all natural objects that I have met. But I confess that the fascination of the untamed desert has proved to be of too subtle a quality for words of mine to render. That would necessarily be true, of course, of anybody's attempt in any field of nature, but it would be tenfold true with respect to the desert, and I will be bold to say that it would be true without regard to the person in the case. Whether it be that the desert is too intrinsically alien to our psychology, 
or for some other reason too baffling to trace, I believe it to be the fact that its genius is the rarest and most elusive of all the elements that make up the wonder of this transcendent world. No last word on the desert will ever be written. No statements, I mean, that to those who know the subject in any real degree will not seem to fail of getting at the essence. It is a pleasure to record botanical obligations to my friend Mr. S. B. Parrish of San Bernardino, California, whose thorough knowledge of the flora of the desert, freely put at my disposal, was invaluable in revising the appendix of plants. I am indebted also to the United States Geological Survey for permission to reprint from one of their publications the hints on desert traveling that appear in Appendix A. In conclusion, it is most satisfactory to note that, since the following chapters were prepared, the United States government has, by a small appropriation of funds, made at least a beginning towards bettering the condition of desert travel by the marking of roads and water holes. J.S.C. Palm Springs, California, November 1918. End of preface. Chapter 1 of California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. Introductory. That stony mystery, the Sphinx, fixed in eternal reverie amid the immemorial sands of Egypt, might well stand as a symbol of the desert itself. Not that desert only, but deserts everywhere. One point out of many that make up the analogy is the baffling nature of the spell that people find in the famous monument. One will say that it is due to a sense of its immense age. Another, that the features bear a supernatural expression or hold some secret meaning. Another feels its awe to lie in the riddle of its purpose. And another in some supposed significance of its proportions. Similarly, the magic of the desert is a riddle. Not only does it defy putting into words, but I have never found the person who felt that he could even shape it vaguely to himself in thought. For one thing, it is in its essence a contradiction. The desert is the opposite of all that we naturally find pleasing. Yet I believe that its hold upon those who have once fallen under its spell is deeper and more enduring than is the charm of forest or sea or mountain. This must seem a strange statement to make, but I make it with consideration and in the light of others' experience besides my own. The beauty of the great woodlands, the mystical solemnity of the sea, the power and glory of the mountains, right well we love these. Yet somehow that pale, grave face of the desert, if once you look long upon it, takes you more subtly captive and keeps you enchained by a stronger bond. It is as if you were bemused by the gaze of a sorceress, or had listened overlong to some witching monotonous strain or had pondered too deeply on old legends of weirdry or parchments from tombs of strange forgotten lands. Certainly it is not love in any degree that one feels for the desert, nor could any other single term convey the sentiment. But whatever it is, there is something of haunting in it, and it is a haunting that lasts for life. The explanation of this puzzling allurement may lie partly in the fact that the mind of man is not steadfast in its attitude toward nature. It seems to change in reverse, as it were, to the spirit of the time. As usual, it is the opposite that attracts. The gentler features of the earth, its flowers, meadows, quiet hills, have always met response, and most so when the times were most troublous. But the vast and the wild raised no thrills but those of dislike and fear so long as life was, in a manner, similar. That is, while civilization was unborn or young. True, mountaineers have of old loved their mountains, but that was due, we may guess, more to appreciation of the protection they gave from foes in times of chronic war and foray than to any sense of their beauty and sublimity. But now the pendulum tends to the other extreme. After centuries of home, security, satisfaction of what, we come to a revulsion. 
ease and tame ways of living having reached, for most of us, the present far stage, there has arisen a zest for things rugged and wild. Hardship looks attractive. Scarcity becomes desirable. Starkness turns an unexpected side of beauty. If the sun that has pleased me with warmth has power to blast me as well, homo sum, let him try it on. If Mother Earth has rooms from which she would bar me with threats, let her make the threats good if she can. If the eye loves verdure and low, cool tones of color, let it take a Spartan course of whitest light and fiercest color wave. These things also are part of our estate, and we cannot afford to leave them out of the accounts. Thus the desolate, gaunt, and dreadful in nature at last have their day. The risk is, indeed, that they may run to overvaluation. Perhaps even the pranks of those funny fellows, the futurists, cubists, and vorticists, in poetry, music, and art, might be explained by this clue. Civilization has got on their nerves, and they simply have to scream. As seen merely, the desert is the last field that could take the fancy. The forest, even if gloomy, gives a sense of companionship and is filled with life and the means of life, food, fire, and shelter. The ocean, impersonal and insincere as it is, has motion and color, play of ripple, and breathing grandeur of tide. The mountains give pleasant boundary to our little lives, shutting in friends and kin, shutting out strange humanity and alien climes, and vaguely gratifying the sentiment for home. But the desert yields no point of sympathy and meets every need of man with a cold, repelling no. There are, it is true, about the fringes of the desert, spots of sylvan beauty. Canyons break down from these sterile walls where, following a cascading brook, cottonwoods and sycamores come trooping in verdant file, and palms hold broad fans aloft against opaque screen of rock and deep transparency of sky. In spring, mating birds find these places out, and live in transient, busy colonies while they raise their broods. Flowers, under unbroken days of sun, crowd into sudden bloom, the frail annuals growing quickly and hurrying to mature blossom and seed before the last moisture is drained from air and soil. The hardier plants here keep up a lively show, noticeably strong in the primary colors well into summer, though short will have been their shrift on the open desert. Even ferns contrive to live within perhaps a quarter mile of the boundary of strict aridity. But these are only local conditions, quite the reverse of typical. One feature of loveliness the desert has, however, that is essential. In one field of beauty, it is supreme. That is the field of color. Professor John C. Van Dyke, who has made that fine study of the desert which takes the rank of a classic, gives to a companion volume on the ocean the title of The Opal Sea. A better term than opal could scarcely be found for describing in a word the color of the desert itself. The marvelous air, wholly free from the vapors and impurities of coast and valley places, while it sharpens in detail and reduces difference of plane, at the same time throws over every object in far or middle distance a veil of lilac atmosphere wonderfully thin and transparent. Owing, perhaps, to the high power of these color waves, the eye is hardly interfered with in penetrating shadows. As a result, one receives the full effect of every tone of color, whether in light or shade. While well, all come to the eye softened but enriched, and with that indefinable opaline quality that gives magic and fascination to the most poetic of gems. The geological simplicity of sand and rock does not result, as might be expected, in poverty of color. Sand, particularly, might seem to be capable of little change of hue, but on the contrary, its reflecting power gives it a special value as a color agent, a means of taking on varying effects from the ever-changing sky. In the northwestern arm of the Colorado Desert are two great masses of sand, Flattened domes in shape, the higher one rises, I should guess, to 500 feet above the surrounding levels. The sand probably overlies a rocky abutment of the adjacent foothills, and has been heaped there by that scarifying wind 
the terror of railway employees whose lines are cast in the division which includes the San Gorgonio Pass. For months these sand hills were in my daily view, and to describe the shades of color I have noted on them would make tedious paragraphs. From almost snow white, they have taken, often in rapid turn, all the hues of gray, of blue, of rose, of chrome, of brown, and purple, reaching even under the gloom of storm, an approach to absolute black. Sand is actually as responsive as a chameleon, and I could never tire of the vagaries of those dunes. But most, they charmed me at sunset, that hour when the soul itself is suffused with changing hues and comes to its best perception. Then none but warm and gentle shades are seen, and the mind, like a tranquil lake, receives them and renders them into something clearer and deeper than thought. Is it not at evening that we most naturally and truly reflect? Words quite fail to disclose the felicity of those spiritual moments of color. Like music, they speak the unearthly tongue, and it is only into music that they could be translated. I mean, of course, the real accents of the heavenly maid, not the new, loud German noise which goes with the rattling of the saber and aptly illustrates culture. Far from that, my sand hills at evening are an abendlied, a child's ethereal dream, a reverie, a sigh. Rock, contrary to sand, gives back its own color, but here it is a pure and vivid color untinged with overlying hues of vegetation that elsewhere come in to perplex the eye. The prevailing surface hue of desert rock is a dark rust red. I should name it Egyptian red, for in my mental picturings of the land of the Nile, this same dull but powerful note rules like absolute pharaoh. The color, however, is not inherent in the stone, which is mainly granite of the common gray. But in the course of ages, this material, lying usually in huge slabs, has taken on a surface sheen and coloring due to weathering and baking by the sun. It is spoken of as desert glaze, and is really something like the artificial glaze of pottery. Even when the rocks take bolder form, they are generally great house-like cubes or rhomboids offering flat surfaces which the sun and weather have painted in the same broad, strong hue. Only where canyons choked with more freshly shattered rocks score the mountain walls does one catch the native tint to the granite, making a startling contrast. From these canyon mouths, wide, fan-like sheets of similar debris sweep down to the level. Up these, the eye ranges higher and higher into gloomy galleries and chasms until the thread is lost in a maze of braided folds of mountains, these overlooked often by some far high crest, in winter white with snow, in summer gray with iron crag and precipice of granite, but always softly clouded with humanizing pines. The characteristic contour form of the desert mountain ranges is another element in the beauty of desert color. Like geological models set on a table, they stand up sharply defined from the general level, arresting the glance with new conspicuous effects. No gently modeled approaches prepare the eye for the change of plane. From gray or drab expanse of sand, they rear up wall-like profiles of red or ochre. Perspective is dwarfed by the clearness of air, increasing the sense of verticality. Instead of rising from the desert, these mountains stand upon it, explicit, bald, almost artificial. Whatever form of geological action may explain the peculiarities of these mountain shapes, it has resulted in a great irregularity of surface. But this irregularity has worked in small scale. The long, almost isolated spur of the San Jacinto that lies before me can only be likened to one of those vast surges one sees in mid-ocean, driven into infinite complexity by hurricane or tornado. In a mile or less of mountainside, I count ten or a dozen well-defined main canyons. They have one general trend and score the barren red-brown flank sharply from almost the crest down to the sudden dead level. Interwoven with these principal cleavages, meeting and crossing them at every angle, are hundreds of lesser depressions, miniature passes, and divides. 
The result is a positive cross-hatching of intricate colors, resembling in midday light a choppy sea, giving at evening and morning a checker of delicious color, molten gold in light, amethyst in shade, or under sunset or sunrise warmth, like the glow of red-hot iron flecked with touches of purple more than Tyrian. I think the coldest-blooded of men would stand and gaze while that pageant was passing. For others, the experience, which can never be made stale by custom, is more than aesthetic or emotional. It is moral, I would almost say religious. But the remark that rock gives back its own color must be qualified, for rock also responds to circumstances. The eastward extension of San Bernardino Mountain, lying beyond the sand hills to which I referred above, gives a good example of the possibilities of this stubborn material. In actual hue, the range is the usual deep reddish brown, but under diffused sunlight, I have seen it pale down to milky white, a tone that one would never suppose could come within its scope. Breaking of light rays by vegetation is not the cause, as it might be elsewhere, for plant life is here at its lowest volume, a joke, almost a myth, like a Chinaman's beard. It impresses one oddly, this wholesale bleaching away of essential color. Withered, ghastly, monstrously old, the mountains seem like geologic wraiths, such mountains as the ghosts of moon men may wander among in the ashy lunar world. The great stretches of level desert also show some diversity of color, arising partly from the absence or presence and kind of vegetation and partly from difference of surface material. But it is only when seen in great extent from a good elevation that atmosphere and grouping of shades lend enchantment. In near view, seen from slightly above the level, a vast drab tinged usually with olive is the general hue. The olive comes from an infinite stipple of low shrubs, so uniform in spacing, for each plant jealously guards its little territory, as to show no cloudings of heavier and sparser growth. The effect is about as lively and original as 50 square miles of tweed in pepper and salt mixture. But though not themselves in the least degree stimulating to fancy, these dull plains have value as foil and foreground to the color display of ever-present hills and mountains. And when, as often may be the case, the close foreground is laid in blocks of that deep, powerful red, the landscape, though bare of any recognized elements of beauty, yet is perfect, in its way incomparable. In places, the drab gives way to other tones. There are large extents of unmixed sand, boulders, gravel, or of pavement-like rock mosaic in yellow, red, lava black. On these, the vegetation is so sparse as to yield no element of color. This is the desert entire and austere, the realm of geology alone among the sciences. Here time and all things of time seem to have ended or not to have begun. The sun rises, flames through the sky, and sets. The moon and stars look coldly down. The traveler seems to himself the last life on the planet. Ah, that is close on terror grasps him. He feels himself alone in the universe. He and God. His footsteps cease. Why should he go on and whither? For there is no whither. Nothing moves nor can move but the elemental wind, vacantly roaming the empty earth, and those great airs, what a sense they bring of age, of eternal solitude, of cold, sidereal space. The life of towns, of farms, all that signifies humanity, seems totally unreal. The great question confronts, closes one in, and must, but cannot, be answered. At such moments, reader, you may find foothold in thoughts perhaps long unthought or cast aside. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and so on to the end. They will not now seem contemptible, I assure you. There comes in spring, on all but these barrenest spaces, a startling interlude, a sudden wave of color. Even in the desert, nature, though here least humane, most indifferent, longs for change and softens for a time at the entreaty of her most winsome child 
virginal, petal-eyed flora. It is only a transient flush, rising, culminating, and fading quickly, almost as fleeting as sunset on cloud or mountains, but it is enough. Draco does relent. Colonel Absolute has been seen playing horsey on the hearthrug. It proves the desert livable and possibly lovable, and for the rest of the year one bears in mind that brief touch of graciousness. In speaking of the color of the desert, there remains the great field of the sky. Let not the reader stay, as I did too long, under the conventional notion of an ever cloudless blue. Clear skies, of course, predominate, but even in summer no long time passes without grateful show of vapor, glorious white or yet more glorious gray. Nearness to the Pacific and the Gulf of California gives the sky of the Colorado Desert a degree of cloudiness far greater than that, for instance, of the Sahara, though the rainfall on our desert is as scanty as there. In both summer and winter the sun may rise, make his march, and set, day after day for weeks in undimmed power. But at any season there will not be many mornings or evenings together without some skeiny film of rose, some shimmering bar of matter, purple or coppery gold, though for months the sky through all the middle hours of the day may be a hard and uniform cobalt. There is, in fact, a constant battle in these skies, often to be seen by interested mortals below, like the scrimmages of pro- and anti-deities that went on above the plains of Troy. From the spot where I make these notes, I have often looked for hours while the struggle remained in deadlock. Over the pass between San Jacinto and Santa Rosa, battalions of cloud come rolling, stream out far to the east, and threaten the kingdom of the sun. But that old tyrant seldom sleeps, or, after the manner of tyrants, sleeps with an eye open, and it is hard to catch him unaware. His entrenchments are all but impregnable. Leagues of radiant air form invisible ramparts from which the invaders are continually thrown back, and ever from the heated desert new ranks of warriors come rushing up to maintain the fight. Now one side gains, now the other. Some hero of the gray leads a charge, and a tongue of vapor leaps out far in the advance, may even fling down a slant of rain or snow on the anxious pines of Santa Rosa. But before the grays can establish themselves, the blues are at them and press them back. Ah, Pluvius, ah, Pluvius, Phoebus, Phoebus to the rescue. And so it wages, to and fro, strangely and ominously like the battles of men. Ominously, lest it prove that these are no farther from coming to a final end. With all the glory of desert evening skies, I miss one accustomed element of sunset. I mean that spiritual touch, impossible to put into words, but which we know so well. Perhaps the word wistfulness states it best, and the desert, so you might think until you know it, is not wistful. But yet it is. To be old, weary, and wise is wistful as much as are the young, asking eyes of a child. But wistfulness is hard to define. Why in music, for instance, should a chord, a turn of rhythm, even an interval start sometimes a wave that reaches boundless shores, or, sinking like a burning ruby into depths we never guessed were there, show us ourselves as gods knowing good and evil? How does it come that the leaf of an autumn bramble expresses a hero's soul better than epic verses ever can? And what magic is there about sunset and the west that has always drawn men's longing, so that, indeed, for wistfulness, one might fancifully say westfulness? Is it that we feel the sun's daily going as so great a loss that we must follow him with our pensive hopes? Not so with all of us, certainly. To me, for one, the sun has always seemed an enemy, the ally of tedium, a huge evaporator sucking the spirit and leaving naught but the plodding clay. The gaudy, babbling, and remorseless day. Well said, Shakespeare. But this is verging on metaphysics. The point is that somehow there is not in the desert sunset hues that deepest, most sensitive note. They are fairyland, a sheer marvel, the quintessence of beauty and color, 
but they have not the ineffable quality that goes, perhaps with murkier, less all-revealing skies. It may be that, being mysterious to ourselves, anything less than mystery in nature must fall short, abyssus abyssum in vocap. As a fact, I have seen more of that moving glory in sunset skies from the top of a London bus than anywhere else, even Sierra Crest or open vastness of the Colorado. Perhaps it is the presence of six million human souls, I do not mean bodies, that gives the needed atmosphere, the spiritual haze. But the metaphysical must be reckoned with, after all, to explain the strange attraction of the desert. Space, solitude, quiet, our minds at their best are tuned to these, and when they find them, they expand like the anemone welcoming its native tide. The merely objective things of the desert are another and transitory matter. I am speaking of its underlying, undying charm. It is a somewhat awful attribute with more of subjugation in it than of charm. It disembodies us, takes away what hides us from ourselves. The aged earth speaks now in solemn tone to its child, and he must listen. No friendly tree or buoyancy of wave meets the daunted eye with encouragement or excuse for levity. Here justice is the word, not mercy. The universe seems listening for your word and appraising you by your silence. If there comes a sound, it is so momentary as only to startle, swallowed up instantly in the waiting void. The thin single note of the cactus wren, one of the lonesomest of sounds, more lost and eerie than the midnight bleed of sheep on the Cumberland fells. Is there attraction in this, then? To most people, no. To a few, yes. And yes to an increasing number, I think and hope, as the loud roar grows louder, the times more complex and out of joint, the strife of tongues more clever and useless, simplicity, the touchstone of good, more than ever reverend, yet less than ever revered. End of chapter 1「2 of California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeet and Chase」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 The Palm Oases and Canyons Though the palm is certainly not the most beautiful, it is perhaps the most poetic of trees. In symmetry of tapering shaft, fountain-like burst of crown, and play of glossy frond, it is the ideal of gracefulness in plant life. Incidentally, there is the charm of its atmosphere of literary illusion, of which it probably has more than any other tree can claim. To dwellers in cold or temperate climates, it brings also alluring thoughts of tropic warmth, skies normally sunny, and a life emancipated from winter flannels. Spreading up from northern Mexico, a number of groups of the fan palm, Washingtonia filifera, are found in the canyons and oases of the Colorado Desert. They are known but to few, and those are mainly prospectors and such stray characters whose business or hobby makes them wanderers in that harsh region. Such human life as the desert has, that is, the actual desert, the unconquered and unconquerable wastes of burning sand and mountain, drifts and circles about these spots, necessarily so, since the presence of palms means the presence also of that rarest, strictest necessity, water. The Arab's axiom regarding the date palm, that its foot must be in water and its head in open sun, is true of its relative the fan palm. Thus, in the talk of desert men, the palm figures constantly. You hear of dos palmas, thousand palms, palm springs, twenty-nine palms, seventeen palms, two-bunch palms, and so on. But the names mean to the traveler not only water, but shade, and with a chance of grass for his animals and the relief of verdure for his sorely harassed eyes. Some of the groups occur about the boundary of the sea that anciently filled the Great Depression, which is now partly occupied by the Salton Sea, and whose beach mark is today startlingly plain at the base of the encircling hills. Such groups, probably, represent the indigenous growths. 
a number more are found at higher altitudes but of these many are known to have been planted by the present or former indian inhabitants of the region the westerly limit of growth is a rocky defile on the south side of snow creek canyon which is a rift of san jacinto mountain about opposite whitewater station on the southern pacific railway this group marks the nearest approach made by the wild palm to coastal conditions of climate for the spot is within a few miles of the crest of the san gorgonio pass which here forms the dividing line between california barren and california fertile a thread of tepid water moistens the roots of the trees while not a mile away rushes the icy brook that gives its name to the canyon I camped at various times in most of the considerable canyons of the upper part of the desert. Each has its special charm, while those that come down from the high mountains that shut off desert from coast possess a dual beauty, the characteristics of a true mountain canyon, such as trees, cascading streams, and the varied life that goes with them, together with the features of a land made savage by torturing sun, unblessed by the mercy of rain. The mingling of these two elements gives often a fascinating result. It was still winter, the end of January, when I pitched my little six-by-three-foot tent in Chino Canyon. This is a great rift opening on the northwestern arm of the desert directly under the peak of San Jacinto Mountain. It gets its name from old Chino, a former chief of the Aguacaliente Indians, whose rancheria adjoins the little village of Palm Springs, a few miles to the south of the canyon. I had visited the spot years before, and kept an affectionate memory of a warm spring that breaks out near the head of the great apron of Talus that sweeps down from the neck of the canyon to the level desert. It was toilsome work navigating my burrow, Mesquite, through these miles of boulders, with a rise from 500 feet to 2,000 feet of altitude, and there was neither mood nor leisure for scenery until we reached the little clump of palms that marked our destination. But when camp was pitched, and serenity returned, I found a high coin among the rocks and took my satisfaction. I was at about the limit of growth of the water-loving trees that accompanied the creek as far as they dared, sycamore, alders, cottonwoods, and willows. Here they stopped short abruptly, and from here desertward, only the starveling vegetation of drought held the ground. The pale shrubs seemed to have copied the look of the gray boulders, as if hoping by subterfuge to escape the notice of the sun. Each bush of encilia or burrowweed grew rounded and compact, and in twilight or moonlight would not be distinguished from the rocks, except where they grew among the rust-brown slabs of the canyon walls, when one would swear he saw a flock of grazing sheep, every one distinct to the eye. Straight in front, the canyon opened in steep, smooth descent, bounded by high and barren walls, the western already dark in shadow, the other in full sun and glowing with volcanic intensity of red. At three miles distance, these ran out into the level like capes extending far out to sea, a sea of lifeless gray that broke southward in one huge crest of sand that was like a tidal wave, stopped and held in full career. In sharp relief against the neutral hue of the sand stood the dark, gleaming fans of palms. The distance was closed by a level rampart of mountains in faint ethereal tones of rose, chrome, and amethyst. I had not many such evening prospects during the two weeks I camped in Chino Canyon. It was a wet winter, and I was not far from being perpendicularly below the 10,000 and odd foot peak of the mountain, which was engaged in perpetual storm. After days of rain, I would determine to move, at the first cessation, down to the valley, which I could often see stewing in sunshine while I shivered over an unwilling campfire in the rain. I don't know why it didn't occur to me to get into the warm spring and wait until the clouds had rained themselves out. But when a change came, my mind changed with it, and I stayed. At last there came a drop in temperature, and after three days and nights of torrential downpour, I awoke one morning to find the sun shining and the mountain sheeted with snow down to a few hundred feet above camp. Then it was high luxury to lie in my thermal pool and get a startling effect of shining green palm fronds with background of solid snow. 
The Indians hereabouts have a legend that Taquitz, alias Chauk, their evil spirit, lives in San Jacinto Mountain and attributes to his operations the peculiar noises, rumblings, and so forth that are sometimes heard proceeding from his haunts. Several times while in this canyon, when lying on the ground at night, I heard the sounds plainly. There was no tremor of earthquake, but it is possible that the heavy rains caused a movement of the rocks on the mountainside. The sounds, whatever made them, were easily transmitted to me, since my ear was practically in contact with the earth. Who knows, but it was the fellow in the cellarage, old true Penny himself. Some miles to the south is Andreas Canyon, another of the gateways of the same mountain. It also is named after an Indian, old Captain Andreas, the remains of whose adobe hut and orchard of vines and figs are yet in existence. Here, the following winter, I camped for nearly three months, gratifying aboriginal instincts by a return to cave life. The cavern, which served for dining room, study, and kitchen, had been the home of Indians and was adorned with their picture writings, while a sort of upper story was quite a museum of age-dimmed records in red and black. One upright stone was worn into grooves like knuckles where arrow shafts had been smoothed. Another showed evidence of having been used for polishing the obsidian points. The great table-like rock, where I kept a store of hay for my horse Kawia, Mesquite and I had had a difference and parted, was bored in a dozen places with circular holes where acorn and mesquite meal had been ground by generations of diligent squaws, whose deer horn awls and ornaments of shell and clay I occasionally unearthed as I did also bones in remarkable numbers and of questionable shapes. Of Andreas, now long gathered to his fathers, the word goes that he was given to the distilling of awardiente from his grapes, breaking thereby the law of the land. However, considering that the art had been learned from the whites, that he had no voice in making the law, and that the land in question had been taken from him and his people, there seems not much logic in blaming him. Peace to your ashes, Andreas. I can certify that your fig trees still do bud and yield better fruit, perhaps, than some of us. The same striking conjunction of desert and coast vegetation rules here, as in Chino Canyon. Down to the very neck, a bare hundred yards from where open desert comes in view, trees grow in full verdure, curtained in wild grapevines that make an arbor of summer green or autumn chrome and sienna over the darkling pools of the creek. At the point where they cease, they are met by a colony of palms, and these give place to the low-toned derbage of the desert. The canyon is notable for a fine rank of palisade cliffs, which, with their massive sculpturing and dark Egyptian hue, make a wonderful foil for the beauty of the palms. Some of these stand statue-like in vertical alcoves of the wall. Others bend in tropic grace above crystalline pools or spring in rocket-like curve from the thickets of mesquite or arrowweed. One cluster, arranged in the form of a great hall, especially took my fancy. The palms that compose it have kept all their dead foliage, which, hanging in straw-yellow masses about the stems, gives them impressive girth and solidity. While wind is stirring the fronded capitals, these massive pillars, standing in unbroken stillness, seem like the immemorial columns of Babylon. My nights in that strange place, worked up into mystery by glimmer of star or trickle of wandering moonbeam through the tracery of the roof, were the sort of experience one loves to repeat in memory. In a narrow gateway of the upper canyon stands a single stately palm, framed by tall cliffs of Egyptian red. Its solitariness, spiry grace, and statuesque pose give it special individuality, and, sentimentally, I allowed myself to name it La Reina del Cañón. Evenings by the campfire in the cave were enlivened by visitors, kangaroo mice, skunks, and tarantulas, who adopted me without reserve into the ancient order of cave dwellers. The mice were charming companions, eating beans and hardtack with me off our common plate, and only occasionally needing an admonitory rap with a spoon. 
By day, quail were frequent callers, aligning themselves on a shelving rock overhead to criticize my housekeeping. And once, a lynx halted bashfully when ten yards from the breakfast table. Bighorn tracks were often fresh on the cactus mesa beyond the creek, and my regular morning alarm was the practicing of chromatic scales by a canyon wren midway up the cliff. Andreas Canyon had become endeared to me by these and other social ties when, about noon one Saturday, a gentle but persistent rain began, one of the occasions one recognizes as meant for the cooking of beans. I charged my biggest pot and passed the afternoon in holding the fire at that scientific minimum that the frijole justly demands and wondrously repays. Footnote. The red or pink Mexican bean, frijol in Spanish, pronounced frijole or affectionately as above. End of footnote. The rain continued, taking on the industrious look that Californians know and love as forecasting a successful season in real estate. At intervals I brought in fuel, storing it in dry crannies of the cave. Kawea, protected by his heavy blanket, was tied close to the creek under a tree against which I had built his manger. Darkness came early, and the rain increased to a heavy downpour. I ate supper in dusk, fed and watered the horse, covered the hay with a tarpaulin, and turned into the blankets on my camp cot to smoke a pipe. This proved more than usually cheering. A tent with sousing range were revealed as ideal conditions for the combustion of Virginia Longcut. This discovery I had opportunity to confirm in the days that ensued. Before turning in finally, I lighted the lantern and took a look at the creek. It had risen a few inches, as was natural in a canyon stream, but the tent was six or eight feet above it, and a rod back from the bank. Nothing to worry about, so I went to bed, and, lulled by the roar of the rain on canvas, was soon fast asleep. This placidity was ill-judged. Some suffocating object, something heavy and wet and cold, came down and embraced me with what I felt to be undue familiarity. For a few moments I was puzzled, then realized the tent... It had sagged with weight of water and the pegs had pulled from the softened ground. I noticed, too, that the sound of rushing water was oddly close. Pushing away the wet canvas, I put out a foot. Instead of the expected boot, it encountered a cold swirl of water that came half to the knee. Next, my groping hand took note of the abnormal position of the tent pole, which leaned almost horizontal under the ruin of the canvas. I saw what had happened. The creek was over its banks, had undermined the pole and brought down the tent, and was making a clean breach through my quarters. My thoughts flew to Kawea. He was some twenty-five yards downstream from me and on lower ground. Struggling under the waterlogged canvas, I hurriedly got into my soaking clothes and somehow got clear of the tent. It was pitch dark, raining like fury, and the water was now knee-high and running like a sluice. I stumbled down to Kawea, who neighed shrilly when he saw me. He had taken the highest spot his rope allowed him, but the water was almost to his belly, and we were both in some danger of being swept away. Cutting the rope, I scrambled with him up the bank and tied him on high ground near the cave. Then for an hour I slopped to and fro, rescuing what remained of my effects and storing them in dry corners of the cave. Not a few articles had been carried away, but most were caught under the collapsed tent, which itself was anchored by a rock against which it had stranded. It was wet work, but warming, and I soon worked up a first-rate Turkish bath. The next need was fire. By now the cave was a poor refuge, though it might have looked enjoyable to a naiad. Rain dripped everywhere from the shelving rocks that formed at best a nominal roof and cascades ran picturesquely down the walls. The floor was a mere bog. Only a space about three feet square was free from overhead drip, and on this islet I built a tiny fire over which I crouched in partial shelter. I suppose it was near daybreak, but on looking at my watch found it was eleven o'clock. I cherished that fire as few things are cherished on this planet. When gusts blew the rain in upon it, I covered it with my hat. When it sulked and sputtered because the bog encroached, 
I fed it with splinters from my tripod. When the wind scattered the cupful of embers, I scraped them up reverently like a Parsee. At last I got a good blaze, made a billy of coffee, and settled to the night's work of drying myself, blankets, gun, camera, and etc. The storm maintained a headlong deluge which did not moderate for a moment. The creek had risen higher and was making wild uproar as huge boulders began to come down from the upper canyon, thundering and bumping along like barrels tumbling down a stairway. With the boulders went the trees. The one to which Kawea had been tied, a full-grown sycamore, had disappeared soon after I moved him. Only by a few minutes had he escaped going with it. Now I watched tree after tree succumb. First their tops, which showed dimly against the sky, would begin to shiver as the water tore away the earth like a terrier at a rat hole. Then, as roots broke from their grip, the victim stooped lower and lower until water and granite between them gave the coup de gras, and the unlucky alder or sycamore toppled over and was whirled off to make campfires for fortunate prospectors. Daylight came, and with it the end of my fuel. By now the cave was worthless. Water poured in steady streams from roof and walls, and the floor had become a pool. Among my salvaged traps was the little three-by-six-foot tent of light, waterproof stuff, which I carry on winter horseback trips. This I pitched on the highest spot available, first laying a thick stratum of arrowweed over the sodden ground. Inside I spread half a bale of dry hay, then crept in and sat tight. This was Sunday. It passed. Also Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and not for a moment did the storm hold off. I read, smoked, ate, slept, and dashed out when necessary to attend Kawea or drive the tent stakes deeper into the spongy earth. When I awoke on Thursday, a yellow glow was brightening my tentlet. It was the sun, shining in the old, wholehearted California way, and I hurried out to renew acquaintance. Looking up the canyon, there was little that I recognized. The place where the other tent had stood could now be known by a scrap of canvas projecting above a new creek bed of dazzling, freshly scoured granite, while Kawea's former quarters were submerged in midstream. In the afternoon came Pablo, Marcos, and Miguel to round up their remaining cattle and mourn the six or eight head that had vanished in the storm together with all their possibilities of pesos, carne, and cuero. Finding me in the act of replenishing the bean pot, they expressed slight Indian surprise and mentioned that, certain of my belongings having been picked up some miles away where the flood had carried them, it had been supposed that I was drowned. By way of congratulation, they stayed to help with the beans. It was fifty years, they said, since so heavy a storm had visited the desert, and news that came later of broken dams and loss of life in the adjoining coast region made this seem likely to be true. Just to the south of Palm Springs, there is an imposing gash in the mountain wall which goes by the name of Taquitz Canyon. The stream which debouches here rises on Taquitz Peak, a subsidiary summit of San Jacinto Mountain, and whispered to be the private eyrie of Taquitz himself. The canyon is remarkable for magnificent cliffs forming at the mouth a cirque with walls rising sheer for hundreds of feet. This titanic coliseum makes a superb effect by morning light when vast crater-like shadow is outlined by grim though sunlit rock bolts that guard the towering gateway. It would be a worthy portal to Avernus, and when Taquas has his waterfall in full blast, a quite infernal uproar reigns in the confined place while the great southern cliff, acting as a sounding board, projects a full-mouthed roar upon the ears of the villagers of Palm Springs. Twelve miles to the southeast is Magnesia Spring Canyon, or, to give it the old Indian name, Pawate, signifying the drinker, where I made camp for a couple of weeks in early spring. It is different from the canyons already described, being a long, winding gallery instead of the usual wide-mouthed triangle narrowing suddenly to a gorge and is typical of strictly desert conditions. Here no cataracts blow their trumpets from the steep. 
one finds no growth of water-loving trees, for the canyon does not lead down, as do the others, from rain-compelling peaks, and only the slenderest thread of water trickles in it, for the most part underground. This was enough, however, to maintain one lovely rock-bound pool in which, by skinning one's knees, a miniature swim could be achieved. High, falcon-haunted cliffs partly encircled the pool, and a couple of palms growing in a niche fifty feet above gave a tropic touch of luxury. On arriving at the pool, I found fresh tracks of mountain lion in the damp sand. My main object in this canyon was the chance of photographing bighorn, which are rather plentiful hereabouts, but there would be a small prospect of these so long as lions were in the neighborhood. It would be some compensation, I thought, to add a cougar pelt to my coyote skin mattress, so I built a brush blind twenty yards from the spring, made an early supper, and took my station, shotgun with a full charge of buckshot across my knees, seven-shooter and hunting knife in reserve. There was a half-moon, and on the open space of sand around the spring, even a small object could be plainly seen. But my warlike preparations went for naught. For five hours I crouched at the Kivive, but no such dark shape as I looked for came pacing across the moonlit sand. A fox trotted by, stopped with paw upraised, and trotted on. And later I made out a group of shadowy forms sixty yards away that certainly were bighorn, the first I had met in their own haunts. My nerves tingled. Suppose the cougar were stalking the band. But the moon sank behind the cliff, and when I could no longer see my gun sights, I concluded that the coyote skins would do very well alone and turned in. The next two nights I again sat on watch, and not unprofitably, though with no result of cougars. It is in the purity and stillness of such hours, in tranquil fall of moonbeam on rock and shrub, and in such sense of awful but calming solitude, that one learns by the sacredness of nature the beauty of God. The face of the cliff near the spring showed a number of likely crannies which I searched for Indian relics. Most of them were packed with bits of stick or cactus, the caches of those punctilious thieves, the trade rats. In a side canyon, however, I found a handsome oya, or kawomol to give it the Indian name. It had been hidden in a breakneck place, fifty feet up a precipitous cliff, where I glimpsed it by chance. It stood upright on a bed of earth that must have been carried up from below, and was protected by slabs of rock with padding of palm fiber. Probably it had held water, perhaps stored in case of siege, but that had long vanished and it contained nothing but a deposit of dust almost intangibly fine, like dust of mummies or of time itself, which had somehow gathered in spite of the neck being closed with a flat fragment of rock. I suppose this mysterious dust would distill, in course of ages, from the upper ether itself, some product of cosmic disintegration. How many years the Oya had stood there is a matter for free guessing. Perhaps fifty, perhaps five hundred. Its circumference was over fifty inches, and its capacity about eight gallons. A furious wind was blowing that threatened to throw me from the cliff and gave me trying moments, but hugging Oya with one arm and Cliff with the other, I got my prize safely down. Next, I moved some miles farther south to Deep Canyon, Toho of the Indians, commemorating some hunter who never gets his game. This is a canyon of Santa Rosa Mountain, opening just west of the long, rocky point that runs out on the desert at Indian Wells. It is notable for its vast apron of debris, through which Mesquite and I struggled for endless hours, being forced at last to make a dry camp when nightfall overtook us in a jungle of Choya. In the morning we soon reached water, and also the Ocotillos, the view of which in flower was my special object here. Since first meeting the plant the previous year, I had looked forward to camping among them when in full blossom, as these now were, it was the middle of March, and so entering them in my lasting book of remembrance. I have described this remarkable plant to the western deserts in another chapter. Here I pitched my tent in a thicket of them, 
enjoying their splendid color by day and their weird shadow play on my moonlit canvas at night. The dead canes and stumps made an excellent campfire, burning with a white flame, as of wax, that justified the plant's alternative name of candlewood. Nearby were specimens of the agave, or wild century plant, some just beginning to send up their giant flowering stalks. Measuring the rate of growth of one of these, I found that it gained five inches in twenty-four hours. Tracks of bighorn were plentiful about the camp every day, and their deeply worn trails marked the canyon walls in all directions. Often at night, the rattle of falling stones told me of their movements on the cliffside above. Wildcat and coyote also left their footprints in my absence. I met here a flock of the interesting pinion jays, which long puzzled me by their unjay-like traits, as they flew swiftly along the face of the mountain, uttering a wild, sweet, plaintive cry. Who ever heard of a plaintive jay? Eagles, too, I often saw, and ravens croaked from unscalable crags. Friendlier birds were the acrobatic flycatchers and phenopeplas that performed from the tops of the agaves, and a pair of rose-breasted linnets that regularly came to breakfast and made me long confidences in happy cavatina. The cactus wrens gained my respect by the nonchalance with which they treated the formidable choyas. Since the nightingale prefers to lean her breast against a thorn, it seems a pity she cannot try the effect of a choya. A tramp at dawn up the higher canyon was full of pleasure. At the point where it narrows to the main ravine, the stream became a series of cascades linked by many a circling pool so fishable in look that there was pathos in the thought that they must be forever troutless. As the canyon doubled and twisted, the walls became ever higher and more precipitous. When the sun came up, the western cliff became the battlements of some castle in the realm of fairy. I often halted in wonder as some reach opened before me, filled with mystical light. The conjunction of extreme beauty of color with savagery of giant walls and thundering water gave a strange effect of unreality. A few isolated groups of palms were set high up on the walls. They seemed to have a conscious air as if they had been waiting until now for first recognition. Mountain sheep make these lonely groves their shelter in summer heat and winter storm, but human foot, unless perhaps some Indian hunters, may never have been set in them. On little benches here and there I came upon delightful beds of flowers, usually of one kind. Here I first met the exquisite malvastrum, in delicacy and fragility more like some hothouse product than the child of desert sand and sun. Those who know the globe tulip of our coast mountains may picture this as a blossom of the same ethereal character, but palest lilac instead of white, and stained at the base of each petal with a spot of carmine. A plant with half a dozen of the lamp-like flowers is as fairy-like a thing as a child could dream. Another new acquaintance was the Fagonia, a low-glowing relative of the creosote, having starry blossoms of pale magenta. Dwarf lupines occupied stretches of pure sand, and astrolcias with pale yellow florets, comically small, showed the effects of drought upon the magnificent Copa de Oro of the coast. On the driest places, exposed to the sun's full blast, the lovely little Aramiastrum or desert star looked up, winsome as daisies on an English lawn. Upon returning to camp, I found the first rattlesnake of the season had arrived and was enjoying my blankets in the tent. He seemed firm but calm, as if open to any reasonable offer. While I sought a tripod, he vanished. In the night, I felt something creeping over my chest under the blankets, and with panic remembered my visitor, who might have come to claim a share of the accommodation. I made a really brilliant jump, struck a match, and met the reproachful gaze of a large, stout, comatose lizard that was searching affectionately for the nice, warm bedfellow who had suddenly turned unkind. Crossing to the east side of the desert, here not many miles wide, a wonderful spectacle is seen in the crowded groves of Thousand Palm Canyon. In this wide gallery, opening from the foothills of the San Bernardino at near sea level, the palm seems most thoroughly at home, 
growing in companies of hundreds that make what might almost be termed a forest. One has a sense of strangeness in threading these pillared aisles. One's steps rattle harshly on a pavement of dry yellow leaves whose mahogany brown stems, long, tough, and thorny, impose care in walking, while the mind does not easily ignore the thought of snakes, tarantulas, and scorpions that find the deep, dry cover highly agreeable to their constitutions. The summer temperature here is of the hottest, for weeks ranging daily over a 100 degrees in the shade, and often over a 110, with not infrequent excursions into the hundred and twenties. A few miles out on the plain, another group shows a distinctive feature of chance arrangement. Twelve palms stand approximately in a line, and the number has given them the name the Twelve Apostles. Local fancy takes pleasure in pointing out that one of them is headless and dead, the result of a lightning stroke. This, of course, is Judas, and verily there is something infamous in the mean, misbegotten shape. Nothing in the vegetable world is so hideous as a headless palm. Other trees, when killed or decayed, have at least a touch of the grotesque or pictorial. The palm that loses its head loses all. There remains merely a hateful stick, not even pathetic, only sinister. Out on the wind-swept plain to the east of Palm Springs lies the oasis of Seven Palms. The name does not now describe the group, though no doubt it once did so. Placed here and there in picturesque mode, singly in twos or threes and one larger cluster, a score or so of Washingtonias inhabit a space of a few acres surrounding a pool of alkaline water. Years ago, a settler made a homestead here, in his flat-roofed, unpainted dwelling, weathered into drab conformity of hue, merges with gray thickets of arrowweed. The charm of the place, apart from its palms, is in the grandeur of its mountain prospect, dominated to the south by colossal San Jacinto, whose two-mile height soars close at hand, undwarfed by intervening foothills. San Gorgonio rises somewhat more distant, but not less superb, a little to the west. The spot has a special drawback, too. The pestilent wind which blows down the pass for days and weeks, or, for aught I know, months and years together, making the daylight hours a misery, the nights a howling nightmare. Relief could generally be found, however, by the margin of the pool, and always enjoyment in noting the quaint, humorous ways of the bird and animal life that resorted there. Four miles farther north, near the foothills of San Bernardino, are twin colonies, which have given the place the name of Two Bunch Palms. Growing at the edge of a little bluff, they are finely placed, and from among them one gets again vistas of those two great peaks, always claiming the gaze, whether serene under cloudless blue, hallowed with snow, or darkly freighted with storms. Such things are unique in American landscape, and sends one's thoughts wandering for comparisons to Ararat, Ruwenzori, or famed Kashmir. I shall not soon forget one spring night when, beneath these palms, I was for once near the intoxication point of moonlight. For hours I lay unable to sleep while I was showered with moon arrows, passionately bright, that streamed from the polished fronds as they thrashed and undulated in a screaming wind. It was the Valkyrie's ride translated into moonlight, but outdoing Wagner, almost beating the incoherencies of Strauss. The village of Palm Springs, ten miles to the south, has some fame as a winter health resort. It also offers the tourist, by comfortable accommodations, the means of exploring with ease a few of the palm communities. In the village, there is a valuable medicinal spring which rises with a temperature of 103 degrees beneath a flourishing cluster of palms. The spring is on the reservation of the Aguacaliente Indians, and the bathhouse is operated for their financial benefit. It is a new, crude affair, and I confess I enjoyed more the quite primitive contrivances of a few years ago when to the weird sensation produced by the gulpings and gurglings of the spring, which is a kind of quicksand in consistency, was added the excitement of guessing whether the rickety little hut would fall to pieces while you were taking your bath, 
or would spare you and collapse over the next comer. This zest of adventure has now been lost, as has also the healthful exercise of pursuing the key all over the reservation to its lair in the capacious pocket of old Maria's wrapper of antique, well-washed blue. The arm of the desert that reaches southward from the village ends in a long, winding ravine known as Palm Canyon. Hundreds of palms grow here along the course of a romantic stream, bending in dreamy beauty over glassy reach and pool, or disposed in natively artistic attitudes on the lower slopes of the canyon walls. The combination of arrowy brook, wild ravine, and tropic multitude of palms makes the spot an enchanting one, and it never fails to draw a tribute of surprised approval, even from the callous globetrotter. In winter and spring, a feature of contrast is added when one may catch from some high viewpoint the gleam of San Jacinto's snow. Then it is a scene over which artists rave, the note of white giving the last touch to a landscape already crowded with powerful colors. Naturally, those nuisances, the motion picture people, have seized on Palm Canyon for their antics, with the result of setting fire to some of the finest of the palms. But why repine? Rather, let us rejoice that nature is thus honored in serving art. Hardly less picturesque than Palm Canyon is the adjacent Murray Canyon. Here again, clusters and files of palms give brightness to a ravine somber with high-piled rocks. Not far away are Eagle and Andreas Canyons, similarly beautified with these graceful trees. It is much to be desired that some square miles of this locality, with Palm Canyon as a center, should be set aside as a national park. Scenically, the place is more than remarkable. It is strictly unique for this country, as well as strangely beautiful. While for its botanical rarity alone, it should be preserved in the public interest. As facilities for reaching it improve, ever larger numbers of people will come to view this bit of pure Arabia that has somehow fallen within our territory. As it is, I am expecting shortly to find installed at the strategic point a notice board, a fence with a little gate, and a cool highwayman collecting dollars, halves, or quarters, whatever the traffic will bear. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Trees and Tree-like Growths. Contrary to the general notion, the desert is far from being neglected by flora. Even in the matter of trees, she has denied to a few valuable and interesting kinds the territory they would have preferred and has bestowed them on these unkind regions where they are a first-class boon to the scanty animal life that shares their hardships. There is a good assortment of shrubs, too, and of the smaller growths a surprisingly large number, though it is only in spring that most of these show themselves. For the rest of the year they exist only in embryo as seeds, or as a final minimum of brittle stems and shriveled leafage, making no contrast in the universal drab, yet the hope and support to the forlorn cattle that stray with melancholy steps and slow about the parched and starving ranges. Among the trees, the palm Washingtonia filifera claims first place, though I always feel that the name of tree hardly applies to these columnar shapes, so opposite to our thought of outreaching branch, shady gallery, and spreading contour but I have spoken of the palm at length in another chapter. And, after all, it is rather an incident of the desert than a characteristic, appearing only sporadically and, as a rule, about the margins of the territory, limited always to the rare spots that yield the needful conditions of moisture. The principal desert tree is the mesquite. Of this, there are two species, differing in size, mode of growth, and some other details, the most noticeable of which is the seeding. The larger, Prosopis glandulosa, bears a typical bean. 
the other prosopus pubescens a unique seed vessel exactly like a rather large screw from this feature the latter tree takes the name of screw bean or tornillo the spanish word for screw the larger mesquite is the one of great benefaction of nature to her desert dwellers were it only in the matter of shade what song should be raised to it by man bird and beast and indeed are raised by sparrow wren linnet and to the best of his ability by that arch black sprite Fainapipla, who thinks the topmost spray of a mesquite is the cap of the universe reptile and insect revel in it too for as i write these pages under the shade of a mesquite driven from my tent by a mid-morning march temperature of a hundred and eight degrees i am buzzed and bitten by gnats and flies of all degrees cobwebbed by spiders explored by serious beetles and adopted by caterpillars as a happy idea nimble lizards scamper about sniping my tormentors every mesquite is a green caravanserai and one that is patronized to the full these islands of shade are naturally the preferred spots for camping places by desert travelers and that they have been so from of old may be known by the presence near them of unusual quantities of the broken pottery that everywhere amazes one by tokens of the large populations that the desert once supported in places mesquite thickets may still be found that extend for miles though near the railway great stretches have been cleared for cultivation and the wood which makes excellent fuel is regularly sold in the towns and cities of the coast the aboriginal passion for rabbit would itself render these tickets the pick of the desert real estate to the indian for they are always alive with bouncing bunnies easy targets for his arrows or throwing clubs the mesquite is also evidence of water though not necessarily of water near the surface as in the case of the palm far down below the burning surface sands the great cable-like roots of the mesquite go searching for the beds of water-bearing gravel and the plant that shows only a five-foot tangle of thorny scrub above ground may have roots running to ten times that depth as the sand is constantly heaped higher about the mesquite by the wind the plant struggles to keep its head above the drift and in places as at seven palms mile-long dunes have formed that show a mere fuzz of twigs above ground while your feet may be tripped by the great cylindrical roots as thick as your leg and almost as hard and rigid as iron from which the sand has been blown away in examining a small one of these roots with a thickness of about two inches and looking like a smooth brown rope stretched taut i noted that in a distance of twenty feet it showed no variation of diameter besides its boons of game fuel shade and possibly water the mesquite yields food for man and beast and insect the vivid young green of late february becomes tinged in march with clouds of fragrant yellow catkins this is the bonanza of the thrifty desert bees now or never they must restock those rows of empty golden honey pots in the rocky cranny of the hillside and they go to the work with all the proverbial ardor plus the stimulus of needful haste later the mesquites form the great harborage for those most objectionable creatures the cicadas all day the thickets ring with their nerve-racking pipings like the whiz of steam escaping under high pressure i frankly hate these insects for their way of dashing out and squirting at one a spray of some vile secretion i was puzzled to account for these disgusting anointings which fell upon me even at night until camping under a big mesquite near indio i tracked the offenders down that camp by the by deserves description as illustrating the possibilities of growth of the mesquite other wayfarers probably indians or mexicans had used the place before me and had spent no little labor on making it convenient from the outside it was a dome-shaped isolated clump a hundred yards or so in circumference and perhaps fifteen feet in height a sort of tunnel had been cut leading to the center which when reached revealed the fact that the whole clump was one enormous tree the short butt a yard or so in diameter broke into several big recumbent branches which went rambling on about on hands and knees all crooks and elbows 
and threw out a young forest of twigs and branchlets cantankerously thorny. Near the main stem there was ample space and headroom for camp quarters, and the friend who left his comfortable Pasadena bungalow to visit me there had no fault to find with the accommodation, though he had now and then with the temperature. It was pleasant to dot hours to listen to the conversations of a family of gamble quail that shared our mesquite with us, Pater's loud clear call, or quieter admonishments of Mrs. G, answered by absent-minded twitterings or headlong scamperings of the youngsters. At this camp, Kawea had to be picketed outside, but in a similar mesquite clump that furnished me quarters for a week a few miles farther on my way, a stable had been installed by some predecessor with a manger and room for two or three horses. There was ample space here also for an average family's camp requirements. The mesquite yields excellent food for both man and beast. One authority says that the bean, of which husk and all are used, contains over 50% of practicable food elements. The Indians nowadays do not call on it to the extent they did formerly, when the meal ground by the squaws from the beans of this plant was the staple of their diet, though they still use it freely. But horses and, needless to say, the omnivorous burrows and the desert cattle rejoice at the sight of a bean-hung mesquite. Many times, during expeditions that took us far out of range of orthodox fodder, the situation has been saved for Kawea by our finding a mesquite or two, the twigs pendant with plump clusters and the ground whitened with the fallen fruit. I sometimes feared that dislocation of the neck would be his portion as I watched his giraffe-like maneuvers over the capture of some coy, high-hung monabucha. Nature did a kind turn to her deserving poor when she reserved the mesquite for the desert. The screw bean is a more spindling tree, sparser of foliage and content with poorer alkaline soils, where the other mesquite seldom cares to dwell. It is equally good, perhaps even better, as a source of food, but has little to offer in the way of shade, a mere thin grayness that scarcely breaks the stroke of the sun. In the diary of that fine Borovian character, Fray Francisco Hermenengildo Garces, who was roaming these deserts with the enthusiasm of an explorer as well as a missionary, in the years just about the birth time of this nation on the other side of the continent, one easily identifies the tornillo when he writes that he has found a tree that bears screws. Flora had one of her quaintest fancies when she fashioned these odd seed vessels, which one finds sprinkled in tousled clusters all over the tree. Next in size to claim attention is the palo verde, Cercidium torianum. To give the Spanish a literal translation, it would be the green stick, or more suavely, the greenwood tree. It has no recognized English name, and to speak of it as the greenwood tree raises a most incongruous association of ideas. Shades of Arden, what a difference! Yet the Spanish name, taken literally, is apt enough, for green the tree certainly is, vivid green and green all over. Only one must banish all thought of whispering forest and woodsy lawn. An odd thing is that this very green tree is a tree almost without leaves. At least the leaves are so small and so short-lived as well as to cut little figure in the general effect. It is the skeleton of the tree, trunk, branches, branchlets, and twigs that is green, a green vivid and smooth, though the butt of the very old Palo Verde may be roughened and blackened by age. Such scanty foliage as the tree puts forth in spring in response to some old vernal urge still strong after ages of forced adaptation to desert conditions, falls by early summer and leaves the airy, broom-like branches bare against the china blue of the sky. Often the branches are hung with great globes of the desert mistletoe for a dendron, so dense as to look like bee swarms, adding to the remarkable appearance of the tree. The Palo Verde, however, is a miracle for bloom. In mid-March it takes on a tinge of yellow, and soon each twig becomes a jeweled chain, petals of whimsical gold set with chips of ruby for anthers. Its other Spanish name, Lluvia de Oro, Shower of Gold, then fits it well. For charm and profusion of bloom, it is the desert's premier tree, 
and reminds me often of that glory of England's spring, the laburnum. Ah, those Tamside gardens, spilling their overflow of lilac and laburnum over old rosy brick walls. Those sea-washed Devon villages, each cottage plot a bower of floral gold. Those steep lakeland streets, which I used to climb with you, lady of my dedication, to the dark furred beacon, each garden raining yellow largesse upon its neighbor next below. Excuse the lapse, good reader, and in return I will wish that you may never know the sharpness of exile. On the side of usefulness, the Palo Verde has its virtues as well. Its beans are grist for the pestle and mortar of the Indian squaw, and though usually a small tree, it is capable of growth to a size that would furnish lodgment to man. There is a Palo Verde near the mouth of Deep Canyon that I take to be the Goliath of its tribe. The trunk at its narrowest above ground is eight and a quarter feet in girth, the largest limb five feet around, and the space covered by the tree has a circumference of seventy yards. For the desert, that is a triumph of tree growth. I do not know of another Palo Verde that comes to half its size. The smoke tree, Parocela spinosa, may hardly be called a tree, though sometimes tree-like in size of stem. More common than the Palo Verde, it is always a strange and noticeable object. It, too, is leafless, but it is wholly pale gray, a mass of prickly interlaced twigs that, at a distance, has much the look of a cloud of smoke. It is the characteristic plant of the desert washes or watercourses. I have often found the beds of these fugitive streams filled for miles with this ghostly semblance of a river. To see this phantom river come winding out, snake light upon the plains from some red mysterious canyon, brings nightmare thoughts of the grim genie, thirst and famine, that might here have their abode. In early summer, one may see this torrent turn suddenly from gray to liveliest color. The smoke tree, like the Palo Verde, makes up for absence of foliage by a huge burst of blossom. In this case, it is blue, the purest ultramarine, each tree a cloud of small pea-like flowers that, as they shrivel and fall, collect in windrows like drifts of azure snow. Another name for the tree is indigo bush, though the true hue of the blossom is not indigo. Yet another is desert cedar, which is totally without point. Some day a painter will chance upon this site, and at danger of death by thirst, will refuse to move from the spot until he has fixed upon canvas the desert at its highest color power. He had better, though, be a painter unusually reckless of his reputation, for all the world will swear he lies. The smoke tree gives me occasion to voice an old grudge that I have long held against the botanical tribe. Harmless, even kindly, as botanists in general appear, how is it that they take delight in embittering the lives of laymen by their eternal juggling with the names of genre and species? If they really wish to discourage us poor popular chaps, all right, let them say so, and we can turn to something lighter, say eugenics or those frivolous things, conic sections. For many a year, the smoke tree and its relatives were known to all the world as of the genus Dalea. Today, the puzzled amateur finds that name tacked to a quite different class of plants, and only by chance recognizes his old acquaintance under the title of Parocela. And this is but one case in a long and grievous list. When I hear of convocations of botanists, I smile and say, This is no innocent convention. What are they up to now? Often found near the smoke tree in the gravelly washes is a desert willow, Chilopsis linearis. It is not really a willow and only slightly resembles that tree in its leafage and irregular shape. In size, however, this often becomes a genuine tree, and I have found specimens with trunks two feet thick and an area of thirty yards diameter or more. The notable feature of this tree also is its flower, which is a large, fragile, orchid-like blossom, white relieved with lavender and yellow, and very delicately scented. There is something childlike about it, a hint of dainty pinafores in the crinkled edges of the petals, altogether a rare, undesert-like bloom. In the withering summer heat of a torrent bed, there is refreshment in meeting these airy blossoms with their fresh, cool look and gentle fragrance, 
a thought of violence and primroses and mossy woodland ways. The desert willow blooms profusely and remains long in flower. The fruit is a long, narrow bean, which, on shedding its seeds, leaves the tree hung with silky gray pods that flutter in the wind like pennons on the lances of Indian warriors. One true tree remains, the ironwood, old Nea tesota, called arbol de fierro or palo fierro, alternative hierro, in Spanish, meaning iron tree or ironwood. This is a sturdy, trim, well-branched growth, reminding one of a well-shaped apple tree. The foliage is abundant, yielding welcome shade, and the wood is exceedingly hard and makes excellent fuel. Its dull blue flowers are not especially attractive, and it bears beans that, so far as I know, are not eaten by man or beast, though I have seen my horse nibble the young leaves with a resigned air when sugary mesquite, humdrum galleta grass, and even that furniture polish sort of stuff, burrowweed, have all left us in the lurch. The ironwood has not a wide range, and one might travel the desert for a long time without meeting it. In the northeastern part of the Colorado Desert, not far from the river, there is a little visited range of hills called the Ironwood Mountains, or sometimes the McCoys. On their southern outskirts, I rode for hours through what, for the desert, might be called a forest of these trees, some of which had trunks more than two feet in diameter. There is a widely distributed, straggling bush that, at a cursory glance, looks rather like an unthrifty mesquite. It is the cat claw, Acacia gregei, an affectionate creature that grapples you to its soul with hooks of steel and loves to keep you there, taking a double hold for every claw you gently disengage. The leaf is mesquite-like, but smaller and finer. The blossom is also similar, a fuzzy catkin, and the fruit, a curious curly bean that dries into gouty-looking contortions. You will not go far on the desert without meeting the cat claw, nor will you part without cursing it. A feature of all desert trees except the palm is the great quantity of mistletoe for a dendron californicum they often carry. It is a common thing to see mesquites in which one half of the bulk of the tree is made up of dense masses of this parasite. It has no leaves, but in spring carries berries of a pretty coral color. Though classed by botanists as a false mistletoe, it has, I know, played the good old Christmas part with entire success. In speaking of the ironwood as the last true tree of the desert, I must not overlook three other plants that, in size, may deserve the name. The tree yucca, or Joshua tree, the ocotillo, or candlewood, and that giant of the cacti, the saguaro. They are hardly to be thought of as trees, however, but rather as growths allied to trees, but wanting in almost all tree-like features. The first is yucca arborescens of the tribe of that Spanish bayonet which is so common about the foothills of Southern California and so noticeable for its gigantic spike of cream-colored flowers. The Joshua tree, so named, it is said, by Mormon immigrants who, meeting these eccentric growths as they neared the end of their long march, hailed them as heralds of the promised land, it is more typical of the Mojave than of the Colorado desert, but it extends southward into the mountain ranges that divide the twin desolations. It is a weird, menacing object, more like some conception of Poe's or Doré's than any work of wholesome Mother Nature. One can scarcely find a term of ugliness that is not apt for this plant. A misshapen pirate, with belt, boots, hands, and teeth stuck full of daggers, is as near as I can come to a human analogy. The wood is a harsh, rasping fiber. Knife blades, long, hard, and keen, fill the place of leaves. The flower is greenish-white and ill-smelling. And the fruit is a cluster of nubbly pods, bitter and useless. A landscape filled with Joshua trees has a nightmare effect even in broad daylight. At the witching hour, it can be almost infernal. The ocotillo, Fuquiera splendens, commonly but wrongly taken for a cactus, is to me the most striking and characteristic of the desert plants. In it are expressed the desert's intrinsic qualities, its haggardness and gray sterility, its cruelty of thorn and claw, 
its fierce hot beauty in a landscape crowded with these lean sinuous shapes as one finds them filling great tracts of the barrenest desert of the colorado one feels an added wildness and fascination of the cacti a few are really beautiful many interesting or quaint others ugly but grotesque the beauty of the ocotillo is the beauty of cleopatra or carmen fierce and fatal the scarlet streamer that comes in spring at the tip of every stem is like a darting dragon's tongue a company of ocotillos writhing in a hurricane makes as eerie a sight as anything i know in the vegetable realm in shape the ocotillo is a sheaf of thin whip-like canes from six to eight to twenty feet long spreading more or less widely from a main stump near the ground the canes are closely armed with curving thorns which give the plant a cactus-like appearance for nine or ten months of the year it stands gaunt leafless seemingly lifeless and one strange feature is the suddenness with which on the coming of the rains it changes from dead dry gray to living green small leaves appear as if by magic and feather the canes with vivid green the canes themselves become a delicate lavender even the thorns put on a half inviting look and entice the unwary to closer acquaintance then a flower spike starts from the tip of each cane and bursts into a flame-like tongue a foot or so long, made up of scores of tubular scarlet and yellow blossoms. I have been told that the flowers of the ocotillo are used as food by some of the desert Indians. I tried them once, but failed to find them attractive. But I had no recipe. Perhaps they should be served with a tarantula sauce or stewed with lizard's tails. The giant cactus, Cereus giganteus, Spanish saguaro, is a common object to the Arizona deserts, but in California is only represented to the extent of a few individuals, probably not many over a hundred all told, that have gained a footing on the western bank of the Colorado. It, too, is an abnormal plant, but not an ugly one. Indeed, it is beautiful in an outlandish kind of way, but so far is it removed from all the shapes that we think of as trees, that it might be a type of vegetation belonging to Mars or the Moon. Ordinarily, the saguaro, for 10 or 15 feet of its height, is a single dark green column, regularly ridged or fluted, and set with rosettes of spines. Then it sends out arms, one or a very few, which stand up parallel with the main stem, or it may divide into a number of equal branchings, taking the form of a candelabrum. A mature saguaro may be 50 feet high or more, but the tallest specimen I found on the California side of the river was not over 40 feet. It was an odd-shaped, untypical growth with a few stumpy arms that looked as if they had been amputated. In nearly every saguaro, one finds a number of neat round holes, the entrances originally to woodpeckers' nests, but often used rent-free by that quaint little goblin, the elf owl, Micropallus whitneyi, the tom thumb of his tribe, hardly six inches high when full grown. My tallest saguaro must have had a score of these holes, a veritable hotel or skyscraper of owls. I was disappointed that I could not make camp beside it, but I think I can warrant any other traveler who may do so some pretty weird music for his lullaby. The plant bears large, waxy blossoms that grow directly on the stem and branches and the fruit is a first-class luxury to the Indians. When the red flood of sunset comes on those great plains and hill slopes where no other object breaks the far expanse, while the ancient river moves silently on to the lonely gulf and the mysterious sea, and the traveler steps halt under that old spell of evening, then the dark, upward-pointing finger of the saguaro gives an added solemnity to that impression of the vast, unchanging and elemental which is the eternal note of the desert end of chapter three chapter four of california desert trails by joseph smeaton chase this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the smaller cacti shrubs and flowers the desert is the kingdom of the cacti, 
for the cacti are the special offspring of the desert. With ingenious pains, nature has wrought out this unique family, fitted to endure the very reverse of ordinary plant conditions. Their part is to hold the frontier that meets the empire of drought, and they are shaped and armed for the task. Since leaves yield too much to evaporation, spines and thorns are adopted. Rainfall being a matter of doubt, the cactus models itself on the canteen and fills up to the limit when it gets a chance. And since a canteen is a temptation to thirsty tramps, such as jackrabbit and coyote, the spines are hooked, barbed, clawed, and made as generally troublesome as possible. Yet it seems as if, when the matter of blossoms come up, nature's heart relented. She could not bring herself to fashion a forbidding flower. After the giant saguaro, described in the previous chapter, the barrel cactus, Echinocactus cylindraceus, Bisnaga or Bisnaga of the Mexicans, is the one that first claims notice. Here and there about the rocky hillsides and mesas stand these odd shapes, upright cylinders from two to six feet high. The surface is beautifully fluted and covered with a close network of spines three or four inches long, hard as ivory and sharp as needles, real works of art. On the top of the cylinder, there comes in spring a circle of papery, rose-like, lemon-yellow flowers. They sprout directly from the cylinder, making a dainty pale gold coronet that seems strangely out of place on that preposterously tousled nigger head, as the plant is sometimes called. This portly vegetable is, as I suggested, really a reservoir of water. The interior is a sponge of water-holding tissue, protected from evaporation by the leathery skin. Desert men, of course, know all about this convenient arrangement and draw upon it at need. Many a life forfeited to the thirst demon would have escaped out of his hand if the doomed wretch had but known the secret. He is an unwise man indeed who dares that demon without the key to many of the desert's problems. The process of tapping this source of water is simple enough. The top of the barrel is cut off. A depression is scooped in the pulp. The surrounding tissue is crushed by pounding with axe helve or anything that will serve as a pestle. And then a clear liquid, rather flat in taste but quite drinkable, will gradually exude into the hollow that has been made in the pulp. Like Samson's conundrum, out of the eater came forth meat. One may say of the bisnaga, out of the drinker came forth water. Next, if not first in obtrusiveness, is the choya, Opuntia bigelovii. First, it certainly is in villainous traits and in the ill regard of every desert traveler. It is an ugly object, three or four feet high, with stubby arms standing out like amputated stumps. The older parts are usually black with decay, the rest of a sickly greenish white, and the whole thing is covered with horrible barbed spines, uncountable in quantity and detestable in every regard. It has, moreover, a very vile habit of shedding its joints, and these roll by instinct into the places where they can most easily achieve their purpose, which is to stab the feet of horses and spike pedestrians through their boots, as they readily can do. Everyone who has traveled with horses on the desert has had the job of ridding his animals of these devils, which in many places grow so thickly that to dodge them is out of the question. The Indians say that they jump at you. This sounds like an exaggeration, but upon my word, I don't know. Often when I have felt sure that I passed clear of a certain choya, I found he had me after all. I remember some years ago crossing the Devil's Garden, a great cactus thicket between the Whitewater Wash and Seven Palms. My companion and his Arizona cow pony were both old desert habitués and past masters in cactus, while my mount also hailed from the Arizona ranges where cactus is the daily round the common task. Yet our combined sagacity came far short of keeping us out of trouble. First one and then the other of us had to stop, kneel in the roasting sand, with the sun at somewhere about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 
and pull out one by one the long barbed thorns from the feet and knees of the wincing animals. In these minor surgical operations, we gradually lost sight of each other, and it was not until long after dark that we met again at our designated camp at Whitewater. The Choya is the general enemy. In autumn, when the range is at its poorest, I have often seen cattle in horrible distress from a great lump of this fiendish plant that had got hooked onto their muzzles as they searched for browse. At every attempt to feed, the tormenting imp, of course, took a stronger hold. As one cannot come near these half-wild cattle of the ranges except by lassoing them, many an unlucky steer has died of starvation from sheer inability to pick up feed. I could willingly devote a chapter to abusing the choya. Enough, however, to add that the blossom is of a pale, unwholesome green, hardly noticeable, and that if the plant bears any helpful or even innocent part in the scheme of things on this planet, I should be glad to hear of it. I do indeed remember to have seen hornets in search of building sites inspecting the choya with evident approval, but that hardly counts for a virtue. Prominent almost everywhere in the view is another cactus, often called from its branching, antler-like habit, the deer-horn cactus, Opuntia echinocarpa. Unobservant people are apt to confuse this species with the last name and call it choya. If one should do so, it would be proper to apologize. Without being a saint, one may object to being taken for a murderer. The deer horn grows in spreading shape to a height of six feet or more, a maze of bristling ramifications that form the favorite nesting place for one of the desert birds. Here the cactus wren builds and broods as secure from snakes and other enemies as if she were housed in the interior of a hedgehog. I have once seen the nest of this bird in a true choya, probably the device of some super careful mother who had had unfortunate experience in speaking with the enemy at the gate. The deer horn bears a rather pretty flower of an uncommon brownish green or bronze hue, seen, I think, in this plant alone. Less frequently met is a species much like Echinocarpa, but with stems and joints much thinner and thorns fewer, though not less aggressive. This is Opuntia ramosissima. It bears a small brown flower, a hue that Flora does not greatly love, but though she is no Quaker, variety is her breath of life, so even brown is adopted as a novelty. The handsomest of all cactus blossoms, to my mind, is that of Sirius Engelmanii, which grows usually in company with the two foregoing species. The plant looks like a colony of a dozen or so spiny cucumbers, set up on end, generally under the shade of a creosote bush or in the lee of a boulder. I have no grudge against this fellow, who bites only if you strike him. The blossom is a most charming one, a sheeny rose-like cup of superb purple or wine color, crowded with golden anthered stamens, and with a pistil breaking into soft green plumes that curl as daintily as a moth's antenna. One who is on the desert in spring should on no account miss the sight of this exquisite flower. Almost as handsome is the blossom of another common desert cactus, Opuntia basilaris. This is one of the flat-lobed or pancake species, and is similar in general habit to the common tuna, prickly pear, or Indian fig. The flower buds sprout in a row from the edges of the lobes, and make a fine show with their cups of silky cerise. This plant, like the tuna, is valuable to the Indians who achieve a special delicacy by cooking the young buds in a pit heated with hot stones. But let the unwary beware. There is more in the basilaris than meets the eye. The lobes have a downy, innocent look, spines apparently absent. Trust her not, for she is fooling thee. The velvety surface is covered with myriads of infinitely fine prickles that come off at the lightest touch and form a sort of plush on the rash person's skin, almost invisible but most aggravating to the touch. The removing of them, though a fine exercise in patience, is one of the most melancholy occupations that I know. All of the foregoing bear cup-shaped, papery blooms of what may be called the usual cactus character. 
There is a quaint little cactus, not very common, Mammillaria tetrancistris, usually only two or three inches high, that has an entirely different flower. It is claret color, fleshy, and vase-shaped, and bears for fruit a bright coral-red vessel like a tiny chili, from which it gets its Mexican name of chilito. I have heard it called strawberry cactus, a puzzling misnomer. Fishhook is another and better name, arising from the inch-long thorns, curving sharply at the tip. And pincushion has an evident bearing on the little green cushion stuck full of shining prickles. But, as is so often the case, the Spanish word is the most apt. Do the Mexicans love flowers more than we? Perhaps they understand them better, if only because they look at them with more simplicity. There is another species of mammillaria, almost identical in appearance with the foregoing, except that its flowers are white, rather like the tuberose. Leaving now the thorny subject of the cacti, the ruling plant, and the one of widest distribution over our southern deserts, is the creosote bush, Larea glandulosa. It is a handsome bush, often eight or ten feet high, airy and spreading, with small leaves of brilliant varnished green, which give it a pleasing effect in the general scheme of gray. From the tarry feeling and smell of the foliage, it gets its common name of greasewood, or among the Mexicans and Indians, hediondia, meaning bad-smelling, though the peculiar order is not to me disagreeable. In spring, the plant is set profusely with starry yellow flowers, which mature into little woolly globes as pretty as the blossoms. Over wide tracts of desert, the creosote is the sole object that breaks the cheerless expanse, and I often felt that the sense of solitude, vastness, and monotony was deepened by the presence of this plant, growing for league on league, almost identical in size and spacing, now stirred to a momentary sigh by the fitful wind, then, in a moment, motionless as death in the trance-like stillness of the heat. A noticeable plant about water holes and oases is the arrowweed, Lucea sericea. It wears the desert's regular livery of gray and forms dense thickets six or eight feet high, through which it is not easy to push one's way. The cane-like stems grow straight and stiff from the ground, needing only smoothing by rubbing on a grooved rock to make excellent shafts for the light Indian arrows. The feathery leaves have an acrid smell, always associated in my mind with the thought of jaded arrivals at long-expected camping places and eager draughts of tepid, unsatisfying water. The blossom is a fuzzy, dingy pink affair, appropriate to the unwholesome alkaline soils which the plant seems to prefer. The general grayness of desert vegetation is largely due to one class of plants, the genus Atriplex, which, with its many species, makes up a large proportion of the total growth. Wide areas of low-lying desert are dotted with great hummocks of quail bush, Atriplex lentiformis, curious in their perfect dome-like form, and easily mistaken at a little distance for drifts of sand. This shape, typical of the desert growths, no doubt represents an effort at self-protection from the general persecutor, the sun. The canny tortoise seems to have set the model with his make-what-you-can of that contour, and there really is not much to be made of it, either by wind, sun, or sandstorm. I often wish that I had been cast in a similar mold. Another atriplex of the species Canescens is noticeable for the bright green tassels of its seed vessels, of a papery texture and peculiar shape for which it has been given the common name of shad scale. Since it fruits in the late summer, when the desert is doubly deserted, its unique feature is not generally known. One more relation of the quail bush that is worth noting is the little prickly-leafed atriplex cymenolytra. The young foliage, of palest gray with rose or lilac shell tints, whitens under the summer sun to almost a look of ivory. At Christmas tide, it is sold in the coast cities as desert holly, sometimes with red berries of other plants artfully attached to make it better fill the part. The leaves are really holly-like in shape, but after all a poor substitute for the royal green ilex without which Christmas is only half a festival. 
often found growing with the ocotillo, which was described in the previous chapter, is the agave deserti. This is a relative of the century plant of parks and gardens, and is almost identical with the indispensable maguey of Mexico. Again, we have the desert's eternal note of gray and the huge bayonet-pointed leaves, from the midst of which, when the plant is 12 to 20 years old, a single straight flowering stalk shoots up to a height of 8 or 10 feet, breaking into crowded blossoms of honey-dripping yellow. Once having bloomed, the plant dies. Like the ocotillo, the agave makes a striking figure in many a desert landscape. On scarred, sun-smitten hillsides and down leagues long stony bajadas, the earth bristles with their blue-white daggers in impenetrable chevaux de frise, stuck here and there with leaning poles, relics of former years flowering. Flora is again on the defensive, for without those pikes and lances she could never hold her own against the cattle, bighorn, and deer that covet the succulent flower stems, and whose tracks she find in spring all about these forbidden preserves. From time immemorial, the agave has supplied the desert Indians with one of their few luxuries, one, moreover, that is both food and confectionery. Now that every country store offers easy satisfaction to stomach and sweet tooth, this whole source of supply has fallen into neglect. But now and then the Indian, answering the call of the wild, still grows a field to bake mescal. One recent spring I was able to join a friendly Vulcan Indian who was bound on this time-honored function. Briefly, this is the manner of it. Arrived at the mescal ground, which was on the southern desert overlooking the Borrego Valley region, our first work was to search for plants with flower stalks in the right stage of growth. The deer and wild sheep had been before us, and it took us an hour or two to secure a dozen young and tender shoots that Antonio pronounced bueno. With his axe, he cut deep into the core of the plant, at the base of the great asparagus-like stalk. The shoot was cut out, its top struck off, and the leaves trimmed away, leaving a clean butt fifteen inches or so long, eight or ten thick, and weighing several pounds. Next, a pit was dug, two or three feet deep and somewhat more in diameter. This was lined bottom and sides with flat slabs of rock, and the loose coping was laid also about the edge. On this coping, the agave butts were laid. A good bonfire was built over the pit and allowed to burn for twenty minutes or so, the embers falling into the pit and covering the bottom thickly. Then the butts, already charred by the fire, were tumbled into the pit, and with them the heated coping stones and all the still glowing embers. Earth was banked up over all, and the pit was left for the day. The next afternoon we resurrected our booty after some thirty hours baking. The charred lumps had much the appearance of elephant's feet. Cutting away the blackened skin, we arrived at a golden-brown mass as sweet as molasses and with a flavor that I first found peculiar, then interesting, and finally seductive. In a cranny of the rocks, Antonio's quick eyes had sighted a relic of mescal baking of old, a long, straight pole of the heavy wood of the mountain mahogany, one end shaped to a chisel-like edge. It was, Antonio said, a pewi, the tool used for cutting out amouche, mescal, by his people of bygone days, before the white man and his wonderful things of iron and steel had come within their ken. It had an uncouth look that suggested the weapons of cave dwellers, and I wondered whether the formidable old tool might not have seen wilder service in its day than just the peaceable reaping of agaves. I early learned that the desert is full of floral surprises, but I was not prepared to find among them a snowy, virginal lily. Down on the sun-seared flats about the upper end of the Salton Sea, I came upon the wonderful Hesperocallus undulatus, a flower that might be looked for in some carefully warmed and watered greenhouse, but never in these arid spaces of sand. It was mid-April, near the end of the plant's flowering season, and only a few of them were left in bloom. I was told that a week earlier they had stood in thousands all over the gray levels that stretched from the edge of the bitter sea back to the ochre mountains. Tall and slender, they carried their delicate large bells, three or four to a cluster, 
knee-high above a mat of wavy, ribbon-like leaves. One rubs one's eyes at meeting these Easter lily-like flowers in this dry and thirsty land where no water is. In the same region, but scattered over a wider territory, is found another choice flower, one of the mint zealias. Its blossom is creamy white, of the most satiny sheen of any flower I know, each petal closely penciled with vermilion in very fine parallel lines. The foliage, however, is harsh and scaly, rather a drawback to the beauty of the plant, whereas the lily is wholly gentle and Madonna-like. I must pay tribute also to the great white evening primrose, Oenothera trichocalyx, which on moonlight nights throws the glamour of fairydom over the dry, commonplace sands. The huge four-inch blossoms shine up like little moons, but beware how you stoop to handle them, for the plants are a favorite harbor for the sidewinder, that wicked little horned rattlesnake that goes sideways and bites without ringing the bell. I have not yet spoken of the plant that makes the greatest show of all about the borders of the desert, where it covers dark canyon walls and the lower slopes of mountains with a stipple of gray that changes in spring to gold. This is the Encelia farinosa, a stiff bush up to two feet high, growing in the favorite hemispherical shape of desert shrubs, with pale gray leaves and brittle twigs that exude a yellow resin, this resin, it is said, has been used under necessity in place of orthodox incense, so that Mexicans and Indians call the plant hierba de incencio. The flowers are yellow stars, profuse and beautiful, and are borne on long, slender stems that project evenly several inches beyond the outline of the bush, which is then like a big gray pincushion stuck full of yellow floral hat pins. The plant is very prolific, and whether in flower or not, is a noticeable feature in any landscape in which it finds a place. Another species, in Celia californica, with dark green leaves, is found oftener on the levels than on hillsides. The mention of the Encelias brings to mind spring days a year or two ago that I spent in Deep Canyon, one of the principal canyons of the northwestern part of the desert. The winter had been one of unusually heavy rains, and every desert plant was doing honor to the rare event. It is hopeless to attempt to give the reader any true impression of the floral outpourings that year as it was revealed to me in Deep Canyon. To put it in one weak figure of speech, it was a torrent of floral color, billows of red, yellow, and blue that filled the long canyon from side to side. The enclosing walls for hundreds of feet up all painted to one hue of yellow by uncountable myriads of Encelia blossoms. To name all the plants that entered into the spring show would be impossible, but the three plants that were most overpowering in volume were the Encelia, the Bellaperon, and the Phacelia, yellow, red, and blue, respectively. The canyon was a jungle of these plants, the bushes of Bellaperon especially wonderful, many of them six feet high and eight or ten feet long, wholly covered with the crimson blossoms. Hummingbirds were whirring about, nonplussed like myself at the sight. The plant is known as Flor de Tuparosa, hummingbird flower in Mexico, I am told, and honey-loving insects of every degree joined in keeping the air in a conglomerate hum. The other plant I named, the Facilia, or so-called wild heliotrope, grew in loose tangles all about the sturdier Encelia and Bellaperones, climbing as high as their support allowed, and encircling their yellow or crimson in wreaths of delicate blue. I must not overlook either that glory of the desert canyons in late spring, the flame-colored wild hollyhock, Feralacea ambigua. I call it flame-colored, but it is not that, and everybody whom I have asked to name the color has either named it differently or politely declined to try. Along the base of rocky walls you find bushes of the plant, with pale gray-green leaves and superb sprays of blossom, which you may call pale vermilion, or apricot, or brick-red, or flame, without being correct in any of the terms. In the neighborhood of Palm Springs and in Deep Canyon, I have seen it at its best, but everyone who sees it in a good season will agree that it is a splendid, strange, and wonderful flower. One other notable flower must be mentioned, the so-called 
desert verbena, Arbronia aurita. This, like all desert plants, varies greatly in its show of blossom according to rainfall and other conditions. But when the season is propitious, the verbenas make a never-to-be-forgotten impression. The rosettes of blossom, of a color between pink and purple, are crowded together in solid acres, almost miles of bloom, so closely as to be crushed at every step. The gentian meadows of the Sierra and the golden poppy carpets of our few yet unplowed foothills are matched and outdone by these rosy purple verbena plains of the desert. My little sleeping tent, six feet by three, pitched where the ground was freest of blossoms, enclosed scores of the clusters, and the scent within was like that of an orchid house. It would be impossible to give here even a brief reference to all the desert growths that are interesting for their uses, strange in their characteristics, or beautiful in their flowering. For instance, the odd sandpaper plant, Petalonyx thurberi, whose name indicates its peculiarity to the touch, the dyeweed, Parosela emorii, that announces itself too late by a deep yellow stain on your hands or clothing, and a great number that the Indians value for medicinal or other purposes. My notebook shows over a hundred plants that I found remarkable. Some of them will be spoken of in the chapter on Indian lore. From the bladder pod of February to the lowly but lovely Navarretia that in midsummer tints wide spaces with its delicate harebell blue, there is an unbroken flow of color. Anyone who may find himself on the desert in spring, especially if it be a spring following a winter of good rainfall, as rainfall goes on the desert, may count on an experience of wild flowers that, if he is a stranger, will yield him a memorable and surprising impression. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Some Desert Indian Lore. In this chapter, I pass on to the reader some items of information that I have gathered, in some instances directly, in others at second hand, of the beliefs and practices of the desert Indians especially with regard to the uses of certain plants. The topic is a large one, and cannot here be more than touched upon. Even so, much of what follows cannot be taken as trustworthy. Everyone who has attempted to delve into affairs ethnological, even if he be fitted for the task by study and training, knows the hopelessness of efforts to clear up the doubts and contradictions that arise at every step. Hence, these scraps of supposed fact or belief are offered more for the passing interest or amusement of the reader than as reliable fragments of knowledge. The only items not subject to this qualification are those referring to the medical qualities of plants, insofar as they may have been proved and accepted by authorities. Of Takwitz or Takush, the bad spirit of the Kahuyas, an Indian friend tells me that his visible manifestation is as a meteor, not, however, any ordinary shooting star, but such as to carry a train of sparks. If an explosion is heard, the sound of the meteor striking, it is said that Taquas has caught a victim. Otherwise, he is supposed to have failed in his attempt. The Taquitz meteor seen in daytime is called Tamya Suet, it also tries to catch the spirits of men. There is a certain rock on Palomar Mountain, many miles to the south of San Jacinto Mountain, where Takwitz has his home, to which this methodical demon is said to carry his prey, there to pound the flesh and prepare it for his maw. My criticism that spirits have no flesh was thought irrelevant. I tell you what we say, was the take-it-or-leave-it reply. The Diagueno Indians, that is, those formerly tributary to the mission of San Diego, recognize the same evil spirit, having his haunt on the same mountain at a spot they call Awikayai, but they name him Chauk. The curious rumblings sometimes heard to proceed from this mountain, and which I have noticed myself, are, of course, attributed to Takwitz's operations. A Diagueno Indian with whom I camped 
pointing one night to the Pleiades, said, We call them Siete Carrias, Seven Buzzards. He went on to explain that when the first people, that is, the original inhabitants of the earth, were seeking to escape from death, they were taken up into the sky and became stars. There were seven sisters, with one of whom, Coyote, who figures largely in Western Indian mythology, was in love. The sisters climbed up by a rope, and the lovelorn Coyote, catching the end of the rope, was drawn up after them. But the sisters, once safe, cut the rope behind them, and he fell, but not back to earth, for, see, said Antonio, pointing to Aldebaran, there he go. All the time he tried to catch that girl, but he never catch her yet. The creosote bush, Lorea glandulosa, Araqualsana, produces scantily a red, scale-like gum which is considered very valuable. It is used for repairing oyas, attaching arrowheads to shafts, and also as a medicine for the throat. Of this gum, the barrel was made in which the semi-divine hero of the Papagos, a southern desert tribe, was saved from death in the Great Flood. The creosote bush itself is used medicinally, a strong decoction of the twigs and leaves taken internally, being thought excellent for maladies of the throat and chest and of the stomach. The virtues and vices of the datura, a common rank plant very similar to the well-known jimson weed, with large trumpet-shaped, white or lilac-tinted, sickly sweet flowers which open at night, are well known to the Indian. They call the plant tuluache and put its narcotic properties to use in connection with certain of their social and religious ceremonies. It is believed to confer clairvoyance, so that, by its use, one may recover lost articles, though it is capable of more difficult feats. For instance, it was reported to me of a certain blind Indian of my acquaintance, who was formerly a noted gambler, that he had lost his sight through too frequent use of toluache, by means of which he used to read the faces of his opponent's cards. The pounded leaves, applied hot as a poultice, are said to be effective for relieving pain, however acute, but you must not eat hard food, that is, heavy or indigestible, soon before, or it will kill you, said Lugardio. As a remedy for saddle galls, it is reputed to be sovereign, as is also a powder of the mistletoe of the desert juniper, or of the root of the common wild gourd, or calabazia, mixed with sugar. The raven, or carrion crow, eminent for sagacity since Noah's day, and made half supernatural by Poe, is a bird of omen to the Indians also. A certain part of the Santa Rosa Mountains, Wahatnauha, is known in Spanish as Casa de Cuerva, or Raven's House, or in Indian, Alwatemhemki, House of Many Ravens, and is held in superstitious regard. Rock crystals are believed to be missiles which the raven has cast at men with evil intent. I have noticed that any piece of glittering rock is apt to be considered bad medicine, and such are always part of the stock and trade of the pole or medicine man, in Spanish, a chichero. It is natural that the two great contiguous mountains, San Gorgonio and San Jacinto, should be thought to be brothers. Their names are Quaid a Kaich and Aya Kaich, respectively, the former being looked upon as the elder. It is a pretty idea that is embodied in the use of the Spanish word ojo, meaning eye, for a pool or spring of water, with ojito for diminutive. The Kawiyas have the same poetic thought in their word palhepush for a pool. In the word or phrase applied to their ancient wells, now non-existent, to which one descended by steps cut in the earth, we have an example of natural language building. The Kawiya word for water jar, Spanish oya, is kawomau, and that for earth or ground, temau. Hence the well was tema kawomau, or earth oya, neatly enough. Making fire by friction of dry sticks is an art not often practiced in these days, but two Palm Springs Indians with whom I once camped were experts at the game. Two pieces of dry palm fruit stem were the tools, one an inch or so broad, lengthy material, 
the other less than half as thick, about a foot long, and perfectly straight. A few dead leaves were placed in a little heap. The larger stick was laid beside them and held in place by one of the men, a hollow having first been made in the surface of the wood, with a little groove leading from it to the leaves. Then the smaller stick, trimmed to a blunt point, was put to the hollow and rapidly revolved by rolling between the open hands of the other Indian. His hands moved down as he rolled, returning again and again to the top. The friction sent a fine stream of wood powder down the groove upon the leaves. In less than two minutes, smoke showed at the point of friction, then sparks began to fall on the tinder, and finally a flame was started by blowing. Less than three minutes sufficed for the operation. It was hard work while it lasted, for the fire was endangered by the perspiration caused in kindling it. An Indian woman, one whose industry, dignity, and general high character I admire, when on her first trip inside was taken by friends of hers and mine to see the ocean. The place chosen was a seaside resort near Los Angeles, one that aspires, I believe, to the proud title of the Coney Island of California. On coming in view of the sea, she was deeply excited, though self-possessed. The car was stopped, so that she might gaze her fill. Her childlike wonder and murmured words of awe were a study in natural emotion. Approaching the water's edge, she was a little reluctant at the boom and wash of the surf. Then she stood quiet and intent, as if striving to grasp the hitherto unimaginable fact of such an infinity of water. Her companions made no unwise attempt to overwhelm her with statements of the real vastness of the ocean. When at length they turned to leave the beach, she still stood enthralled, then knelt by the margin and tasted the water, beckoning to it and speaking to herself or to it in the Indian tongue. It was hard for her to turn away. Again and again she stopped to gaze, and when they came among the sideshows and switchbacks, she had no eyes for these irrelevancies, but at every opportunity she turned afresh to the great simple marvel of the sea. It was to that, not the fat ladies or pink-eyed cannibals, that the uncultured Indian nature reacted. The leaves of the quail bush, Atriplex lentiformis, whose hemispherical gray hummocks are almost the sole feature of the monotonous silt flats, are used for soap and the seeds are boiled for food. The twigs and leaves of the sueda, which inhabits the same localities, besides being boiled and eaten, yield a black stain that is used for dyeing the material for baskets. A more sophisticated use for the plant is that of hair dye, for which purpose it is mixed with wet clay and plastered on the head, where it is left until dry. The common Isocoma acridinia, malchowal, is a standard remedy for cold and sore throat, and is used by pouring boiling water on the bruised leaves and inhaling the steam. The leaves, after being so used, may be applied as a poultice on the forehead. It may be noted that the genus Isocoma is closely akin to another, namely Solidago, whose etymology tells the curative properties of the genus. An odd-looking, not uncommon plant, in appearance like a mass of stiff green straws, is the Phaedra californica, or desert tea. A decoction of the twigs is of well-recognized benefit in stomach and kidney complaints. Indians, Mexicans, and whites alike are firm believers in its efficacy. It is occasionally found in drug stores. For tobacco, the desert Indians had Nicotania attenuata. It is a true member of the tobacco family, though prospectors, jealous for the honor of navy plug or blackjack, name it coyote tobacco in contempt. It was used both for smoking and chewing. The dried juice of a milkweed and the gum of one species of oak and of the incense bush in Celia farinosa supplied the primitive chewing gum. Thus, it may be proudly claimed that the great American habit is truly national, even aboriginal. It was thought comilfo to chew flowers of the poppy, as Stolzia, with one's gum, a touch of sentiment not more misplaced than some of the world of fashion can show. Tobacco pipes were made of clay, but were usually stemless, 
which suggests that the smoker took his whiff lying down, perhaps an excuse for enhancing the luxury. Bows were made of the screwbean mesquite, prosopis pubescens, or of willow, and light hunting arrows of arrowweed, Plucea sericea, or of carrizo, Phragmites communis, with points of mesquite hardened by fire. The carrizo also supplied a fiber for bowstrings. War arrows, of course, were more formidable, armed with barbed points of bone or obsidian that were of excellent craftsmanship. I have seen such arrow points several inches long and as finely wrought as a piece of jewelry. For clubs used in hunting rabbits or birds, the wood of the mountain chamiso, Adenostoma sparsifolia, was preferred. The large storage baskets for holding the family stock of acorns, pinion nuts, and so forth are usually made of willow sometimes of a species of arrowweed, often in ingenious shapes. They are called mayonut m. The syllable m is a mark of the plural. The cacti, from tiny mammillaria to giant saguaro, almost all yield food to the Indian, and many of them serve other purposes as well. Water in quantity sufficient to sustain life may be taken from the great barrel cactus, Echinocactus cylindraceus, and the saguaro, Sirius giganticus. The former, hollowed out, has been known to be used as a cooking vessel by means of dropping heated stones into the food which has been placed in it. The fruit of another kind serves as a hairbrush. My fire-making friends brought a new vegetable to my notice in the shape of the flower buds of the barrel cactus, copashem, they call them. They grow in a circle at the top of the plant, and we had no difficulty in gathering enough for a meal. When boiled, they taste midway between Brussels sprouts and chestnuts, a very satisfactory dish. In another chapter, I spoke of the agave. All its relatives, the yuccas, are plants of many uses to the Indians. One still finds old men and women wearing sandals of yucca fiber, and excellent saddle blankets are made from it. The root of one species, yucca mojavensis, makes very fair soap, and its seeds are roasted for food. Of another species, yucca whippoli, the well-known Spanish bayonet, or quijote, both fruit and flowers are eaten. So also are the scarlet blossoms of the ocotillo and the yellow flowers of the agave, the latter probably for the sake of their honey, which is very plentiful but somewhat bitter. The ocotillo, by the by, when not in sap, makes a capital torch, burning with a white, steady light, as if there were some waxy ingredient. For food purposes, the two kinds of mesquite and the chia sages, Salvia columbariae and Salvia carduaceae, were the great standby of the desert Indians, together with acorns and pinion nuts from the surrounding mountains. Comparatively little use is made nowadays of these wild resources, but one may still chance to see some old housewifely crone seated on the ground and embracing with outstretched legs the wooden mortar in which she pounds out the family flower, or creeping about among the brush, beating with bat of palm fiber the chia seeds into her bowl basket, a basket that she wove, perhaps, three score years ago, while her Hiawatha was stalking antelope or wild sheep and into which she may have woven more of legend and romance than wise men of the Smithsonian would easily unravel. The hunter's instinct is strong in the men still. The other day I met old Ptolomeo, patriarch of his rancheria, ambling homewards on his wall-eyed pony with rifle and a half-dozen jackrabbits at his pommel. Ptolomeo is old, very old, but the jack that gives the slip to the old capitan must be endowed with more than the supernatural speed of most jacks, and Lugardio, just home from prosaic prune-picking in the mountain orchards, finding that my plans did not admit of an autumn hunting trip, remarked with a sigh, Then I guess I don't get a buck this year again. Two years now I don't get me a deer. Sta muy malo. The nourishing properties of chia seed should be better known. It is said that a handful or two of them, roasted and ground, will sustain a man through a day of hard exertion such as continuous running. Mixed with flour, it becomes the famous pinole of the Mexicans, the staff of life of the common people. 
It is believed to have stomachic as well as nutritive value. The mesquite bean is a good second. Analysis of the meal has shown it to contain over 50% of food elements, largely sugar. The beans of the Palo Verde, and even of the cat claw, though not so good, were formerly pressed into service. The curious Martinia, with its great curved seed vessels and claws like spring steel, was not overlooked. A use was found for it in basket making, and it also served for riveting broken pottery. Holes were bored in the pieces to be joined, and the tough hooks inserted in them gripped the parts together. The seeds were chewed by Indian boys who relished their sweet taste. Many uses were found for the palm. Its fibers were woven into baskets, though these were not of the finest grade, and brushes were also made from them. The broad fronds were excellent as thatch for houses, and strips from them made material for plating where close texture was not needed. The leaf stems were handy flails for threshing seeds, and the fruit, which is small and hard but with sweet, date-like flavor, when ground, entered into the composition of the all-embracing atole. The sweet tooth is well developed among our desert Indians, and nature has provided for it by furnishing many of the cacti with fruits that are sweet and healthful. The flat-lobed opuntias yield a prickly pear, or tuna, sometimes called Indian fig. The little mammillaria bears a small, red, pleasant-tasting fruit. Even the hateful choya has a fruit that is said to be agreeable, though I refuse to believe it. The saguaro is held in the highest regard by the tribes that inhabit its range for the lusciousness of its fruit and for many other uses included in these being the furnishing of an intoxicating drink little less atrocious than the mezcal from across the line. According to Mr. Lumholtz, the Papagos date their year from the commencement of the saguaro harvest, which occurs about the middle of our year. In many desert canyons, the so-called wild apricot Prunus aerogyna is plentiful and bears good crops of small sweet berries. Prime luxury of all, however, is amouche, a diagueno word, which is secured by baking the heart of the agave, as I have described in another chapter. But these natural dainties are coming to be little prized now that sweets of greater charm, because Americano, are offered in paper bags or lace-filled boxes at the store. On the reservation at Palm Springs, there are a number of magnificent fig trees, descendants of the old historic figs of San Gabriel Mission. One that I measured showed a circumference of over nine feet. These furnish an abundance of delicious fruit, the surplus of which the Indians are not slow at turning into money, finding a demand for it in Los Angeles, where it brings high prices, as it comes early in the market. Old Marcos is the proud owner also of a few fine date palms, real deglet nur aristocrats imported many years ago from Algeria and planted here by the Department of Agriculture to test their adaptability to our climate. No wonder if the tunas from his great cactus hedge, full 12 feet high, are less prized than of old. The Indian who panted for cooling drinks when heated in the chase was not condemned to water alone. A handful of crushed beans of the mesquite or the berries of the sumac, rue sovata, or, when obtainable, those of the manzanita, arcostaphalos of the upper canyons, added to the water in the olla, gave it a refreshing flavor. For society occasions, a pink tea effect could be obtained by serving a decoction of ocotillo flowers. The vogue for Indian baskets that has arisen in late years quite justified by their beauty of shape and design and their admirable workmanship, will help to keep alive for a time this ancient and honorable craft. Many of the older women are wonderfully adept, but it is rare to find a young one who has learned the art. And there is, besides, a tendency toward discarding the old traditional designs in favor of wallpaper patterns or crude attempts at realism. The woman whose introduction to the ocean I described above is one of the best basket makers I know, and I was pleased lately to find her giving her little niece, eight or ten years old, a first lesson in basketry. In even a small basket of fine weave there may be ten thousand or more stitches, so it was not surprising that little Conchita was not enthusiastic. 
It was remarkable to meet recently an Indian woman of certainly over 80 years who had taught herself the craft in the last few years and whose baskets are marvels in design, color, and texture. Pottery making is now seldom practiced among these desert Indians. With the necessity for handmade utensils, the art has almost ceased. I found pottery still being made recently at San Ysidro, a mountain village of the Cahuillas, and at Rincon, a Luiseño rancheria. The shapes were good, but the workmanship clumsy or careless. In graceful outline and delicate construction, the older specimens one finds are admirable. The old ollas were sometimes decorated, though seldom elaborately. In view of the fragility of the vessels, it is not to be expected that great pains should have been spent over ornament. The ground about the sites of old villages is littered with an astonishing amount of pottery debris, and the traveler reflects with awe upon the centuries of spanking to which these countless tokens of youthful misadventure solemnly bear witness. Of medicines that were resorted to by the Indians in olden days, there were too many to be more than briefly touched upon here. Some have already been noticed. To name a few others that were most in vogue, the gum of the incense bush in Celia farinosa was heated and applied for pain in the chest, whence the plant was also known as yerba de vaso. The twigs of the chamiso of the desert mountains, adenostoma sparsifolia, yerba del pasmo, furnished an emetic. A famous remedy, almost a cure-all, was the yerba santa, aerodiction. The wild buckwheat, aerogonum fasciculatum, yielded an eyewash and alleviated pain in head or stomach, and an infusion of the leaves of the sumac, rus ovata, gave relief in case of colds. Another herb of renown was the yerba mansa, anamopsis californica, found in damp places and thought excellent in sundry complaints. The herbal remedies were supplemented by the curative virtues of the thermal springs and by the very effective temescal or sweat house, prototype of our Turkish bath. Cord for fish lines, snares, slings, and nets was procured from several plants. The agave and yucca were the principal sources, but a superior fiber was taken from one of the milkweeds, Asclepius aerocarpa. Brushes came from the ever-useful agave. Glue was at hand on the mesquite or was ingeniously prepared from other plants. A sort of coffee was made from the roasted nuts of the simensia. Paints of various colors were taken from the earth, and splendid dyes were obtained from sundry herbs. In short, there were few, if any, needs of a natural life in a mild climate that these people, whom the early whites, in conscious superiority of whiskey and six-shooter, named diggers in contempt, had not found the means of supplying. Many more pages could be filled with the list of their discoveries and appliances, for those I have named are but examples drawn at random from an astonishing number. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 A Desert Ride, Palm Springs to Seven Palms. After some months spent about the northwestern part of the desert, with headquarters at the village of Palm Springs, I made ready to launch out on a complete circuit with variations of the Colorado Desert. It was within a few days of the end of May, a much later date than I should have wished for the start. The sun had settled down to his summer's work and came up each morning at full blaze in a merciless sky, with that baleful mien which always throws me into anticipatory perspiration, and which still brings to mind the morning burst of my old dominie into the classroom, menacing, bloodshot of eye, and gnawing on his fingers like a famishing ogre. Delay had been caused partly by a long course of unsettled weather, partly by fly sores on the neatly striped legs of my burrow mesquite. I had purchased her at Banning, the desert portal town lying in the neck of the San Gorgonio Pass, where the railroad had dropped me in January. 
we had had bickerings such as are bound to occur when similar constitutions are thrown together but on the whole the connection had been pleasant and i think profitable on both sides in many a canyon we twa had pooed the goins fine and in friendly tandem we had wandered mony a weary fit of unprofitable sand and cactus and for my part i had no thought but that our fortunes would keep one trail for many a mile yet untrod i meant moreover to get mesquite a comrade when we reached the settlements down the valley for though her load for the long journey was no more than her accustomed one i wished to make the best arrangements so as to ensure reasonably fast travel also i hoped thus to have the means of carrying water in excess of the capacity of my two canteens one of a gallon the other of half gallon size for my mount i had bought from an indian acquaintance a small tough horse born and bred on the desert he promised or francisco promised for him to be excellent for my purpose his indian name of pose meaning little did not quite please me with its inapt suggestion of flowery meads and i rechristened him kawea partly in allusion to the name of the tribe to which his old master and therefore he belonged namely the kahuya of which kawea is a phonetic variant but more out of a compliment to the memory of the loyal companion to whose virtues clarence king does honor in a book which i am never tired of praising mountaineering in the sierra nevada let me say at once that in many a hard day's march and sometimes under necessity night's march to follow it a stretch kawea secundus did full honor to his name on the morning of starting i had been up since four o'clock and we got on the move while palm springs was yet rubbing its eyes as we passed the reservation there came the chatter of orioles breakfasting with nonchalance on old rosa's early figs at forty cents a pound the racket checked while the thieves listened with bored amusement to the rattle of her warning bell a kerosene can with horseshoe clapper hung high among the branches of the patriarchal tree this operated by rosa's foot so as not to interfere with the fashioning of baskets or tortillas it went on again the moment the tattoo was ended not so i guess the slumbers of her neighbors turning northward i struck toward the western point to the great sand hills that rise conspicuously across the valley i had long been tantalized by their artificial shape their mysterious changes of color and the secret of what lay behind them whether palmy canyon windswept mesa or characteristic characterless plain i meant now to find a way in their rear more interesting than the regular road down the valley already familiar to the point of tediousness before we were a mile on the way certain doubts that i had had as to mesquite's good will toward the expedition hardened into certainty of trouble of all the crimes that are latent in these complicated beasts the most terrifying is that of lying down under the pack in my dealings with mesquite hitherto when i had either led her by halter rope or marched alongside or behind this had occurred once or twice but laying it to some momentary qualm i had passed it by now whether it were some sudden access of those traits for which the tribe is notorious awakened by a suspicion that we were bound on a long hard voyage or mere spite at seeing me for the first time riding while she was left to walk i cannot guess anyhow of a sudden i felt a check on the rope by which i was leading her tow-line fashion and looking quickly around saw her deliberately gather her feet kneel down and compose herself in an attitude of luxury i dismounted and pulled she was uninterested i shouted and fainted blows she seemed coldly to smile rope ended she put her head to the ground and tried to roll and though the pack balked the attempt i knew by disastrous sounds that ruin was rife among the contents in the last resort i hit on a goad prodded lightly she grunted in contempt prodded urgently she kicked but shivered prodded ruthlessly uskeal sanguinem reader the case was extreme and the temperature of a good hundred and forty in the sun triumph 
She scrambled to her feet and stood quaking and defeated for the time. Another quarter mile and the whole business was enacted again. A furlong and yet once more. And in brief, within the space of six miles, which brought me to my first intended stop, eight several battles were fought. I cannot say and won, for the strife was but intermitted, never closed. And on three occasions, the load had all to be thrown off and repacked. This settles it, my fine girl, I said at the second repacking. Kawea and I can manage without your help if this is an instance of it. The last of your disastrous tribe shall perish from the earth before I ever put faith in a burrow again. To dispose of Mesquite finally from these pages, I may say that the next day I took her back to Palm Springs, with no trouble whatever now that she was not outward bound. There I left her, and with no such relentings as Stevenson noticed in himself on parting from the classic Modestine. I sorted over my baggage, cutting down to the barest needs and to the point where they could be contained in two pairs of saddlebags. One of these fitted at the horn and one at the cantle of my McClellan saddle, with two light blankets strapped behind the rear pair. The two canteens were necessities, and I carried also a light hatchet, a picket pin, and a single-barrel 20-gauge shotgun. Though this, useful as it was, I later discarded for saving of weight. My camera, of course, was indispensable. Thus equipped, I made a second start. The circumstances of the former attempt had not conduced to enjoyment of the scenery or other natural incidents of the way. Now, with peace of mind dearer than all, I had leisure and mood for observation. I was riding northward to the oasis of Seven Palms. Almost before the last studded pepper tree outpost of Palm Springs was passed, I was engulfed in the gray waste. Gray, not alone of sand and boulder, but also in the main of vegetable and animal life. Isolated bushes of creosote rose here and there above the level, enough of them merely to accent the general hue by momentary relief of glossy olive. Encelia and burrowweed made up the bulk of the plants, but by now the yellow stars of the former had burned to ashes. The latter makes little show of bloom and wears a perennial garb of gray. These dense-growing, round-topped shrubs afford the minimum relief of shade to the eye. The light is thrown back unbroken from their hemispherical surfaces, and all there is of shadow is kept for their own needs as if under a close-hulled umbrella. Of animal life, little was to be seen but scurrying lizards, themselves mostly gray, but some of ivory white. These are bony little goblins with sharp tails and a leer in the eye that comes near being devilish. A few late flowers were out, principally the ethereal sky-blue Navaratia with which one slowly but surely falls in love. Large white evening primroses were still blooming under the creosotes, and here and there the daisy-like desert star, Eremiastrum, showed like floral Pleiades. A desert willow in a dry water course kept a few of its frail, orchid-like blossoms, and the indigo sparks of the dyeweed were plentiful, but almost lost in the wide sea of gray. A month earlier, a page would hardly have held the list of the flowery multitude. Now, by late May, floral autumn had come to the desert, and this in spite of its being a season of unusually late rains. But desert color does not lie in vegetation alone. A few miles north of Palm Springs, there rises a great dome of sand that for color effects, I can only compare to a vast opal. I have seen it pass in a few hours from milky white through pale chrome, gold, ochre, rose, madder, royal purple, indigo, and duskier purple to almost black. Such is the enchantment this desert atmosphere works, even at no distant range. As I now passed near it, the magic was as totally gone as that of Hamlet's dull firmament. It was a foul and pestilent congregation of sand atoms, weary to foot, weary to eye, most of all weary to thought, the embodiment of drought, hopelessness, infinity of number, 
infinitude of time. This strip of desert, lying at the eastern approach to the San Gorgonio Pass, is a veritable blowpipe and sandblast. The heated air rising under this fierce sun acts as a suction pump, drawing from the coast a compensating volume, and this pass forms the main channel for the daily interchange of sea and land air that gives Southern California climate its peculiar quality. It is by means of this regular wind current that the great sand hill has come into being. On most days, especially of spring and summer, to cross this tract is a highly unpleasant job. The force of the wind is phenomenal, and the steady, concentrated action results in launching volumes of sand with hurricane power against any object in its path. As an instance of the violence of this wind, I recall an average day of a former spring when a party, of whom I was one, stopped hereabouts for a meal. A sheltered spot was chosen, and a canvas sheet rigged against the wagon wheels for extra protection. And yet a cup of coffee set on the ground would be instantly blown over unless weighted down with a sizable stone. No amount of dodging availed to prevent every mouthful getting liberally sanded in transit. The conversation was lively, yet it was not a cheerful meal. On the present occasion, for a miracle, only a harmless breeze was blowing. It was instructive to note the effect of these sand-laden winds upon vegetation and even on rock. Wherever a fair-sized stone or boulder stood in the windway, some thrifty shrub, usually creosote or delea, crouched in its shelter, growing to leeward in a long streamer like a quick-set hedge. Some of these bushes were from ten to fifteen feet long, with height and width strictly regulated by the size of their rock protector. Any attempt to extend by so much as an inch beyond shelter was rendered hopeless by that deadly sand scour. In other cases, where some hardy, low-growing shrub kept a foothold, a long dune had formed in the rear where the check to the wind allowed the sand to settle. Both hedges and dunes ran invariably to the eastward, following the course of the wind. For variety, here and there were creosotes with a grotesque look of being on stilts, the soil having been gouged away from the roots by the wind to the depth of two feet or more. Many are the quaint comparisons suggested by the postures of these wind thrown plants. A yet more impressive token of the power of the sandblast is seen in the scarred and corrugated faces of the boulders. The rocks hereabouts are all of the igneous kind, but often differentiated, as geologists say. That is, not homogeneous, but made up of strata of varying degrees of hardness. Many of these bear deep-etched testimony to the sandstorms of ages, the softer parts being chiseled away and the harder left in bold relief. They might have been antiques carved from fragments of the bones of Kronos. The same thing happens, of course, and in very brief time, to softer structures. The telegraph poles along the railroad used to need renewal constantly, being soon cut through a few feet above the ground by the beat of hail-like gravel and the fret saw of the sand. Now they are sheathed with iron. Fragments of clear glass quickly take on the appearance of ground glass or dull metal. Upon everything, living or dead, the flying sand stamps its seal. Another noticeable thing, by the by, about glass that is exposed to the desert sun is that it quickly takes a hue of amethyst or lilac. This tint, expressive of light at its highest actinic power, may almost be called the characteristic color of the desert. I have often been forced to admire the beauty of the shadow tones cast by rock or tree, a thin, pure, violet hue. Nay, I have even been charmed with my own image, drawn in this ethereal air color by my enemy the sun. Half buried in sand, I noticed some weather-worn timbers. They proved to be railway ties with twisted rails still spiked to them. This was the mark of another destroyer, one that comes seldom to the desert, but is apt then to come in fury. It was water that had tossed this scrap of railroad miles from where it had been laboriously placed. 
either some rare long continued winter storm or more likely a sudden summer flood a glance at the surrounding mountains makes the matter plain figure the certain effect of a heavy fall of water on those two mile high walls of almost barren rock like raging giants the floods come leaping down torrent reinforcing torrent and burst roaring from the canyon gateways what work of man's hands could withstand that assault even when the shock is weakened by miles of distance in the path of these desert floods a railroad might as well be a bit of fish line here at any rate as i said to coea who stood with pricked ears pondering at the sight the age of horseflesh is not yet gone by partly hidden among dunes of sand bristling with a scrub of mesquite there is an oasis and a pleasant group of palms its name dating from a bygone decade is seven palms but there are now a score or so of the trees scattered about the place a cowboy acquaintance of mine years ago homesteaded the spot captured by the charms of a patch of dingy salt grass a pool of barely drinkable water and unlimited quail rabbits snipe and duck perhaps he had also an eye for a landscape which might move the toughest of punchers to admiration his cabin sheds and corral almost lost in the jungle of arrowweed made up the picture of a typical desert home three slender palms in shadow cameo upon an amethystine sunset gave the touch of perfection which is seldom far from the commonplace i made camp under a cluster of palms that grew in a hollow where a spring of alkaline water breaks out and spreads a white unwholesome efflorescence among the arrowweed it is one of the drawbacks of desert travel that the water scarce at best is generally charged with substances that not only impair the thirst quenching quality but may have ill results on the health one of the minor effects of alkalinity which is an almost universal fault of desert waters is a swelling and cracking of the lips i have known hardy cowboys inured for years of desert life to be disfigured hardly able to speak and positively refusing cigars after a week or two of water unusually tough i came near serious illness myself from this cause when i camped here some weeks earlier in the year yet this is comparatively good water as desert water goes there is another black mark against seven palms the inhuman wind that constantly blows here all through spring and summer after half a dozen visits to the place i fail to recall one day uncursed by that harrying wind ordinary wind i can stand a breeze is often refreshing but this sort of thing is frankly beastly it seems a sort of horseplay aggravating useless simply silly on this occasion though the day had been decently quiet toward evening the old nonsense began the palms took up the regulation scream and rattle that had blasted so many a night's sleep for me and by sundown you would have thought the valkyries were in full career i picketed kooia on the most sheltered patch of salt grass i could find and passed the evening in my cowboy's cabin with a phonograph that screeched its best yet failed to drown the racket that reigned outside the locality is prolific in coyotes and in fact has supplied me with the trio of skins on which i spread my blankets when mother earth's ribs are my bedstead it must have been the songs of some of these vocalists that put me and kept me asleep for in spite of the uproar i slept calmly in my palm bivouac till kawea's shrill neigh called me at daybreak End of chapter 6「7 of California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 A Desert Ride Seven Palms to Thousand Palm Canyon My plan on starting had been to make the first day's march a few miles longer and to camp at the next water beyond Seven Palms. This spot, known somewhat uncouthly as Two Bunch Palms, now became an easy objective for the second day. 
for one's marches in the desert country are figured from water to water be the distance little or great the wind had somewhat lessened by morning gathering breath for the next attack so i lay at middling ease for an hour interested in the morning business of the birds that made the grove a literal aviary the matted heads of the palms with their dead hanging fans made the snuggest of roosts and was as full of small sleepers as a boarding school dormitory these now came bursting out in twos and threes linnets sparrows finches buntings totaling scores with an enthusiasm for breakfast that i soon found infectious they had the weather gauge of me there however for even in the best sheltered corner it was hard to keep fire enough together to boil my billy of tea a few swallows were racing about like little incarnations of joy a prospector who is a frequent camper here had told me that they built their nests against the smooth bowls of the palms and i looked but without success for this example of the skill of the jolly little masons Kawea showed more than his usual alacrity when i led him in to be saddled and we took our way again northward there was no trail but none was needed for after a mile or two we came in sight of the two palms group conspicuous objects against the light ochre of the foothills in recent years a few land-hungry settlers have come into this region and are engaged in what seems to my judgment pathetic attempts at farming lack of water is of course the first obstacle and almost certainly a fatal one surface water sufficient for household use is easily got in most parts but this may be counted a misfortune since it merely makes possible a losing fight next stands the poor quality of the soil which with the exception of a patch here and there is much too light to produce crops except of one or two kinds that could only succeed by means of copious irrigation it is possible that wells sunk to a sufficient depth would yield a good supply but there the checkmate comes in it is the poor man who clutches at poor land better being beyond his means a truism that has special point in this state of booms and fantastic valuations while per contra the sole chance of productiveness with such land lies in heavy initial outlay for securing water it is the tribe of scatter alone i fear that realizes profits from these desirable acreages and his neatly baited trap is ever to the fore in the advertising columns of california newspapers it would be an act of both mercy and statesmanship for the government to withdraw from entry these delusive tracts whose very poverty makes their fascination for the impecunious at least until official experiment has shown whether they can ever be made to repay cultivation nearing two bunch for brevity the third syllable is dropped in common usage i came upon the tiny store that serves this ungrateful land here a young Englishwoman was wrestling with fate, struggling to make ends meet by merchandising on the microscopic scale. Her clients are as varied as they are few. Indians, cowboys, prospectors, chance travelers like myself, and such other unconventional folk as are content to seek health, wealth, or prosperity under circumstances that most people would think intolerable. For example, this young woman far from amazonian in physique for lack of a well fetches her water day by day per burrow from a mile away herself going on foot and it is along no shady lane or boulevard either i took a new view of chickens when i heard her speak bitterly of their heavy demands for liquid and felt respectful sympathy when a scatterbrained young rooster upset the water pan the two bunches of palms that give the place its name grow near together on a little bluff where the level desert breaks to the foothills of the San Bernardinos. A spring of good water issues below the smaller group, and here I made camp. A settler has built a small cabin above the spring, and as he was absent, I made his house my windbreak. On my first visit here, some years before, I found an old scarecrow of a fellow in possession living in a kind of burrow or dugout a more caruso like object i never expected to meet weird as many of these desert rats are to view he could not be said to be clad but antique rags were hung about him and he wore a scrap of debris on his heads under the delusion that it was a hat 
His hair was snow white, long and plentiful, his skin like that of a well-roasted fowl, and his eyes were bright and very blue. The blue eyes gave an infantile touch and somehow half prepared me for his proud announcement that he was a poet. What more he was or had been, I never fully knew, though I learned that he had known such spheres of life as a teamster, preacher, prospector, with others perhaps less blameless. Once only I got a taste of his poetic quality, but of that all I recall is a frequent loud roar of, O oh, Israel! A noticeable thing on the desert, whenever one is in the neighborhood of water, is the quantity of broken pottery that meets the eye. About seven palms the ground is littered with fragments in many places, and a number of fine unbroken specimens have been found by the cowboy settler. Here again broken shards are plentiful, and I have often been surprised at meeting these evidences of bygone populations in the most unlikely places. The pottery of the common red sort, but sometimes decorated with colored designs, is so light that the fragments remain on the surface, not buried by the wind. It was the custom of these desert Indians to burn the bodies of their dead and bury the ashes in a jar or oya, often along with such articles as baskets, stone or bone implements, and beads. Excavation in these places of old habitation often yields interesting treasure trove. Two Bunch Palms has one of the finest outlooks on the whole desert. On the west, Mount San Jacinto stands near at hand in gray severity of granite, with many a league-long buttress, gallery, precipice, chasm, and livid avalanche scar. From the vast apron of Chino Canyon that casts its burden on the desert floor up to the sky-piercing splintery crag and high-hung glimmer of snow. The topmost cliffs have a fine cathedral look with their fretted coins and dark-niched brooding pines. Separated from the northern spurs of San Jacinto by the San Gregorio Pass rises another magnificent mountain, San Bernardino. With its height of 11,485 feet, it slightly overtops San Jacinto, but being rather more distant, it makes from here a less majestic, though not less beautiful, impression. The twin mountains stand like portals for the traveler's gateway to the fertile coast, the western ocean, and the new old world of the Orient. When, in winter and spring, they are hooded with snow, they make a memorable sight, and when a ruddy sunrise sets them aflame, they seem torches, lighthouses of a continent, beacons of the old westward march. At evening, I climbed a hill for a sunset view. A curtain of murky gold hung over all the west. The sun had set cloudless behind the pass. In clear silhouette, the mountains cut the glow, all their ruggedness of contour lost in shadow, leaving only peaceful line and quiet color to charm the eye. Near at hand, the palms pointed upward with a gesture of tranquil hope. The western gold grew duskier. The world seemed dying, life passing again into its first unity. It was such a desert hill as this, I thought, that was once the favorite haunt of the Son of God. Often he must have taken joy, like me, in the full, calm glory of the evening star. Forage for Cahuilla was limited to burrow weed and a scant picking of galleta grass that stand by the desert horse. But I had brought a little barley for emergencies, and Indian frugality had to make up the balance. The breeze was broken in the shelter of the house, and I took a couple of hours of campfire comfort before turning in. I slept unharassed by wind, and when I awoke, the morning star was above the eastern divide, beaming on me like a promise for the day. That morning, however, proved one of the worst in the way of heat that I ever experienced. There was something positively blasting in the air, a deadly quality as though all oxygen were withdrawn. The light itself was a sickly whitish glare. I should think this sort of morning must forebode vast eruptions, such as of Montpellier and the Soufriere. I breakfasted, packed, and then changed my mind and declared to Cahuilla that we'd be hanged if we would move so long as that state of things lasted. 
So I off-saddled and lay all morning with canteen at hand, watching ominous clouds pile higher and higher over San Jacinto, then spread north and south over San Gorgonio and Santa Rosa. A storm was certainly coming, one of those sudden violent bursts that fall on this region at long intervals in summer, brewed almost in an hour in the furnace of the desert sky. A hundred yards in front of me was a palm that had lately been struck by lightning and was now a ghastly headless stick, like a skeleton finger pointing at its murderer the sky. At seven palms I had seen others like it, carrying scars that told the story. Being the only object of height on the desert, the palms are naturally marked for attack. The first boom of thunder seemed to be a warning, but I could not bring myself to move. By noon a little freshness crept into the air, and I gathered energy to eat my cheese and hardtack and make a start. We were now at the back of the great sand hills, and I turned eastward toward where a long gallery opened between them and the higher San Bernardino extension ridge. The storm still held off us, and seemed to be pouring its wrath wholly on the western highlands, a thing that often occurs, resulting in those sudden floods of water from apparently dry canyons that are so dreaded by desert men. When the clouds extend in summer over the open desert, rain may often be seen falling, yet never a drop reach the earth all being evaporated while passing through the heated air. I knew of a settler who had an outlying holding in the direction I was taking, and presently came in sight of his homestead, where I hoped to camp for the night and replenish my canteens for the long stretch that would come before I could reach the next water. It was mere luck that my hope was realized. I had taken for granted that I should find a well at the place, but it was a rash expectation. Like others hereabout, this devoted settler brings his water in barrels from miles away, and had he not been at home, we must have turned back to our last camp. As it was, we received a hearty welcome from man and wife, and were made as free of their precious water barrel as though it could be replenished by a word. I was even invited to supper and phonograph. I can never get over a sense of the marvelous with regard to this invention. I don't mean the thing itself. It is the improbable places where one finds it that staggers me. The contrast of this appendage of artificialized life with surroundings often the most primeval. Canned beef we look for everywhere and find it a common place at Lhasa or the Pole. But canned music sounds wild on these terms. Yet it is pretty sure to accompany the other. Probably the Lama is already tired of the latest Raukotrola, and only refrains from passing it on to the monks of Ketchenjunga, lest it might seem odd to send anything so old-fashioned. I never saw so spectacular a thunderstorm as the one that broke on the peak of San Jacinto that evening. By sundown, the clouds had gathered their total forces. Sulfurous and terrific, they piled almost to the zenith, until it seemed that when the stroke fell, it must crush the mountain out of being. There was the usual pause. Then Jove gave the signal. A spear of lightning shot through the murk, and the battle was joined. By the incessant flash and glitter, we could see what seemed to be a perpendicular shaft of solid water falling from the black vortex of the clouds upon the head of the mountain. It was as if a volcano had opened, and that dark column was spouting upward from a huge crater and spreading mushroom-wise into the death-dispensing clouds. It was quickly over. Indeed, it could not last long at that rate. Then, after that concert of the Thunderer's Best, my host turned on dim golden slippers as more suited to our capacity. The storm had done its work, and the morning came clear and, by comparison, cool. I left my hospitable friends early, and riding southeast was soon well into the long pass. A remarkable regularity of slope, as well as of level, is one of the desert's common characteristics, and one that contributes greatly to that sense of austerity which is its universal effect on the mind. There is seldom any modulation between mountain and plain. Rock plunges into sand with startling abruptness, 
or where some canyon debouches the rock wall will meet at a sharp angle a bajada that may run for miles in even grade at a slant of from five to twelve degrees and the slender angle where it joins the dead level will even then be clearly marked nature's love of the curve is abandoned here she works with t-square and mitre box instead of with the free hand that rules elsewhere footnote bajada this spanish word signifying a long downward slope or apron is one of those useful terms that california has kept alive from the former regime like mesa it fills a real need in briefly naming a characteristic element in western physical geography hardly will one find a desert landscape in which the bajada is not a feature End of footnote. for mile on mile we marched up this roof-like slope over a surface mainly gravelly but sprinkled with boulders and varied with river-like stretches of unmixed sand where washes came down from the northern mountains Cactus, Cilia, and creosote rang the changes on creosote, Cilia, and cactus, and animal life was at a minimum. In several hours I saw but three birds, all cactus wrens, though I heard perhaps as many more talking plaintively, it seemed to me, of the loneliness of this post-nesting season. Even lizards were few, and a red racer was the only member of the serpent tribe to enliven the way, nor he for long. For these fellows are like the ghost in Hamlet. One can barely say, "'Tis here, tis here, when tis gone." At last we came to the divide and could view the other side of the roof. The downward slope was as smooth as the one we had climbed, but plainly much longer. On the north still ran the brick-like wall of mountain. On the south, a jumble of sand hills and gullies, most Arabian in look and ahead mountains on mountains drab in near distance purple and farther with blues and ever paler tone as the range receded beyond range in the flickering heat they seemed as if painted on canvas that wavered in the wind this indeed is a common feeling in viewing a desert landscape in the intense light so much stronger than normal all seems visionary the very ground underfoot lacks solidity with its pale lilac shadows of all those thin spiritual hues that make the color charm of the desert and that painters find so baffling lilac is the prevailing note it is the most ethereal of tints hardly to be termed color and seeming more of the mind than of the eye yet once realized one finds it universal between you and the gray boulder three feet away you half seal half feel a veil of lilac light and the distance is suffused with it in varying degrees. Overlying the reds and browns of the mountain walls, it makes its delicate presence felt and covers the crudest facts of geology with a film of fancy, a touch almost a fairy. Desert shadows fall in the same high tone. There is nothing of darkness in them, no weight, no sense of dimness, but always that aerial tint of lilac, infinitely thin and refined. Over wastes of sand, aching and throbbing with light, one catches the same faint hue, lilac, always lilac. Canyons opened here and there into the hills on my right, and in some of them I thought I caught a hint of palms. A prospector who includes this route in his wanderings had warned me against being misled by these, but as a group of palms was to be my landmark, these appearances tended to doubtfulness and kept me a trifle uneasy. I had a fair idea, though, of where I was making for, so kept on hour after hour, alternately riding or leading my horse, but always in a little question whether I had not passed my point. Awkward, if so, on Kawia's account, for there was no prospect of forage or water for him except by our striking the one right place in this maze of possibilities. The heat was severe, though short of yesterday's intolerable degree. It was about noon when I saw a dark spot miles ahead, which I guessed to signify my palms. By two o'clock we were there and found that the palms grew at the head of a long canyon that should open on desert level. It was Thousand Palm Canyon, the place I wanted. 
From under the palms a feeble stream trickled away, its margin white with alkali. But water is water and an absolute requisite. There were scraps of fair pasturage, too, making it, for the desert, a desirable camp. It was good to see Kiwia go to work at the juicy tulis and water grass, and it stimulated my own appetite, jaded by hours of heat. I brewed some flat, spiritless tea, made a scratch meal, and then lay in palmy shade watching Kiwia's ribs fill out and enjoying a kind of lotus eater's ease. The temperature was just at century point by my little thermometer, and the whole place was kept on echo with drowsy coo of doves and cautious whistle of quail. Smaller birds formed little bathing parties of sixes and sevens, turning on the shower baths with what seemed criminal extravagance. At sunset, I wandered half a mile down the canyon. The drab mountains changed suddenly to rose, then crimson, then furnace red. It is fortunate that these transformations come at the hour when one's spirits are rising in prospect of the coolness of the approaching night. Otherwise, they might be wasted, meeting a listless, heat-burdened mood incapable of enthusiasm or even interest. The great twin mountains were hidden from me here, but the San Bernardino spur was close enough for its 4,000 feet to show to advantage. But though these drought-cursed mountains are admirable in color, one's pleasure in them is limited, since for mountains to be merely admirable is almost for them to be failures. The canyons yonder, bathed in indescribable hues, have no enticement for the imagination, for one knows that no streams are there, no trees, no birds, no ferny pools nor spouting cascades, only uncouth boulders, scant unfriendly shrubs, threatening reptiles, snarling wildcat, and slinking coyote. Such mountains never reach one's love. The night was warm, though a breeze rattled the palm fans over my bed. Once I was aroused by the approach of some large animal, and was barely in time to beat off a couple of mules that were making for my saddlebags. There is some instinct in these brutes that guides them unerringly for miles on any errand of depredation, yet drives them away from where their presence is desired. Toward morning, raising myself on elbow for a drink from the canteen, which on the desert one keeps at one's bolster as King Saul kept his cruise of water, I noticed the odd appearance of a star that was just rising in the east. It grew quickly to a little horn, and in a few moments announced itself as the moon, nearly at her monthly finale. By the time she had climbed to where her light fell among the ribbons of the palms, it was dawn. And I rose promptly in order to get breakfast before my unwelcome comrade, the sun, arrived to keep me company for the day. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Chapter Eight: A Desert Ride, Thousand Palm Canyon to Coachella Valley. • This was Sunday, and I was glad that the pasturage would allow of keeping it a day of rest a thing not always possible, even with the best of intentions in these regions where necessities of forage or water often drive the unwilling traveler on. During the morning I explored my surroundings and was delighted to find myself among the stately groves that give this canyon its name of Thousand Palms. There are several distinct clusters, each of many hundreds, growing at short intervals, and in side ravines are smaller groups each showing some feature of charm, strangeness, or picturesque arrangement. In one, a narrow gallery of ochre-hued rock that gave a wonderful depth to the complementary blue of the sky, I came upon six palms that grew in a compact block, as wide and thick as it was high, thatched to the ground with dead, hanging fans. One could cut into the mass as one would into a cheese, and a fine cell could be carved out of it by a desert hermit who didn't mind scorpions and tarantulas for neighbors. 
I climbed a hill to the east, from whence I could overlook a good part of the palms' territory. They stood like an army, an actual forest of palms, as unique a sight as can be found in our country, and as beautiful in its strange, fascinating way. No other plant grows with them. The straight, dark pillar stands solidly on a floor, deep laid with dry, fallen leaves which slide and crackle under the foot. As I moved among the stiff, uniform shapes, I felt a sense of that old Egyptian awe, the awe of overpowering mass and repetition, of monotony carried to the point of terror. It would have seemed quite in place to meet here one of those nightmarish processions we see on obelisks, or to discover faint hieroglyphs carved on those red, pylon-like shafts. In this canyon, I first found an attractive little plant, Atroplex hymenolytra, which I have seen sold on the streets of Los Angeles at Christmas under the name of Desert Holly. It is a low shrub with stiff, holly-like leaves and the characteristic brittleness of desert brush. The whole plant is dead white and looks much like a branch of true holly that has been dipped in whitewash. The day was warm, 106 degrees by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I drank often of the irresistible, though unpleasant, water, and even managed a bath, which left me with the sensation of being made of old India rubber. In the evening, the mystery of the night wandering mules was explained when two men came up the canyon. They were surprised to see me, having had no idea of there being anyone in that direction for twenty miles. I learned that they had ranches, or rather claims, in the valley below, and were engaged in developing water with a view to irrigation. I was hospitably urged to move down to the camp where one of them was working, a mile or so down the canyon, and strong inducement was held out in the promise of better water. Accordingly, in the morning I moved. My friend's camp was pitched at the edge of one of the palm groves and consisted of a roomy tent, a forge, a rough stable, and a mountain of debris the accumulation of three years of batching. For that term he had lived here most of the time alone, working at his water rights, tunneling, sinking shafts, running drifts and ditches, gradually gathering up the underground flow that was betokened here and there by seepages and beds of tules, a life of cheerless solitude plus hardest labor plus purgatorial heat. His task was nearly done, he told me, for he now had two hundred inches of water almost ready to be piped down to his half-section of land down in the valley at Edom, significant name, where he hoped to grow dates, figs, and early grapes for the tables of millionaires. If spontaneous kindness to a stranger deserves reward, my good Edomite's acres should soon be as fruitful as the land of Goshen. I was struck by the Arabian look of this locality. High-walled gullies of red or ochre earth meet and interlace, their bottoms filled with coarse gravel and boulders mixed with blue-gray smokebush and snutted mesquite and catclaw. Among birds, only the raven seems to tolerate this desolate spot, and his morose hue, tragical voice, and general graveyard air do nothing to enliven one's impression. The eye, discouraged by the crudity of the scene, instinctively dwells upon the palm whenever it is in sight, overlooking its sameness of form for the relief of its grace, finish, and appearance of culture. From Thousand Palm Canyon, I struck southwesterly into the open desert. My friend's little brook rippled for half a mile out of the canyon, then suddenly sank into the sands. San Jacinto was again in view, but purpled by distance. His load of snow seemed noticeably less than at my last sight of it only four days ago. A few miles to the west, there is a tract of dunes that looked worth visiting. A huge quantity of almost unmixed sand has accumulated here and has been worked up into remarkable forms. Wind and the principle of cohesion operating together have resulted in an arrangement of domes, half-domes, waves, crevasses, all the shapes that snowdrifts take, but with a characteristic wind ripple in addition. The glistening whiteness of the sand carried out the likeness to snow, 
but the sharpness of the breakage lines is what made the site so interesting. Long curves, beautiful in their ease of contour, led up to keen, clean-cut rims from which steep slopes ran down at sharp angle. From these edges there was always blowing a wavering veil of sand as fine as the spume stripped by the wind from the wave crests at sea. It was fascinating to stand in that universe of sand. The scriptural phrase, like the sands of the seashore for multitude, seemed almost weak in view of these great billows like the storm waves of mid-ocean. Here was not only a shore, but a sea of sand. The scene stamped itself strongly on my mind. The strange contours, differing from those of other materials, the shadow masses of clear blue, the amethyst of the nearer ridges of San Jacinto, the deep afternoon purple of the great mountain itself, the gleam of mingled snow and cloud along its crest, over all the glowing sky, too luminous and aerial to be fairly expressed as blue. I had been among these dunes once before, when a youngster from a ranch on the farther side had guided me to the edge of the tract. I was busied with camera and notebook, not noting my companion, when a patter of charging feet and a Comanche yell made me jump. It was only my guide enjoying a desert toboggan slide. He raced to the edge of a thirty-foot dune, threw up his heels, and took a header down the sharp incline. Running sand at every pore, he pronounced it bully and recommended me to try it, adding that it was one of his and his sister's regular forms of exercise. But I was past twelve and found it easy to refrain. My way lay now more to the south, where, a dozen miles away, was the little railway town of Indio. This lower northwestern arm of the desert, into which Thousand Palm Canyon issues, was intended to be named the Conchilla Valley, from the myriads of little shells that powdered the ground, mixed with some of larger size, relics of the brackish lake that, for a long period, filled this great depression. By some error, the name got upon the maps as Coachella, and the blunder has been retained until it is now signed and sealed beyond hope of correction. A botanical feature hereabouts was the smoke tree, Parocella spinosa, which appeared in great numbers. It is the most prominent plant of the dry desert watercourses, and in some of them grows so thickly as to form an apology for a forest, though a forest of a strange kind and serpentine form. It was at this time in full bloom, carrying a multitude of small pea-like blossoms of dark, bright blue, from which the plant is sometimes called indigo bush. I have heard it called desert cedar also, though it would be hard to imagine anything less like the sumptuous cedar than this spectral thing, blanched and leafless. The other name, smoke tree, describes it well, though it is more bush than tree, seldom over twelve feet in height. The resemblance to a column of smoke is plain enough at little distance. At this season it made a beautiful sight in its dress of gray and blue. Each plant was humming with wild bees and other insects that were making the most of the honey harvest, and the fallen blossoms had gathered in every hollow like drifts of blue snow. A few miles brought us to the edge of cultivation. A small farm appeared, isolated in the waste, but looking thrifty and attractive. Glad of a chance to exchange words with my kind, sure to be interesting now that they were so scarce, I hauled it at the gate till the good man appeared. He seemed as keen as I for a chat, inquisitive, moreover, as to my business, and would have me dismount and come to his shady veranda. Good man, indeed, I should name him, heartily pressing me to put up for the night, or, in fact, as long as I would. When I accepted the smaller offer, that's all hunky-dory then, he cried, and seizing his hay fork, led the way to the stable, Kawea close at his heels, for he knew the omen and had already had the pensive charm of the good old days. The wife proved as kind as the husband, and I shared their supper and breakfast, as well as the hopes, trials, and prospects of their desert farming venture. Their water supply was a well and pump, operated by a gasoline engine. 
Through all the center part of this valley, water is plentiful at no impossible depth. The water is pure, soft, and good. That from the deeper wells is unusually warm, often as much as a hundred degrees, making the greatest of boons to the much enduring folk who live and work under conditions for the most part decidedly onerous. An illustration of these people's hardship had comic details. The wife was going to the coast for the summer in a few days. This is the rule with desert women folk, though not an invariable one. And she must leave her husband alone to face the heat and keep the farm alive. But she had a plan, which she confided in me, for his comfort. She would send down from town a quantity of canvas or burlap, which was to be strung on wires along the windward side of the veranda. The poor, panting man was to take a seat there, lightly arrayed, and spray water on the screen with a hose. The resulting evaporation would temper the breeze to a fair degree of comfort. He might even, she pointed out, have pipe or newspaper in the other hand, a sybaritic touch that strongly appealed to me. In the following weeks, when warmth was plentiful and water scarce with me, I thought many a time with envy of my friends sitting with hose and pipe in solitary luxury, or, perchance, comfortably soaking in the barrel at the corner of the house, which he had pointed out to me with pride as forming a simple but admirable bathtub. The burlap and hose combination, by the by, plays a prominent part in desert household economy. Where ice is not to be had, the housewife resorts to the homemade refrigerator. Nothing more nor less than a skeleton box or frame provided with shelves and covered with burlap. It is placed in a shaded outdoor spot and water allowed to drip on it, so as to keep it damp on all sides. The evaporation is so rapid in this dry, hot air that the temperature within is lowered by many degrees, and even milk or butter may be kept good for a reasonable time. No doubt it was this simple invention that gave the good lady a clue. If a pound of butter could thus find relief, why not a farmer? Along the foothills that extend in a dull, mud-hued wall along the east side of the valley, groups and files of palms grow in an almost continuous line. A visit to them proved interesting. The erosive effect of the storms that fall on the mountains, usually in late summer, are seen here in sharp barrancas and ravines filled with water-worn debris. The curiously seamed face shown by these hills at a few miles' distance becomes on near approach a wilderness of rugged gullies that meet and cross at sharp angles and at gradients steep enough to make the short climb quite laborious. Huge blocks of rock, carried by storm hydraulics from the higher back ranges, lie embedded in the local clay. Vegetation is scanty except for the flourishing clusters of palms. Standing in picturesque fashion in alcoves and on benches, these suggest, even to a mind with no bent for real estate speculation, the thought, what ideal sites for houses. From the shade of these elevated groves, the fortunate owner would look out over the wide, sunny levels to where, in the south, the Salton Sea matches the turquoise sky, or more westerly to where the great peaks of Santa Rosa, San Jacinto, and San Gorgonio rise in fine succession. There is attraction, too, in the thought that under the progenitors of these palms, which mark the shoreline of the ancient sea, the earliest Californian may have moored his canoe while he landed to feast on prehistoric clam and turtle. In one alcove, a recent hurricane had overthrown a number of the palms, strewing the ground as if with ruined monuments. From the eagle feathers that littered the place, it seemed that the bird of solitude finds these silent groves with their vast outlook a congenial resort. Continuing toward Indio, I came to one of the young date plantations that in the last few years have become a prominent feature of the Coachella Valley, and that seemed to indicate that a decade or so hence, this region will be one great date garden. The chugging of a gasoline engine guided me to the place, it was so good to see the generous stream of water that was being led in furrows to the thirsty young Deglets and Quadrawis that I asked the friendly caretaker if I might camp nearby. 
The request was freely granted, and a shady thicket of mesquite pointed out as the best spot. The thicket turned out to be one great house-like tree, which I shared with a family of quail, a pair of thrashers, a rabbit or two, a rabble of rats and mice, and an Egyptian plague of flies. It was idyllic at dusk to listen to the dozy murmuring of the quail. Apparently, confessions of penitent cheapers answered with maternal forgiveness. While the evening star rose above the gloaming mountains and the breeze came cooler from the graying east. I may remark here a noticeable fact regarding the climate of the desert. Even on days when the thermometer, hung in complete shade, would register 105 degrees to 110 degrees, walking was not especially fatiguing, and this in spite of the drawback of the looseness of the soil. It is to be explained, of course, by the dryness of the air, through which the sun's rays strike with scorching, yet not oppressive effect. It is a sharp, direct heat, like that of a fire, and not in any degree like that of steam. Perspiration is profuse, but evaporation keeps pace with it, and when shade is reached, coolness at once enwraps the traveler in an air bath as soft and grateful as evening dusk. A strong wind blew all night from the northwest. Rats made my mesquite thicket undesirable as a sleeping place, but I spread my blankets in its partial shelter and passed a comfortable night, awakening occasionally to enjoy the moderate breeze, which came in playful puffs and sifted me lightly with sand. Kawea, picketed close by, stood stoically, tail to the wind, until dawn, when he responded promptly to my whistle and whinnied for his morning sugar. All next day the wind blew without cessation, filling even the higher strata of the air with sand, until in the north and west only the snowy heads of the twin mountains remained in view. They seemed like floating clouds anchored aloft to mark the pass of San Gorgonio for the sailors of the new aerial world routes. By mid-afternoon they too had faded behind the brown sand haze, and sunset came with a bar of turbid crimson sharply met by the usual aquamarine of the summer evening sky. Young and slender, the moon moved gracefully down the field of lucent green, a lily princess in a caliph's garden. The little town of Indio is an example of the many California settlements whose hopes have been blasted by the rise of an upstart neighbor. Indio is old for a California town and a desert one, and has existed as a division point since the building of the New Orleans to San Francisco Railway. But when, a few years ago, desert settlers began to arrive in earnest, and the fight commenced, which has already turned considerable tracks from gray to green, a new town, christened Coachella, was started three miles to the south and has measurably prospered, partly at the expense of the older place. I stayed for a day or two about Indio, finding barely tolerable quarters at a wretched hotel. The sleeping accommodation consisted of a cot bed with mattress and sheets on an upper veranda. My request for a blanket for emergency apparently was considered unreasonable, for the article was not supplied, and in fact proved not to be needed at this season of early June. Indio supports a weekly newspaperette, and my arrival as a stranger being duly announced I was looked up by an old Los Angeles acquaintance, now turned desert farmer, who urged that I make my next stop at his farm. Here again, a mesquite thicket made an ideal camping place. The only drawback was the presence of a horde of the insects, locally called locusts, really cicadas. These pests kept up all day a shrill, monotonous hiss, like the falsetto shriek of imps, which I soon came to loathe. There was compensation, though, in the friendship of the kindly people and the sight and sound of happy children. I do not forget, either, the melons and cucumbers, tomatoes, chilies, and eggplants that for a notable week displaced my daily round of beans, rice, and dull, insipid flapjacks. The country hereabout is the pick of the Coachella Valley farming region. Looking south and west from camp, I saw little but greenness. Only isolated spots of gray gave token of the desert. 
On all sides, ranks and clumps of fast-growing cottonwoods outlined the stations of farms, and everywhere along the roads one came on bands of chattering Mexicans or silent Indians at work in shady corners, sorting and packing into crates heaps of onions, cantaloupes, or tomatoes, or met wagons creeping to the railway with juicy freight of watermelons. Plantations of young dates met the eye on all sides, and here and there were palms already bearing clusters of ripening fruit so suggestive of the ancient Assyrian fashion of hairdressing that I think the idea must have been copied from this source. One hears wondrous tales of the profits that are being made by the owners of these first fruiting palms. The pioneer date experimenter, Mr. Fred Johnson, showed me four trees from which he had realized in the previous year between four hundred and five hundred dollars. It must be remembered that in these early days of American-grown dates, they bring the price of a novelty as much as a dollar a pound for the best fruit, which is a temporary condition, of course. Tempted by these phenomenal figures, desert farmers are raising seedling date plants by hundreds of thousands, while those who can afford it are planting offshoots, that is, young palms imported from the famous regions of Tunis, Algeria, Arabia, and Persia. The industry is well past its experimental stage, and my forecast of the future of this valley is that, twenty years from now, it will be a waving forest of palms with millionaires competing for acreage in the renowned date gardens of the United States. From this locality come also the earliest of figs, apricots, melons, and grapes. The growth of these crops in this once despised soil is truly miraculous. I saw figs of ten or twelve years, monarchial in trunk and house-like in spread of branch, while vines at one year from planting were bearing promising clusters. At the government agricultural station I found some novelties which are still in the experiment stage. For instance, jujubes, pistachios, even coconuts. Both official and private enterprise are engaged on these problems, and from all sorts of out-of-the-way places, strangers are constantly arriving who will be encouraged to become good American citizens. Not only plant strangers, either, for other questions arise, such as that of the blastophagia wasp, an insignificant-looking insect to possess the secret of why that best of figs the Smyrna refused to mature its fruit in this country, and who for many a year played hide-and-seek all over the Levant with our agricultural experts. It is the romance of agriculture that one sees here, in process of becoming the commonplace of the future. The devices to which the white population resort for comfort in the hot months are various and amusing. Beds lurk in unexpected places. Wherever shade or coolness or protection from wind is to be had, there a cot with a mattress and sheets, seldom more, may be looked for. In a garden at Indio, I noted what looked like a rather roomy rabbit hutch, but proved to be the six-foot-six sleeping room of the owner of the place. At a nearby farm, there was a more elaborate arrangement, a large, well-furnished room, electric-lighted and fitted with telephone, the roof and walls being all of wire screening, and the bed shaded from early morning sun by a broad-leafed castor bean plant. Everybody, of course, sleeps out of doors to escape the heat which during the daytime fills the timbers and furniture of the house to the saturation point to be slowly given off into the cooler air during the night. Dress is cut to narrow limits, especially by those who work outdoors and who are fortunate in having the kind of skin that the sun tans instead of flaying. I recall two young Swedes whom I met at a ranch near Indio who made quite an artistic effect in brown and blue. Curly-headed, hatless, and encumbered only with shorts of blue denim, their skins were a fine pie-crust brown that almost made my mouth water, and their bright blue eyes were matched to a shade by the hue of the brief cerulean garments. My heavy sombrero was often the subject of remark, the comment being that I must suffer from its weight. True, I did so, but in spite of that, I feel sure that its thick, close felt, which thoroughly shuts out the sun, is far better than the thin straw helmet which is in general favor, 
and through which the sun's rays pass only half disarmed. To my half-pound cowboy, I owe it that, though constitutionally a sun-hater and lover of cloud and fog, I stand the desert summer with much less discomfort than I might reasonably expect. I offer my experience for what it may be worth. The dusty street of Coachella yielded one or two characteristic items, such as a humorous placard which offered hot baths at the ice factory, the spectacle of a bed hung in the air above the community water tank at three stories elevation, and a fleeting vision of the local banker in rolled-up shirt sleeves returning from lunch bearing a wedge of watermelon with him into the financial shades. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine: California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: A Desert Ride, Coachella Valley to Pinion Well. A few miles to the south of Indio, there is a rocky outpost of the mountain wall known, of course incorrectly, as the Coral Reef. A ride over to view it at close range proved well worthwhile. At intervals I came upon farms with fields of alfalfa, acres of grapes or melons, and rows of thrifty young dates. Between farm and farm lay stretches of untouched desert more dreary than ever by contrast with the cultivated areas. In the distance pillars of dust, the genie of the whirlwind, moved in ghostly dance across the view, like dervishes ceaselessly whirling. The haze of summer had, by now, settled on the desert, and today it almost obscured the mountains. San Jacinto's top was marked by scratches of white where the last of the snow lay in shaded clefts and canyons, while San Gorgonio's slightly higher crest showed in broader streaks and splashes, both seeming to hang without support in the pale cerulean sky. The hot, fitful breeze, the dreamy mountains, and those gliding, melancholy dust wraiths threw us both into a drowse, broken unpleasantly when Kawea stepped on a ground rat's or squirrel's burrow, with a resulting jerk and snort, or when, passing a mesquite, clouds of locusts came charging at us with goblin eyes and banshee screech, squirting their vile artillery. Shells covered the ground, mostly tiny spirals smaller than rice grains, with a few three-inch clam-shaped ones that gave an iridescent coloring to the surface. Pottery fragments were plentiful, plying the fancy with visions of strange aboriginal things. An occasional litter of cans or bottles raised the reflection that future ages, judging us by our debris, will conclude that we were an ugly, uncouth lot, much inferior to the race we displaced. On a near approach, the mountains on this southern border of the valley showed a more than usually forbidding aspect. Rising abruptly from the sand level, their forms are almost grotesque, with suggestions of plesiosaurus and pterodactyl in their vast, ridgy backbones. Yet it is these brick-like shapes that, at a distance and with sunrise or sunset coloring, take on a look that can only be called heavenly. Perhaps it is one point of the analogy between nature and the mind of man that, in retrospect, life, even if it has been unlovely like these crude rock masses, may gain a quality of beauty from that which enfolds all, the universal goodness that is God. The reef itself is an isolated hill, close to the main rise of the mountain, noticeable for the strongly marked beach line which is seen in a broad band of dark brown that reaches ten or twelve feet above the level of the soil. Above this line the rock is lighter, the ordinary granite weathered to red and ochre. The so-called coral is what geologists call travertine, really calcium carbonate, which in a sort of sponge-like formation encrusts the rock that was once submerged. Little shells are embedded in the substance, or remain as they lodged in the interstices when washed there by some wave of the vanished sea. The hill is cliff-like in steepness and almost bare of vegetation. A bisnaga or two lean out, as if curious to see the rare visitor, and a few thin creosotes wave drearily in the wind. 
At the rear of the reef, the ground rises to a bench of gravelly soil in which one notes at once a different set of plants. The smoke tree, Palo Verde, several sorts of cactus, bright green creosote, and the odd sandpaper plant. There is always this well-marked difference between the vegetable life of the tracts above and below sea level, the difference being based, of course, upon the distinct characters of the soils. Above the old sea line is sand, gravel, and rock, with a varied range of desert growths. Below is a fine silt, whitened with shells and with little vegetation beyond dull clumps of atriplex and sueda. This lower belt is much the drearier region. Yet it is this self-same silt which, were not rendered sterile by alkalinity, shows such amazing fertility under cultivation. It is lower Egypt all over again, with the Colorado taking the place of the Nile. A little distance to the west, I noticed a small cove with a beach of pure white sand. It was strange to think what manner of children once played about it, and how many centuries had silently passed since their voices ceased with that of the sea. Now the hour is close at hand when children will again make its crannies ring. Will they also have their day and cease to be? And, after a lapse of other centuries, will some other fashion of mankind again come, again to vanish into silence? Above all, shall we know and watch the recurring drama? In the desert one is prone to such aimless dreams. The solitude, the vast unbroken levels, the wandering idle wind perpetually turn one's thoughts inward, yet seem to lead them out in vaguest reverie. If the reader finds too much of such matter in these pages, I can only say that the fault is inherent in the subject, as humanity has ever found. It was always to the desert, if possible, that the hermit fled when he meant to waste his time. The long ridge of mountains that bound this arm of the desert on the north and east, and the question of what might lie beyond them, had been on my mind for a long time. That locality could best be reached from the Indio region, so this was my opportunity. All I knew of it was that a road, of a sort, ran that way into the old mining districts of Twenty-Nine Palms and Virginia Dale, and that water was scarce and forage scarcer. By luck, I heard of a freighter who made periodical trips over part of the distance, hauling supplies from Coachella to a mine in these mountains. I hunted him up and arranged to accompany him as far as our road was the same, buying fodder for Coahuila from the supply he carried with him for his own horses. At four o'clock of the morning of the last day of June, I left my mesquite bivouac. A camp of Mexican onion pickers was already astir as I passed. Fire was twinkling under coffee pot, and men, women, boys, girls, and dogs, to the total of a score, were loafing and yawning with that air of entire leisure which is a mark of their race, and which I, for one, find rather enviable. I like to come on these camps, especially at evening. There is in them a touch of the patriarchal, padre and blue jumper beneath some rustling cottonwood, rolling and smoking eternal cigarettes. Juanitos and Conchitas in troops clambering over him like caterpillars or tumbling in congenial dust. Madre, an attractive figure in reboso, or with splendid unbound tresses, preparing frijoles or chili con carne, or more likely Yankee canned beef and Alberto picking out the latest ditty on his mandolin, wherewith to capture the heart of Encarnacion at the neighboring camp after supper. Rarely does one hear any word of contention, for family affection runs strong in the blood of our lightly esteemed neighbors from over the line. At the crossroad, I halted to wait for my teamster and enjoy a sunrise. The morning was half cloudy, and the sun threw shifting lights on the mountains to south and west, bringing into view canyons and abysses that I had never known were there. These bare walls have a trick of concealing important features in a way that is impossible with wooded or brush-covered mountains. Some momentary relation of sun and cloud may any day give you a topographical surprise, even after years of acquaintance, 
as if some breakfast time you should learn from your paper that the agreeable elderly gentleman next door was an experienced cracksman long wanted by inspector bucket my friend's caravan signalled by distant clouds of dust at length came creeping along a huge wagon with seven-inch tires loaded with a ton or two of mixed merchandise ranging from soda pop to bob milligan's new suit and a case or two of dynamite in the jockey box was the week's mail for a score or so of men at the mine and what was of most concern to kawea on the tailboard were piled sacks of barley and bales of hay crossing the railway we turned northward toward an opening in the so-called mud hills which make a feature equally fascinating and repellent in this part of the desert geography in dreariness they surpass even the great sand dunes which now lay far to the westward their ashy gray is the most hopeless of hues and their few scraps of brush are almost ghastly the fascination lies in the strangeness of the shapes into which the material has been wrought the cutting and carving scoring and scraping twisting and twirling gouging and grinding that has gone on here for ages has given an almost unreal look to the region a romancer of the type of jules verne wishing to depict conditions on the moon or on this planet when its turn comes can here find material to his purpose local color bleached to the appropriate monochrome there was not much opportunity for conversation to ride alongside the wagon was to be enfolded in the dust from sixteen scuffling hoofs for at our slow gait it was much as if we stood still while the horses milled up dust for our benefit moreover these teamsters of the desert roads are of a silent breed and emmons was true to the type yet i knew he was glad of my company and i have often proved that a heart kindly to man and beast may beat beneath a taciturn waistcoat occasionally he would call to a shirking horse always a single word and with an odd way of dropping the leading consonant thus eat ill azy and ooze stood for pete bill daisy and Sue's, and the slack trace jane never failed to straighten when these monosyllabic shots went off the creeping pace and the unknown spacious desolation into which we were imperceptibly moving gave me the feeling of starting on some lifelong enterprise a faint breeze came now and then from the west but it was dry and parching and brought no refreshment the sky was overcast with a haze which diffused the sunlight to a blinding whiteness that was more trying than the direct rays, and that seemed to intensify the heat by giving it power to attack equally on all sides at once. There was something of the same deadly quality in the air that I felt at two bunch palms, though not to the same degree. We resorted often to our canteens, while the horses were treated to frequent rests though short ones. On this kind of day, one realizes easily enough how imperative is the need for water to the desert traveler. One feels that, without drinking constantly, one would shrivel, and perceives with horror the fearful nature of such an end as death from thirst. The track, it could on no terms be called a road, after passing through an opening in the mud hills at a point where curious caverns pinnacles and arches occur turned westerly into a long valley that divides these foothills from the main mountain wall silt was exchanged for sand and gravel and the vegetation changed automatically with it creosote burrowweed and lipia made scanty show with tufts of the interesting white holly which at this season takes on pale tints of seashell pink and lavender almost iridescent the going became slower than ever i relieved kawea by walking but there was no amelioration for the straining team that now could hardly keep way on their huge load though they were splendid animals and in the pink of condition looking at my watch i was astonished to find it was only seven o'clock I should have said we had been five hours on the road. Little as there was of vegetation, there was still less of animal life. Birds there were almost none, for the distance to water ruled them out, 
Jackrabbit tracks came now and then, for Jack is almost a total abstainer. Lizards there were, for they are everywhere, and I noticed plentiful tracks of the dreaded sidewinder, Croatilus cerastes. This is a small, asp-like species of the ordinary rattlesnake, found most often in the sandy or silty desert, whereas the larger rattler likes rocky country in the neighborhood of water. Two little protuberances over the eyes, like sprouting horns, give the sidewinder an extra devilish air, and his small size makes him the more dangerous because less easily seen and heard. His track, however, is unmistakable, owing to his peculiar mode of travel, which seems to be by looping himself along in spiral reaches, so that his trail is not a continuous line, but a series of short diagonal strokes about nine inches apart. For some reason, he enjoys wheel ruts and always takes advantage of them. But as he moves mainly by night, he is not often seen by the traveler on the road. It is a strange fact, of which I have been assured by more than one person who has put it to the proof, that a sidewinder kept exposed to direct summer sun will not live longer than a few minutes. Footnote. I have recently had an opportunity to test this on a sidewinder that I brought into camp for photographic purposes. It was a full-grown specimen and was not in the least injured in process of capturing. I turned it into an enclosure of boxes in the open sunshine. It was as vicious and full of life as ever at first, but after three or four minutes became languid, then ceased to move. Soon the head drew back and the mouth opened, as in the attitude of striking. In ten minutes it was dead. The month was September, and the temperature at the time 106 degrees in the shade. With a midsummer temperature 10 or 15 degrees higher, no doubt the time would have been much shorter, perhaps two or three minutes only, as reported to me by another experimenter. It is certainly remarkable that a desert creature should be so constituted. End of footnote. The explanation must be that the thin skin gives no protection to the cold reptilian blood. Certain it is that the sidewinder is rarely seen in the open by day, but is almost always found coiled in the shade, usually about the roots of brush. It would be a praiseworthy act of Saul, one for which I could forgive him much, if he would one day turn on for a short time such a torrid blast as would cook the whole sidewinder tribe where they lie snoothing in fancied security. Hour after hour went by in a sort of trance of heat, while we still toiled up that furnace-like valley. The wagon ground its ponderous way through the sand or slid screeching over boulders. At half-past nine we reached the point where my teamster was to water his horses. Here he kept several large iron drums of water, which he refilled when necessary at the mine. He unscrewed the plugs with a spanner, and then bucket after bucket was given the eager animals, Kawea participating. Next we fed them, and then, while we ate our own lunch, Emmons casually mentioned that this was Dead Man's Point. Why so called? Oh, a Mexican was found dead over there, year before last. At least part of him was found. Not much, on account of coyotes. He'd come out afoot from the mines, the lost horse, I think it was, got thirsty and wandered around some, and then give out. Name was Lopez. No, though that was another feller. Well, anyway, some fellers found him up that gully a little ways, saw his tracks going round and round crazy-like, and trailed him. Reckon there ought to be some bits of his clothes up there yet, if you've a mind to look. Yes, it's dry-like around here. As we screwed up the drums, I had a vision of a raving wretch, myself, tearing at the immovable plug with bleeding fingers, striking at it with swollen, lacerated feet, hearing the water gurgle within, in vain, in vain. Heavens, I felt faint at the thought, and was glad to mount and leave Dead Man's Point to the coyotes and the murderous sun. Here we turned up a narrower canyon, leading directly into the mountains. The grade became steeper, and the vegetation more varied. 
canyon after canyon debouched into ours dozens of them all dry baking shivering with heat there is no need to describe the country in detail it was all alike we ground our way on and up the sun now clearer reflected upon us from the rocky walls my canteen replenished after lunch soon grew too hot to be put to the lips with comfort while the water itself was at a temperature of over a hundred degrees i am sure and every drink threw me into immediate perspiration at three o'clock we came to the next watering place and halted for the day we had made just twenty miles in ten hours of travel a well is maintained here after a fashion by the county authorities there was the usual camp litter also a rough bed and a stove emmons's property for this was one of his regular stopping places a little way back he had inquired whether i liked bees or minded being stung also asking kawea's sentiments on the same point on approaching the well i caught the bearing of his question the place was literally alive with bees the air was like a swarm in flight and the well itself resounded with the buzzing of thousands down there in the dark however water must be got for the horses though we had enough for ourselves in the canteens which was fortunate for bucket after bucket came up covered with dead bees and the liquid had a faded smell from the myriads of decaying insects so we hauled and skimmed and ladled till the animals had got their fill the canyon thereabouts must be well sprinkled with bee caves and someone who enjoys that sort of thing might find exciting bee hunting with honey by the barrel then emmons stripped to the waist and went to work with curry comb and brush at his horses while they fed no doubt they earned the care he lavished on them but it is not every faithful animal's master that will take his turn and sweat for them as they have sweated for him when supper time came he would not hear of my drawing on my saddlebag stores say i'll have to call you down he said genially if you'd carried your blankets forty years like i have you'd know better than that how many eggs do you eat that's what i want to know will four do you that's my figure and when next day it came to settling our accounts he was scornful at the idea of my paying for what i had eaten of his supplies it's all right about the hay and grain they cost money he argued but eggs and such truck oh shucks and shucks it had to be at risk of giving offence profane my friendly freighter was alas at strenuous moments but it was not profanity of the usual gross type and seemed almost automatic experience makes me wonder indeed if there has ever been a really successful western teamster who was free from this vice waking about midnight i noticed emmons get up light a lantern and again water his animals taking them one by one the hundred yards down to the well and back after which he threw them down more hay seeing this i could do no less for kawea though i claim no credit for it i found it easy to excuse emmons for an occasional outbreak of cuss words next day when i remembered how he not only regarded the life of his beast as a righteous man will do but looked to its comfort as well and at no small sacrifice of his own being up and the night warm and still it seemed a good time for a smoke so we took a pipe apiece and then a pull at the canteen and so to sleep again till four o'clock and dawn by half past five we were again moving up the canyon it became constantly narrower steeper and rougher the wagon bumping and lurching along in a dogged kind of way serenely confident in the soundness of hickory and wrought iron our surroundings became more interesting now that we were well into the mountains there was no outlook for we were shut in on both sides by walls that rose steeply for hundreds of feet and the canyon was ever twisting but bushes of fair size began to appear and bird life too came in it is the open wastes where nothing is and nothing is to be expected that wear one's spirits down one hears a good deal on the desert about arsenic water prospectors especially are full of tales of arsenic springs where death snatches the traveler unaware 
I believe competent authorities deny that arsenic in dangerous quantity exists in any of the desert water, and account for the fact that men have died from drinking the water of certain springs by the theory that the men in question, arriving at the suspected springs suffering from thirst, and perhaps weak from hunger as well, drank too freely and succumbed to the excess, which, likely enough, was rendered more dangerous by the unwholesome substances often found in the water of these desert springs. It is a common experience to find one's expected water supply contaminated with dead coyotes, foxes, birds, or snakes, and water holes that are seldom visited and therefore seldom cleaned out may become poisonous even from decaying vegetable matter. I have not the means of giving a personal opinion, but one knows the hold that poison legends like those of lost mines and buried treasure take on popular imagination. And prospectors, as a class, are notoriously open to any touch of mystery or superstition. I found my companion infected on this subject. On leaving our last camp, I had filled my canteens, using water that had been boiled to prevent ill effects from dead bees. Emmons had no particular objection to decaying bees, but warned me gravely that there was arsenic in the water. He had found it poisonous himself, he had said, but when I asked how he knew that it was arsenic that had upset him, he replied that everyone knew there were arsenic springs on the desert, and he figured that this must be one of them. However, I reckoned that if a horse could take several gallons at a draught without any bad effect, I ought to be good for a mouthful now and then. So I drank, at first carefully, then freely, and noticed only that the supposed arsenic left lips and throat gummy, so there was an inclination to drink almost constantly. The canyon became a gorge, with yet higher walls, the strata split and upreared at all manner of painful angles. Wild-looking shrubs leaned out overhead and stared down at us with a startled air. Strangest of these were the so-called Joshua trees, yucca brevifolia, that now began to appear. Nothing in the vegetable world is more unprepossessing than this scarecrow, all knees and elbows with handfuls and mouthfuls of daggers for leaves. The name is said to have been given to plant by early Mormon emigrants to California in reference to its heralding their approach to the promised land. There seems to be no great compliment involved in having this spiteful-looking object for a namesake. Next to appear was the ever-interesting juniper. I like our California hero, Fray Junipero Serra, all the better for his choice of a monastic name, though it came second-hand from that one of the St. Francis's band whom the saint cried admiringly, Oh, that I had a forest of such junipers. There is some very wholesome quality about this plant, even in its stunted desert form. In Pliny may be more reliable than in some other items of natural history when he declares that serpents shun this tree, and men may therefore safely sleep in its shade. For fuel qualities, anyhow, it has no equal, and I always hail the chance of a juniper campfire. The pinion also soon came in, another of my favorites, gnarly but cheerful, a sort of puck of the pines. Then appeared small oaks and willows, links with scenes and lands far different from this. All these old friends looked wonderfully kindly, and when I halted and listened to the breeze humming in the pinions, it cost me a pang to think that I was in for months, possibly years, of life in a treeless land, and I wondered how I, whose ancestor must have been a dryad, should ever tolerate it. At a point where a side canyon ran off to the west, I noticed a weather-beaten signboard showing that the Dewey Mine lay up there. This mine, it seems, was a notorious case of salting, that is, baiting a worthless prospect with pieces of rich ore. A fraud that nearly came off, but not quite. Even costly machinery was installed in the effort to carry the bluff through. Emmons could not recall the fate of the promoters of the swindle, but we agreed in hoping that the darn skunks were at that moment unpleasantly engaged with a pile of oakum. We were now close to the summit of the ridge, but the steepest rise remained to be climbed. 
Emmons rested his team while he looked carefully over the running gear of the wagon. Then he attached brake logs to the rear wheels. When all was ready, he climbed to his perch, gathered the lines, cast a shrewd eye over the road that rose at a sharp angle ahead, and remarked in a casual tone, Now, gals, at the same moment throwing off the brake. The well-drilled team responded. The trace chains grated, the wheels screeched against the boulders, and the huge wagon crawled up the grade for twenty yards. The brake came on with a thump, the horses stopped in their tracks, and the wagon settled back against the blocks. Two minutes rest, then another twenty yards, and so on for eight or ten spells. We reached the top and crossed the pass at 4,600 feet. A fine outlook opened from the crest. Far to the west lay my brace of giants, San Jacinto and San Gorgonio, a sort of Gog and Magog. Behind and to the east was a jumble of brown ranges with pale slips of desert showing here and there between them. To the north I looked out over the Mojave Desert, the twin sister of the Colorado. From this point a wilderness of mountains, arid, aerial, almost phantasmal. Beautiful, too, they were in their elemental solitude, their delicacy of tone, and most so in their air of mystery, their magnetic drawing on the imagination. Come, they seemed to say, we are waiting for you. We have waited since eternity began. You long to know us. You cannot guess what wealth we hide. Come and take it if you dare. We dare you. Yes, and if you yield and go, you may indeed learn their secret, perhaps a secret of gold such as never yet dazzled man's eye and betrayed his soul. But remember, you may never return to this other world, the world of men, trees, brooks, all the companionable sights and sounds of homes and towns of common people. A mile down the grade brought us to Pinion Well. Here is an abandoned, worked-out mine with old buildings and a scattering of other effects, tools, pipelines, and so forth. The old well with rusty pump is still in order, and now again we tasted good water. And how good good water is, perhaps, is only known to men who travel the desert. We made a hasty meal, for Emmon still had a few miles to cover. My road left his not far from this point, so I decided to stay here for a day, enjoying the mountain air, pure, cool water, and picturesque surroundings. Resting Kawea also, who was accommodated with a few feeds of hay from Emmons's store. Lunch over, we bade one another goodbye and good luck, and I watched the wagon crawl away down the canyon toward the lonely camp somewhere in that gray wilderness, where a score of men, with never a woman, were dragging the deadly gold out of the grasp of the Sphinx. End of chapter 9。Chapter 10 California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 10 A Desert Ride、Pinion Well to Mecca。I would willingly have stayed for days at Pinion Well。but for that annoying trait of the human mind that renders ease uneasy so long as there is an unpleasant task ahead. And there are enough unpleasant possibilities inherent in an unknown stretch of desert to debar the traveler from freedom of mind. The rats that haunted the old house played havoc too with my scanty food supplies. They infested everything, even the coffee pot, of dimensions that might be named Homeric that hung on the wall, and in which I had thought my bacon would be secure. Accordingly, after a day's rest, we left at half-past five in the morning and took the road down the canyon for a mile to where a wide valley began. My route soon left the main track, striking directly north into a strange-looking country, a sloping plain broken by abrupt hills that looked as if they had burst up from below in some recent explosion. My friendly trees ceased at once at the foot of the canyon, leaving only the Joshua's, which always seemed to have been arrested in the midst of some uncouth antics, brandishing daggers like a juggler. 
Deer tracks were plentiful, and within half a mile I met three varieties of quail, mountain, valley, and desert or gambrel, a thing I have never noted elsewhere. Far to the east rose a ragged range, even odder in skyline than the rest. Another road went off now to the left, leading to the lost horse mine, and my own route became a doubtful sort of track, with little sign of travel. In a pile of rock that I skirted, I had been told I should find one of those natural tanks of water, tenaja is the common Spanish word, on which the desert traveler often has to place precarious trust precarious because they are mere rain catchments. This one is known as squaw tanks. I easily found the place, being led to it by my nose. A small quantity of slimy liquid remained, nauseous with putrefying bodies of birds, rats, and lizards. A man perishing of thirst might have brought himself to drink it, but would probably not have survived the drought. It was no disappointment to me, for my canteens were newly filled, but the incident had a moral for me, nevertheless. At the crest of a long rise, I looked out over another great plain studded with brick-red rock piles and carrying a thin growth of Joshua trees that spread to the horizon, a ghastly pretense of forest. In the shimmer of heat, they seemed to claw the air. Here, yet another track went off, turning easterly to a mine, or erstwhile mine, called the Desert Queen, and leaving me to sort of a phantom trail which still ran northerly mile on mile through the spectral forest. Presently, this trail also forked, sending off a branch to the east, and I came to a standstill in doubt. I had made careful inquiries at Indio and Coachella and of Emmons as to forks, crossroads, and landmarks, and had been duly warned as to the roads I had already passed. But this new turn-off had not been spoken of by anyone. However, I knew that my direction for twenty-nine palms was northerly, and the trail in that direction seemed a trifle the better marked, so I resolved on that and started. In a cactus bush I chanced to notice a scrap of board, loosely stuck as if it had been tossed there, Going over to investigate, there seemed to be faint scratches on it, apparently made with a nail. I turned it this way and that, but for some time could not make even a guess as to what was written. At last, by patching possibilities together, the scratches took on vague coherence, a questionable two, a hazardous nine, and a conceivable P. The fragment is found pointed toward the easterly trail, but from the casual way it hung there, it might have been twisted hither and thither by the wind, so it seemed a matter of chance which direction it was meant to indicate. It was one of those puzzles that may bring one into serious trouble in this country, where distances are so great, water and food so far between, and travel so scanty that it was probably a month, possibly three times as long, since the last person had passed or until the next one would appear. I resolved to trust the dubious sign and take the eastward track. There was difficulty in following it, for it was often so faint as to be mere guesswork. It is this sort of thing that takes the pleasure out of desert travel. The county of Riverside, in which I now was, has lately done useful work in placing of metal guideposts at the main desert road crossings, but a good deal more needs to be done while other counties quite ignore this need of their desert populations. Unfortunately, the maps of the geological survey do not cover the greater part of this troublesome region, and such as are to be had, cheap county or miners' maps, are little better than none at all. Persistently eastward ran my elusive trail. It was nearing a mountain range, the Pintos, and must soon turn either north or south, so I kept on, though in considerable doubt. At last, when close to the hills, it ran into a better travel track, and with relief I found a signpost with twenty-nine palms on its northern arm and Cottonwood Springs thirty miles to the southeast. At this junction, as marked on my map, there are supposed to be near together two more water holes, stirrup tanks and white tanks, I searched for signs of them, the usual signs being the trails made by animals going to drink, but failed to discover either. 
I learned afterwards that one of them is a half a mile away in the Cottonwood Springs direction. Of the other, nobody that I have met has any knowledge at all. Fortunately, I had an ample supply of water, but Kawea had to be satisfied with a promise payable 15 miles farther on. He is an intelligent fellow and quickly grasps the bearing of any indecision that may arise on the matter of trails. On such occasions, he watches every movement of mine with almost human anxiety and plainly reflects my own doubtful frame of mind. He had been as pessimistic as I ever since we left the Forks, but brightened up when we found the road and made the best of a dry tussock of galleta while I ate my lunch. And when we were ready, he moved off with alacrity and surprised me by offering to canter. We were now on a gradual descent, the southern rim of the Mojave Desert. From time to time there opened vistas of volcanic-looking ranges with glimpses of shimmering gray level or splashes of pure white where dry lake beds glistened with alkali. For hundreds of miles this strange dead land extends to the north and east, known only to venturous prospectors, a scientific man or two, a few surveyors, a handful of miners. To the rest of the world as foreign and unimaginable as if it were some territory of Mars. Yet what wealth lies locked in this great desolation, for it is, as indeed it looks, a veritable treasure house of mineral. Looking out over it, one easily imagines goblin or swart fairy of the mine at work on the veins of wondrous ore under those gaunt hills, ashy gray, livid purple, or dull red, as if they had been roasted. At last, five miles down the slope of a narrow valley, I saw a speck that might be a building, perhaps a ranch house, though no trace of greenness was in view as far as the eye could see. I pushed on toward it, indulging thoughts of eggs, stove, bread, milk, perchance a lettuce. But these hopes faded when the supposed farmhouse turned into the grouped shanties of a small mine. However, I was welcomed heartily by three men on the place, and Kawea was entertained with barley and water, the latter no trifling gift, for their supply must be replenished at twenty-nine palms, four miles away. I was eagerly questioned for news, for my items were only five days old, while their last news had passed into history two weeks before. The six men who were concerned in developing the mine had formed themselves into two shifts of three aside, taking alternate spells at the works and inside, the term used by desert men to signify the cities and the coast country. The other shift was some days overdue, ensnared by the charms of Los Angeles, and these poor fellows were continually scanning the horizon like maroon sailors for signs of the relieving party. Evening was coming on, so I soon took the road. Tracks led off to other small mines, reminders of the lively days of the 70s when this 29 Palms district was a camp of renown. Before long, the Palms came in sight, and we ended a long day's march soon after sunset. I off-saddled under a cottonwood that stood near a deserted house and found pasturage for Coia in a little Sienega, or marshy spot, formerly the site of a village of Shemehuevi Indians from the Colorado River. I do not know who now owns the land, and what is of more account, the water. But when I come on these abandoned settlements of the Indians, at places where they would no doubt have wished to remain, I take them for links in an old but still lengthening chain of wrong. The population of 29 Palms at the time of my visit numbered two so that my arrival on the eve of the 4th of July seemed to cast an air of festivity over the scene. The two, one a prospector and old haunter of the locality, the other a consumptive from inside, who was sacrificing every comfort of life for the sake of the dry air of this lonely spot. They received me cordially enough, but remained convinced, I think, in spite of my plain story, that I was looking up mineral, ain't you now? They felt it an insult to their intelligence to be asked to believe that anyone would come to 29 Palms in July for the sake of seeing the country and them old palms. Country, said the sick man, waving towards a sunset landscape that would have thrown Turner into a frenzy. Country? 
They ain't no country round here, mount to nothing. You ever see any Mac? And Mac sententiously replied, Durned if I ain't forgot what real country looks like anyways. Nevertheless, the country was satisfactory to me. To lie at dawn and watch the glowing glory in the east, the pure dark light stealing up from below the horizon, the brightening to holy silver, the first flush of amber, then of rose, then a hot stain of crimson, and then the flash and glitter the intolerable splendor of the monarch, Phoebus superbus, tyrant of the desert, and of me. I jump up hastily and hurry through my morning cookery, but not before he has taken toll of my day's store of energy. Our fourth was celebrated with make-believe shower baths. At intervals we resorted to the Cienega and ladled water over ourselves from a tepid pool, and I may say that with a temperature of 112 degrees I found it more exhilarating than some displays of gunpowder and rhetoric that I remember. Between times we talked of loads and pockets, or my friends would grind up some bit of float and pan it out at the spring, with brief excitement over grades and colors. Toward evening I walked a mile up the slope to the west and enjoyed a memorable sunset. By some peculiarity of the light, the landscape had much the quality of a wash drawing in black and white, seen through a thin purplish haze. The line of palms made a charming foreground, each one a study of airy grace. Beyond rose the Bullion Mountains, dark gray with splashes of white where sand had lodged far up, as if it were snow. Farther to the east, another range, the sheep holes of the dead hue of volcanic ash, and over all the luminous arch, infinitely remote, with flecks of snowy cloud like sheep straying in the blue pastures of the sky. Spaciousness and solitude were the elements of the scene, and reacted with trance-like spell upon the mind. As the sun went down, a blood-red light suddenly came over all the view. I never saw anything more startling and instantaneous in its coming, or more theatric in its intensity of hue. For the few seconds that it lasted, I held my breath. The mountains burned as if they were incandescent. Bullion? No, the lava of rubies. Then, in a moment, it had paled and like an expiration was gone. As I walked back to camp, I noticed a small enclosure, almost hidden among arrowweed. It marked the grave of a young girl, most likely one who had been brought here in hope of a cure for consumption. There is something inhuman in choosing such a place of burial for a girl. Nature sets a difference, even in death, and it seems a brutal thing to leave a girl's young body here. Some tokens of old inhabitation at Twenty-Nine Palms may be seen in remains of shacks and dugouts. One of these had been the den, it is the only word, of one Wilson, the former habitué of the place, who held on here in more than pagan squalor until he was lately forcibly removed by the county authorities. The hut of old Jim Pine, the last of the Twenty-Nine Palm Indians, stands open to the sky in gaze and shows a litter of rock specimens, for Jim was something of a miner in his day. But mining camps are, in their nature, evanescent. Why build a house when tomorrow the rush will move on to a newer strike? But Twenty-Nine Palms is still a base for prospectors in the desert ranges on account of its water, which is plentiful and good, and by reason of being on one of the roads to the still-important mining settlement of Dale. Thanks to the remains of Jim Pine's alfalfa patch, Kawea was in good form when we struck eastward next morning toward Dale, or, as it was called in the days when it was famous, Virginia Dale. It was a long, tedious march, the country becoming more barren at every mile, and the ground a tiresome alternation of sand with wide expanses of a sort of pavement, made of small bits of stone, reddish or black, polished to a slippery degree and set as if in a mosaic. It was the first time I met with this peculiar condition, though I often encountered it afterwards. I am still puzzled to account for it. One would almost think the fragments had been fitted together by hand and rolled down by a road engine. Little can grow in such a region. 
Even the creosote grew sparse and stunted here. It is a marvel, indeed, that it can exist at all. A few starved in Celia showed white against the dark ground, and in the sandy washes spectral smoke trees quivered in the flickering air. Birds were entirely absent, except for the roadrunner, who is a sort of Esau, and whose peculiar imprint, like a St. Andrew's cross, one meets in the most impossible places. Ahead ran the ashy sheephole range to south the Pintos, a word signifying spotted, though I saw no reason for the name in the barrier of uniform reddish rock that kept me company hour after hour. Once I caught a glimpse of a high distant ridge that I knew must be the coxcombs. They fitted the name so exactly. One or two tracks led off to nominal mines, active only to the extent of the assessment work which must be performed yearly in order to keep ownership alive. This right, as it may be called, makes the excuse for the owners to set out annually from city or ranch with burrow, grub, pick, shovel, and rifle for two weeks' work on their claims. Naturally, summer is not the season chosen, water then being scantiest and heat most trying, so I saw little of these pilgrims of hope. But in winter and spring there will be many such parties, ones, twos, and threes, creeping about this vast territory wherever man, horse, or burrow may go. Automobile must now be added, for the automobilist's maxim is that man with an auto can go where man has gone before. After six hours' travel, a dot in the distance that I had been speculating upon for an hour past began to take the shape that I hoped it would, an odd shape to find in this wilderness, to wit, that of a windmill of the modern iron type. It marked Lion's Well, which is a watering station for stock, though the traveler may see no sign of cattle for days together. On nearer approach there appeared a few scraps of adobe wall, all that remains of the first settlement of Virginia Dale. Of all materials for building used by civilized man, adobe is the one soonest effaced. Once the roof is gone, the rest goes quickly back to the ground from whence it sprung. Fifty years after its palmy days, I could barely find shelter from the wind in what was left of Virginia Dale. The historian of a mining camp must be early on the scene, if he is to find anything more than the ground on which it stood. The pump was out of commission, but I managed with rope and bucket to supply Kawea's needs. A strong wind had begun to blow, adding discomfort to tedium, as we turned southward up a rocky slope toward a low divide. My next landmark, the buildings of an abandoned mine, were a welcome sight, for I confess that though I had the some experience of western travel, I was often anxious on these desert wanderings where questions of forage and water might render a mistake a serious matter. On reaching the divide, a row of little buildings came in sight, two miles away against the foot of a mountain. This, I thought, was Dale, and headed Kawea toward it. As we came near, I was wondering at the deserted look of the place when, turning a point, I saw the real Dale perched on the skyline far above me. The other place was a sort of parasite whose only reason for being was to help the miners of Dale get rid of their money, a matter which in a mining camp should be accomplished as speedily as possible and with as much detriment to one's self as circumstances allow. No means of attaining these ends has yet been found that can compare with investing in chemical whiskey or dago red at fancy prices, getting gloriously drunk thereon, and then playing monte or poker with a sharper. But now prohibition days have fallen on Riverside County, and only one or perhaps two blind pigs grow fat on what they suck from the pockets of the miners of Dale. One soon comes in the West to modify one's qualms over acceptance of hospitality from strangers. Emmons had urged me at Pinion Well to accompany him to the mine he was bound for, and told me gravely that the boys wouldn't like it if they found that I, whom of course they had never heard of, had passed so near without paying them a visit. It would cost me nothing, he assured me. The boys would regard me as a boon and take care of me as long as I would stay. So too I found it at Dale. At the first house on the stairway-like street, I asked where I might find lodging, 
supposing that there must be something in the nature of an inn. Well, the superintendent is away, I was told. You'd better go up and see the cashier. He'll fix you up. That friendly chap at once took charge of me as of an expected guest. He insisted on my taking his room for my own and quartered Kawea in the company's stable. Other conveniences were offered by the resident doctor, and, in effect, I was made free of the camp. This Dale, I learned, was Dale the Third. As old leads or veins of ore peter out and new ones are discovered, the mining camp follows the lead in a literal sense. The present camp is about a dozen years old and is supported by one good-sized gold mine, namely the Supply, though there are a few smaller mines in the locality. Fifty or sixty men, half a dozen women, a half-score of children, and one badly spoiled baby made up the population at the time of my stay. The mine is a highly organized affair, with electric-lighted buildings and a water supply pumped from wells six miles away. Day and night, the whirr and crash of engines goes on unceasing. It was strange to wake at night and hear the roar of machinery in that remote place, all the more so after weeks of nature's quietude. The village consists of, besides the mine structures, a score or so of temporary-looking houses and cabins, spotted about without any pretense of order, a store with kitchen and dining room attached, and a cashier's office of stone are all the buildings of any size. The post office shares quarters with a club room containing an antique pool table, the felt worn to a curiosity and the pockets as hopeless as a bachelor's. Relics of the fourth remained in the shape of a wire cable stretched across the street with fag ends of rockets and Roman candles still attached. I do not know how the place got its name, whether through some Virginian who thus showed his loyalty to the old dominion, or perhaps by way of a compliment to some charmer of a sentimental argonaut. However that may be, the present site, encircled by steep, rough mountains, is really a kind of dale, though it brought a pang to think of Martindale, Graysdale, Ravenstone Dale, and other old Lakeland nooks, flowery and green, where this was harshly red and gray. Yet when I climbed above the village at sunset, and the light came warmer on crag and gully, the shadows more tender in the hollow of the pass, yes, that might be Glaramara, and that Coniston Old Man. In that winding gorge, all's water might lie, or, scarcely less solitary than this, lonely, lovely wast water. The view to the north was memorable as an example of the ultra-desolate. Beyond the ragged brown foreground lay the pale gray expanse of a dry lake, whitened near its center by the alkaline deposit from its vanished waters. Beyond that rose the ashy wall of the Sheephole Mountains, quite lunar in their look of geologic age and dreariness. A thread-like line that skirted the lake bed and faded in a gap in the hills marked the road to Amboy, forty miles away, and Dale's shortest link with the rest of the world. Capping their hospitalities to me, my good friends would not allow me even to settle for Coea's provender, saying that the company expected to take care of little things like that. It is unlikely that these pages will meet the eye of the Croesus who counts this bagatelle of a gold mine among his numberless properties. His name is one at which Wall Street holds its breath. But anyway, I hereby make acknowledgment of my obligation. We left Dale amid good wishes of a score of the men who were gathered before the eating house, ready for the stampede at the sound of the breakfast bell. One or two of them I met again at later stages of my journey, and was amused to learn what droll rumors had been in circulation regarding my object in coming to Dale. Your miner must have his little mystery, and, if needful, will hatch one for himself. I was even credited with being the agent of mighty financial interests, perhaps, solemnizing thought, Croesus himself in disguise. The blind pig of the suburbs was already astir as I passed, and was as portly a pig as could be expected. The few sentences that passed while I watered Kawea showed that he was a suspicious pig too, which was not surprising in these times when even deputy sheriffs sometimes are unfriendly to pork. 
my road led eastward through a narrow canyon where every hillside had a metallic look at the most casual glance everywhere were prospect holes or deeper workings where the mountain had spewed out piles of glittering gray rock here and there were scraps of machinery old windlasses and boilers dragged here at enormous expense now mere rusty monuments to the ruling passion though to be fair one must say to man's energy hardihood and determination as well the stony track made rough going for coia fortunately i had had him shod a new experience for him though he was rising nine when i bought him at indio in anticipation of the rocky country we should meet in the mountains i was glad when the canyon opened southward upon a wide plain a dozen miles or more across through which the road ran straight to a vanishing point the sun was unusually severe the scanty vegetation gave no relief to the eye and all there was of a variety from mile on mile was the alternation of glaring sand with darker pavement-like stretches that reflected the sun gleam with added intensity the air was in a tremor of heat and under my sombrero my eyes ached so that i often closed them and left coia to pilot us alone sometimes i dismounted and walked in order to relieve him but this was a signal for him to slacken his pace to almost a standstill so having no mind to drag a half a ton of horseflesh i soon mounted again whereat he sighed eyed me with soft reproach and stood waiting till a touch of the spur urged him to a spiritless shuffle still far to the east rose the coxcombs ghost-like in the flicker and haze on my right was the pinto range now showing a patching of light and dark masses that gave point to the name ahead were the eagle and cottonwood mountains into which the road vanished as if it must there end hours passed in stupefying heat while i alternately dozed in the saddle or dragged the apathetic coia along at a snail-like pace the creosotes moved listlessly when for a moment the wind came with furnace-like breath there was little comfort in the canteen for the water was unpleasantly hot and the vacant shell of a tortoise or bleaching ribs of a cattle were objects not interesting to a jaded mind the spry white lizard seemed the only things that kept any touch of energy i might almost say of life by early afternoon we reached the entrance to a rocky pass that led into the mountains and stopped for rest and lunch i had saved a feed of barley for coia which he munched with indifference and then dozed with drooping head too fagged to crop the scraps of galleta that i pointed out to him loath as i was to move on i could not afford more than the regulation hour for there were many miles ahead of us before we should reach the next water the wash that issued from this canyon was filled with a dense growth of the smoke tree looking like a column of men in light gray uniform winding away in close-shut ranks across the plain the flowering season was nearly past but the ground was colored deep blue by the fallen petals plant life became more varied as we gained the higher ground as is always the case in these desert canyons bare as they look from the plain i saw yuccas of three species the lyceum with its ruby-like berries the simonsia which bears a nut of good flavor the curious salazaria covered with quaint little bladders even the wild buckwheat common on the coast to say nothing of the eternal cat claw and the common desert growths there appeared also a plant or two of the rare nolina perii their tall flowering stalks bearing masses of yellow seed vessels that reminded me of hydrangea bloom soon after crossing the divide i noticed a rude cross close beside the road later i learned that it marked the grave of a man named riley who died here of thirst a few years ago he had left the dale mines intending to walk to the railway at mecca the footprint showed that he reached a point almost within sight of cottonwood springs it may have been dark or dusk so that he failed to see the spot of green a mile further on that marks the water he turned back towards dale but soon turned again, staggered as far as this, and here died. A brother of his is said to have lost his life in the same way soon afterward on the road from Dale to Amboy. 
similar tragedies occur every year in these deserts and it would seem that the county authorities or the state or the nation might afford out of our millions of taxation the small sum that would suffice to set up guideposts on these roads indicating where water is to be found the distance to it and if necessary the marks by which the exact place is to be known it is now quite possible for some wretch to perish in the tortures of thirst within so short a distance of water that by a final effort he might have reached it it was just sunset when i caught sight of a cottonwood in a cleft of the canyon wall in a few minutes we were at cottonwood springs among shady trees and with excellent water in abundance we had made thirty miles of extra tiring travel and i resolved to stop for a day and enjoy the beauty of the spot but when after we had drunk our fill i searched for pasturage the pleasing prospect faded i had been told that i should find grass in plenty here but except for a few scraps of half-dead fillery there was nothing to serve for forage for tonight we must make the best of a bad job and in the morning push on to mecca twenty-five miles away with compunction i picketed Kouya for the night on his meager billet he watching me with anxious gaze as i moved away i ate a cold supper drank about five gallons of water smoked a pipe and turned in not before enjoying a shower bath of the desert sort by means of my tin drinking cup with musical rustle of cottonwoods i was wafted to luxurious sleep as i was saddling up for an early start a crusoe-like figure appeared on the hill above a doorless cabin that i had decided to be uninhabited the old man proved to be a caretaker in charge of the machinery which pumps water from this place to a mine eighteen miles to the east such are the difficulties that must often be overcome before these desert mines can be worked crusoe seeming friendly and urging a longer stay i explained my case when he mentioned that in a locked building nearby there was a little store of hay the property of a mecca man who occasionally made trips to a claim in the eagle mountains he also offered the opinion that a feller's hoss hadn't arter go hungry when there was hay laying around enough said i could pay the owner when i reached mecca so i took french leave off saddled and treated my surprised kawea to a hearty breakfast under these circumstances i returned to my former program and passed an easy day reveling in shade cool sweet water and leisurely meals at which crusoe bore me company cottonwood springs is one of the few desert watering places at which the traveler would wish to stay longer than necessity requires some bygone hermit had planted a few apple trees which promised a tolerable crop and there was even a garden patch where crusoe cultivated radishes beans and tomatoes for the benefit of the local quail and jackrabbits an old arastra the primitive means of crushing ore in a circular pit by dragging heavy weights over it with horse or mule for motive power spoke of old times and timers and the samples of rock scattered about would have furnished several museums with specimens my friend's conversation bore all upon mining affairs and was hebrew to me while mine no doubt was equally worthless to him for the desert had dried out every interest but one and turned him into a sort of mineral while i was deep in slumber that night i had a sudden alarm of rumble and shouting and jumped up just in time to escape being trampled by a pair of horses that failed to see me until they were almost on me when they reared and backed on the heavy wagon it was the owner of that hay come at midnight as if to avenge his wrongs at the moment that seemed to be his mood when he heard my story but in the morning he felt better about it and became quite friendly when he pocketed his scandalous overcharge sunrise found us on the move down the canyon in shadow of high walls from which came ever and anon the haunting call of the canyon wren as charming as that other sweet bird that shunned the noise of folly most musical most melancholy the air in these desert canyons at early morning before the sun shines in is about the finest in the world cool light mildly energizing pure as the upper ether it was enchanting to ride in ease and shade 
not now too wearied to feel the finer glory of the sunray as it roused the dull tone of common rock into living flush of color kindled the upper cliff to a beacon flame trimmed each coping and pinnacle with tremulous fire the canyon sides here were high and precipitous and weathered at the top into fantastic confusion outlined with toppling crags and turrets on an almost overhead skyline were spectral yuccas and ocotillos their rigid shapes fully in keeping with the crude rock forms among which they appeared in the canyon bottom a few palaverdes were still in blossom along with desert willow and catclaw i here began to meet the palo fierro or ironwood a tree to me that always has an interesting friendly look i had hoped to find it in flower but it was a month too late and the apple green foliage was sprinkled thickly with brown seed vessels this locality seems to be about the northwesterly limit of the tree's growth to the canyon there ensued the usual expanse of gravelly plain somewhat relieved here by a remarkably fine growth of ocotillos their short season of beauty was over the leaves had fallen and left the thorny canes skeleton-like and gray and the fiery blossoms were dried out to the color of rust but in size many of them far exceeded the ordinary some were over twenty feet in height with butts as thick as well-grown oaks the typical contour of the desert mountains is also especially well marked in this locality the steep slope of the rock wall meets the horizontal abruptly with no conjoining curve but from every canyon a long straight tongue or bajada runs out at low angle and even then the junction with the line of the plain is clearly marked that is the desert no suavity grace or curve of beauty but always a stark construction of right lines and angles repeated to the point of obsession a higher mass at length came in sight to the south and i recognized santa rosa then more westerly san jacinto swung into view both faintly drawn in the haze mere bands of uncertain blue hardly darker than the sky a few more miles and far in the west i caught a glimpse of what seemed a white iceberg showing above the long sea-like horizon of a distant mesa it was the topmost crest of san gorgonio the thousand feet or so by which it overtops the two-mile mark i was now again approaching the so-called mud hills which here form the inner barrier before reaching the open levels of the colorado desert presently the road passed into a gorge framed by high white cliffs in this peculiar formation the elements find free play and they have made the most of the opportunity one can hardly credit those plodding workmen water wind and frost with these spectacular forms which seem more in style of vulcan's art thunderbolts might have riven these vast perpendicular scars these crumbling turrets and threatening towers which hint at more of dynamics than of slow erosion a mile down the canyon we found ourselves at schaefer's well it was only mid-morning so there was time for a good rest i threw off the saddle and left kawea to pick what he chose out of a scattering of hay that some prodigal team had wasted while i niched myself into a scrap of shade and watched between dozes the antics of a troop of chipmunks these jolly little scamps hardly bigger than mice are the most entertaining of the whole sayuras tribe which is a good deal to say when one remembers the douglas squirrel of the sierra their impudence is delicious quite in the style of the artful dodger they are practical jokes incarnate and there is something positively wicked in the cock of their tails the cool of the evening was still some hours away when we took the road for the last stage of this part of our travels the gorge became narrower the walls higher and in places vertical i have changed my mind so often with regard to the possibilities of temperature whether greater in canyons or in the open that i hesitate to say that the heat that july afternoon marked a new record in my experience the windings of the canyon shut off all chance of a breeze the white walls and the white sand of the bottom reflected the sun's rays mercilessly the canyon seemed to reverberate with heat and light once or twice it grew almost insupportable and i fancied i felt warnings of vertigo 
I have no doubt that the thermometer, if a shade reading could have been taken, would have shown 125 degrees or over. Kawea, like a true Indian, pushed doggedly on through the yielding sand. Bronco he may be, but I have found every ounce of him good staunch horse. The canyon widened, and at a turn, behold, the salt sea lay across the opening, faintly blue, mysterious, romantic, pictorial. At the same moment, a breeze met us, not cool, oh no, but bringing at least a touch of life into the stagnation, even a momentary tang of good salty ocean. Beyond the line of blue rose the opaline barrier of Santa Rosa, and far to the southward, Superstition Mountain, hardly more than a shadow on the sky. Passing into the open, I looked westward up the valley. Dark clumps of cottonwoods marked the sites of the nearest ranches five miles away. A trail of smoke, like that from a steamer far out at sea, showed where a train was running down from the pass. Hazy in distance, the places of the little settlements of the Coachelli Valley could be guessed, and overall, though now low on the horizon, San Jacinto and San Gorgonio kept the gateway to the Pacific. Mecca, a nondescript hamlet and railway point near the northern margin of the Salton Sea, was now only a few miles away, and at evening we came to rest and welcome at the ranch of a friend who grows the earliest grapes of the season at appropriate prices for such as choose to buy them. Here we enjoyed again for a few days plentiful hay, cultured society, newspapers, music, and what seemed the consummation, the sight and sound of water gurgling day and night from artesian wells. The round I had made since leaving the valley had taken me about a hundred and fifty miles, roughly in a circle. Ten miles away was Coachella, whence I had started a week before. End of chapter 10「eleven California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 A Desert Ride Mecca to Fig Tree John A few miles to the north of Mecca, a canyon opens into the Cottonwood Mountains that is remarkable for the contour and the coloring of its walls. It is known as Painted Canyon. A view of it well repaid the discomfort of a ride on a July morning, with the temperature at 110 degrees in the shade. A broad, horizontal band of red on the face of the mud-colored foothills plainly marks the point of entrance. Footnote. It is not the canyon that opens directly into the red formation, but the next one to the westward that is most notable. End of footnote. These foothills never fail to rouse my curiosity by the complicated shapes into which the material has been wrought. The material is earth, not rock, and is mostly of a pale gray hue approaching white. Erosion, supplementing the work of some violent original upthrow, has produced a most intricate medley of forms. At a mile or two, the light and shade effects are so eccentric as to seem artificial. Creasing, pleating, braiding, dovetailing are carried to the point of confusion. Yet on this vast scale it has a look of orderliness that is unnatural, and under sunset light this whole foothill range for leagues becomes a checker of red and purple, a charm of color, a mystery of design. On entering the canyon the sides are, at first, not high, and are built of whitish earth. But as one goes on, the walls increase in height and verticality and in strangeness of form, while the canyon narrows to a gorge and then a defile. Novel colors appear. Cliffs, mainly of dusky red, are banded and splashed with lavender, chocolate, bright ochre, purple, gray, ashy dark green, and brilliant lighter red. Clefts only a few feet in width wind away from the main canyon. Curious shapes are met, gullies, cirques, domed recesses, tunnels, perpendicular walls of unbroken smoothness topped with turrets and spires and perilous balance. There has been wild work here in some heroic age of geologics. 
enormous mud eruptions i suppose succeeded by cooling conditions almost equally violent and these followed by ages of varied though slower play of elements even Kawea was impressed and stared about him like any tourist the passageway became yet narrower the cliffs more vast i do not think five hundred feet is an overestimate of their height in some places and the nearness of the walls to the beholder doubles or trebles their towering effect one feels as if he were at the bottom of a well a feature that interested me was the formation in places of a sort of lacework curiously fashioned of earth which hung in perpendicular valences from projecting ledges where water had trickled over the cliff face the work one might fancy of some race of gnomes or fairy cliff dwellers who inhabited the crannies of the wall and wove this airy grill to screen their privacy after some miles i dismounted and sat down in the strip of shade at the foot of the cliff the silence was profound no breeze penetrated thus far no rustle of wing piping of insect nor hint of the delicate footfall broke the trance-like stillness the dead air and the pressure of heat in that confined space added to the feeling of absolute solitude only the swing of an eagle across the narrow ribbon of sky told of life motion the sentient in nature on the sand nearby lay the carcass of a raven then momentarily breaking the spell from some ledge far overhead came a shower of pearl-like notes the sweet unvarying phrase of the canyon wren plaintive beseeching like orpheus's farewell to eurydice at this season there was no water in the canyon though in winter a feeble trickle is sometimes forced to the surface by an outcropping ledge of granite my canteen supplied my own needs but kawea seemed unhappy and must have longed to drink so i refrained from exploring farther than some four miles of the canyon which continued to wind on apparently into the heart of the mountain on the return i noticed a few clumps of the rare aster or cutty eye still holding their large lavender blossoms the only flowers and almost the only plants that the place afforded halfway down the canyon a hot wind met us it had a fierce stinging quality that made the skin smart and it seemed as if it would wither the eyeballs through the lids the water in the canteen became so hot that it was only while in the act of drinking that thirst was allayed kawea hurried along without need of spur and when we reached camp drank until i feared the water resources of the valley would be endangered and made him stop i poured what remained in the canteen into my canvas wash basin and on using it several minutes afterwards found it uncomfortably hot its temperature by the thermometer was 108 degrees. When a friend who had a date plantation near Thermal, an over-modest name at this season, a few miles up the valley, invited me to visit his place, I was prompt to comply. Months of solitary travel lay ahead, and I didn't miss any chance of society while I could get it. My friend himself was absent, but the jolly young Canadian foreman and a delightful Mexican family who worked on the place made my stay pleasant and profitable. The owner is one of the pioneers of the date industry and an importer of the palms on a large scale from the African and Asiatic date regions. The plantation was a picture of thrift and perfect cultivation, and the young Algerians, Arabians, and Persians seemed as comfortable as though Santa Rosa Mountain, across the valley, were Ararat, Sinai, or the Atlas. One of the neighboring canyons gave another example of the fantastic and natural carving. The walls are in places wrought to almost cathedral look of fineness, and with their whitish color take on, at a little distance, almost the look of old ivory. Deeply worn trails of bighorn mark the hillsides here and there, and once the silence was broken by a far-off bleat that only augmented the sense of solitude. It was a sultry, half-cloudy day when I moved southward across the valley to the old Indian village of Toro. There was little token of desert in the green fields of alfalfa, willow-shaded reservoirs, and flocks of water-loving blackbirds that I passed, but along the mountainside ran the ancient sea-line, 
reminding me that I was in one of Neptune's cellarages pumped dry by the sun. There used to be a little newspaper published monthly at Thermal that bore the heading The Coachella Valley Submarine, published 122 feet below sea level. A humorous subheading described this inoffensive sheet as the most low-down newspaper on earth. I know of others to which such a character might be attributed seriously enough. Arrived at Toro, I sought an interview with the Capitan. He bore the unromantic name of Joe Pete, but was a good-looking, portly, friendly fellow who willingly showed me a good spot for my camp in a grassy corner of his little farm. There were evidences of thrift in his neat house of cement blocks and in flourishing rows of grapevines, cantaloupes, and so forth. Also in his wife, busy with the blackberry patch. Two boys and a half a dozen dogs made it their business to interview me, and I was put through a short but sharp examination. What is your name? Where do you come from? Where do you go? When? Where did you get your pony? How much? Can he buck? And what do you do? You prospect? When my turn came, there was not much to be got beyond shy grins and much shuffling of dusty feet but I learned that one of the boys was Joe Pete's godson, and that he lived with his godfather in preference to staying at his proper home close by, which seemed to speak well for the big capitan. There were heavy clouds and vivid lightning that evening to the north, and I guess they were catching it up at Dale and Twenty Nine Palms. Once or twice in most summers, an electrical storm breaks over these mountains, but the rain seldom reaches the open desert. It may sometimes be seen falling, but is likely to evaporate in midair and return unspent to the parent cloud. Joe Pete, who came over while I was breakfasting to present me with a melon, promised two months of what he called little warm like this. It was then about 95 degrees, less than an hour after sunrise. In the morning, I went on to the next village, Martinez, a short distance down the valley. Somewhere hereabouts, there were to be seen, until lately, examples of the wells dug by the Indians of olden days. I got an intelligent young Indian to pilot me to the sites of three of them, but they were now shapeless pits filled with mesquite and other brush. The water supply is now the commonplace one by pipe and bucket, no longer per squaw marching picturesquely with Oya through thickets of arrowweed and mesquite to draw from the pool at the foot of the earthen stairway, returning with plentiful germs of typhoid fever. I have inquired for these old wells in other parts of the desert, where formerly there were large Indian settlements, but have failed to find one remaining in tolerable condition. I am told that these Indians, the Cahuillas, are the only tribe known to have solved the water problem by digging wells. At the foot of Santa Rosa Mountain, a short distance from Martinez, there is an interesting relic of aboriginal times that is fairly well preserved, though it must be of very great age. A number of years ago there appeared in a Los Angeles paper an account of the discovery of the remains of a prehistoric city in this locality. The story had all the marks of a mare's nest, but I fancy that this that I refer to may have been its foundation. The object is hard to find, being indistinguishable until one is on the very spot, and even then it might be overlooked. Yet it is as unmistakably man's handiwork as the cliff dwellings when once the eye grasps it. In a little recess or bay, perhaps 300 yards wide at the foot of the mountains, one sees a curious arrangement of the stones that litter the slope. They seem at first to be grouped in circular formation, as if they mark the outlines of small round huts. The circles are not complete, however, but are like horseshoes with the openings on the upper side. The slope is covered with continuous lines of these horseshoes, nearly touching one another, the rows extending almost from side to side of the recess. The diameter of the horseshoes is six or eight feet, and there are several rows, one above the other, like terraces along the foot of the slope. When one observes that these stone horseshoes are placed just at the level of the former sea, their nature becomes plain. They were simply fish traps. Whether the entire set was built when this was a tidal shore, 
and the sundry rows were meant to serve for higher or lower tides, or whether the traps date from more recent times when this was an inland and therefore tideless sea, and the ranks were built downward in succession as the water line gradually lowered, I must leave to heads more archaeological than mine. When I spoke of the place to one of the Martinez Indians, he knew at once what I meant, and referred to the objects unhesitatingly as the old fish traps. A short ride from Martinez took me to Alamo Bonito, another Indian village, taking its name from the trees that mark its location from miles away. Footnote. In Spanish, Alamo means cottonwood, Bonito means beautiful. End of footnote. It is ruled by Jake Razon as Capitan, and to him I applied for permission to camp near the water and for Cahuilla's rations of hay. At first he was suspicious, for which I didn't blame him, especially as my military saddle and other traps gave a half-official look to my coming. I had broken in on a family watermelon party, too. But after talking me over while they finished the melon, Jake relented, and again all was hunky-dory, as a former host had phrased it. He came over after supper for a chat but his Anglo-Indian Spanish was too abstruse for me, and was complicated by one or two original compound idioms that found place in every sentence. For instance, sometime, anytime, and you see, you bet. I gathered, however, that some local authority was bent upon breaking up the few remaining tribal customs of these harmless people, such as their periodical fiesta and the use of their Indian language. It seems odd that Indian officials are so enthralled by the repressive idea, which may be summed up as, see what those confounded Indians are doing and make them stop it. I slept well with Jake's scanty hay pile for mattress, but was aware once or twice of thunder, lightning, and sprinklings of rain. Just before dawn, there came a splitting crash right overhead. I jumped up and found a partial shelter which only enabled me to soak piecemeal instead of going in for a wholehearted sousing at once, which would have been much more comfortable. A mare and colt that had been my neighbors all night, gradually nibbling my mattress away, dashed wildly about at every flash and roar. Kawea was not interested. He had hay to attend to and munched on, sloppy but happy. The farthest outpost of civilization in this direction is the Oasis Ranch, a flourishing spot where, owing to plentiful water, desert life is almost luxurious. I had meant to camp there for one night, but the cordial welcome I met from the caretakers and from some friendly people who owned adjoining land was too much for me. Though the oranges, grapes, and melons, with the charms of a reservoir big enough for a swimming pool, also had weight. It would be my last taste of such pleasures for a pretty long spell, and I willingly succumbed to a three-day stay. Pasturage, moreover, was plentiful, and the fig season at its prime. At evening we all took to the water, and for an hour the welkin rang with shoutings, splashings, and barkings. When I retired, cooled to sleeping point, Repose was enlivened by big, overripe figs that dropped on me at intervals throughout the night. My route now was for a few miles near the margin of the Salton Sea. This body of water is well worth a paragraph, and the more so, perhaps, for the reason that it will probably find no place on the maps of the next generation of schoolboys. The central part of the Colorado Desert has long been known to be below sea level, a fact, indeed, plainly stamped on the face of the country in the waterline of the ancient beach. The means by which Neptune lost this corner of his domain can be stated in a few words. In far distant times, the point at which the Colorado River debouched into the Gulf of California was not, as it is now, at the head of the Gulf. The sea then reached farther northward to the limit shown by the old shoreline, so that the river's mouth was some distance to the south of the sea's northern boundary. In course of ages, the great stream, then no doubt engaged in the carving of that marvelous canyon that ranks perhaps first among the geographical wonders of the world, 
built up with its silt a dam, which in time extended completely across the gulf, leaving the upper part cut off from the ocean. This isolated part, which was over 2,000 square miles in area, and by geologists is named Lake Kawia, from the Indian tribe that inhabited its western side, receiving practically no supplies of water, tended to disappear by evaporation. From time to time, however, the river must have broken in, with the result that the lake became brackish. Thus, the shells that are a noticeable feature of all the below-sea-level area are of kinds native to fresh or brackish waters. The shell remains of the original sea epoch are now found high above sea level, betokening some great upheaval in remote times. It is to the brackish period that the deposits of travertine, calcium carbonate, are due. Proof can be seen in marks of old lake beaches at various levels that there was a succession of complete or partial fillings and emptyings of the lake basin, the inflow no doubt usually coming from the river, but perhaps sometimes from the gulf. From Indian tradition, it would seem that for a long time prior to recent years, the lake bed as a rule has been dry. Great deposits of salt occupied the deepest portion, and a few years ago were being worked on a large scale. In 1891, there occurred a relatively small inflow from the river, creating a shallow lake of some 200 square miles. But in 1905, through the weakness of levees and headgates of the canal system that was carrying the Colorado River water onto the lands of the new Imperial Valley settlement, came a greater flood which caused serious loss and threatened a wholesale disaster. For over two years the water rose until it seemed as if it would entirely fill its old basin. It was not until early in 1907 that the engineer finally conquered the river. I say finally, but after all, that is a word man should never use for his little victories over physical nature. At that time, the lake was over 400 square miles in area, with a depth of more than 80 feet, an imposing body of water. That is the so-called Salton Sea. Evaporation has somewhat reduced it, and in about 20 years, should there be no new inflow, it will probably have disappeared, perhaps forever. Today, it is still a great expanse, which looked at, over its farthest extent, appears a veritable sea, with no horizon of land to mark its bounds. Near the western margin of this geologically romantic lake, my road now ran to the southward. The water, faintly blue and ideally calm, looked in the summer haze like a watercolor drawing, and the mountains beyond, the cottonwoods and the chuckawallas, might have been an insubstantial pageant instead of the uncompromising reality that I had lately experienced. The chocolate range, farther to the south, was a mere dream of air tints, quite phantasmic. On the nearer shore, a white and grisly rank of dead mesquite stood like skeletons. They had been killed by the flooding of the basin, and had but lately emerged as the water receded. Here and there, among the branches, were many nests of pelicans, which make this inland sea, swarming with fish of one or two coarse species, their home and breeding ground. The effect upon the mind was of a dead sea, with horror veiled under a Circean smile. Nor did the sight of the old beach line, with its hint of vanished ages, of countless generations long passed away, at all lessen the impression. The Indian patriarch of these parts is old Juan Razon, or as he is better known, Fig Tree John. In former times he lived, far from whites and other Indians, at a spot a few miles to the south. It is to be known by a few fig trees and is marked on government maps as Fig Tree John Springs. When the Salton Sea submerged his little estate, he moved to another spot called Awa Dulce on somewhat higher ground. I already had a slight acquaintance with him and was pleased now to meet him as he was leading his horse to water. When I had surrendered the can of tobacco with which I had come prepared, he invited me to share a watermelon with him at his house. I hastened to agree to this excellent idea. The mellowest sandia was brought from his little patch, 
and bisected with a rusty hatchet and we sat in the shade of the ramada and chatted while the cooling hemispheres rapidly melted away to my regret mrs john was coy and would not join us nor would a huge girl who gloomily watched the melon's effacement through peepholes in the brush partition from a chummy almost fraternal tone john became impressive an old satchel was produced and proved to contain archives that revealed my friend in his higher roles first was a photograph tenderly wrapped of himself in cavalier wearing a police uniform the feature of which apart from a certain roominess of fit was its double rows of gleaming buttons the severity of a stovepipe hat gave effect to an attitude of martial rigidity which he had thought proper on the occasion of being taken a possible defect of top heaviness was offset by bare feet which corrected any impression of overdress the steed appropriate for desert chieftain was a miniature donkey whose dramatically pointed ears betokened a deep sense of responsibility next an aged document was perilously unfolded and spread before me in clerkly hand and formal phrase it set forth that cabazon the last great chief of the cahuillas did thereby name and appoint juanito means johnny or little john razon to be capitan of the agua dulce tuba village and to exercise authority in the name place instead of said chief cabazon and called upon his people to render respect and obedience to said johnny and all said johnny's lawful commands etc etc given under my hand this so-and-so and signed with a cross in presence of a witness then came some ragged maps apparently rough drafts of surveyors these he held made him owner of all the territory shown running from the last low ridge of the santa rosas the ridge was named hiawat on the map evidently an indian word though john could not translate it into spanish as far as conejo prieto or black rabbit peak no wonder he eyed me closely while these valuable papers were in my grasp before i left i bought of him a macate or rope of plaited horsehair of his own making the price to others would have been four dollars he said but on grounds of friendship i should have it for half the sum this statement warned me that the article was not worth the price he asked for it but i was glad to carry away this souvenir of the dusky lord of conejo prieto there is a legend the truth of which i may some day put to the proof that the rattlesnake will not cross a rope of this sort many cowboys and others are convinced that this is a fact and john also affirmed it stoutly i have sometimes in specially snake infested districts laid the rope around the place where i spread my blankets and can assert that i have never been bitten this may not be thought convincing but i doubt if any cowboy has better evidence to offer there is however a reasonable theoretical basis for the belief anyone who has handled a hair rope knows that it is about as uncomfortable an article to the touch as a thistle the arrangement of the belly scales of the rattlesnake is such that in the act of crawling the prickly hairs would certainly prove annoying perhaps enough so as to cause the snake to change his course footnote i have recently made the experiment with a sidewinder which is a small species of rattlesnake it passed over my hair rope three times without any token of discomfort each time however the snake was moving backwards it is possible that in forward motion the effect might be different in footnote when i suggested a picture it was made plain to me that the great do not receive but confer a favor in being photographed john demanded a round sum which in this case seemed not to be modified on the score of friendship when that was arranged he took the position and expression of one who bears intense pain with determination then the great girl would be taken with her pet goat no need for any formula of look pleasant please with smiling juana when i asked how i should address her in sending copies of the picture 
She sedately gave her name as Mrs. So-and-so, Post Office Box So-and-so, at Mecca, thoroughly up in the ways of the world. No doubt her children will be little Bills and Bobs, Sadies and Susies, with chewing gum and all modern improvements. An hour's easy ride brought me to my camping place for the night at Fig Tree John Springs, no longer obliterated by the flood. The water is good, though tepid, and a few small palms and a cottonwood or two make the spot attractive. The margin of the lake is now a half a mile away. I walked over to it and found an uninviting beach of slimy mud, the surface baked by the sun into large curving flakes like potsherds. A few dead trees were all that broke the melancholy expanse, if I accept the decaying bodies of fish that added no charm to the landscape or the breeze. From the many coyote tracks it seemed that this sort of diet is much to the taste of that broad-minded animal. Far out, pelicans and groups of three or four were fishing for supper, one of them now and then launching itself with mighty splash upon a school of prey. The sunset color was unusually fine, though of extreme delicacy. One might suppose that desert conditions would work for crudity and staring distinctness in form of color. The reverse is the fact. The most ethereal tones in nature are those of desert landscapes. The mirage itself is hardly more elusive than the reality of these plains and mountains, faint, vague, mystical. And when the light comes level, as at evening or early morning, there is a quality in the scene that makes it ineffable, almost subjective. I slept beneath the palms. Overhead the stars played hide-and-seek as a gentle wind moved the leaves and brought low sounds from the lake, where tiny ripples plashed on the beach. Once a deeper sound came, as if by subterranean ways, to my ears. A heavy train was rumbling down the valley to Yuma. I sat up and watched the speck of light from the engine ten miles away across the water, and fancied I heard the ghost of a whistle as it neared the Sultan siding. There was no doubt in the case, however, when the coyotes began to sing grace over their fishbones. Such a hullabaloo came from the shore as one would think must signify some vast immediacable woe. But no, that is the coyote's way of enjoying himself. As a rule, I enjoy it too, but now I wanted to sleep, so fired my revolver to see what the effect would be. There were ten seconds of sweetest silence. Then the hubbub was redoubled and mounted to a crisis. Well, I would have it a smoking concert at least, so lighted my pipe and talked to Kawea until the performers grew tired and took their way homeward their farewells coming and touching diminuendo from some distant canyon. End of chapter 11a noticeable landmark, less than a mile distant from Fig Tree John Springs, is an isolated outpost of Santa Rosa Mountain that, from its coating of calcium carbonate, is known as Travertine Rock. Standing ringed about by the sandy ocean, there is a suggestion of a battleship in its turreted shape, an idea further carried out by the strongly marked sea line near its top as if that were the deck level, the gun turrets and other upper structures contrasting in pale gray of granite with the darker bulk of the travertine-covered hull. In the morning, I walked over to examine it at close range and climb it for a view over the Salton Sea. Close to camp, I noted a benchmark of the geological survey, giving a minus elevation of 197 feet below sea level. The lowest part, now of course under water of this depression, has been found to be 287 feet below the sea, 11 feet lower than the bottom of Death Valley on the Mojave, which is dry. But the testimony of benchmarks was discounted by that horizontal line, still far above my head when I reached the base of the rock, though the ground I had walked over sloped slightly upward. 
It was like a deadline, warning me that I was out of bounds and drawing my attention to the fact that the whole bulk of the Earth's oceans was dammed up a hundred feet or so overhead, a few miles away. If, I thought, nature should decide just now to shift things round once more, and should knock a hole in the dam, I wonder what would happen. Something startling, for certain. It would be the Johnstown flood multiplied by billions. In climbing among the huge boulders that lie tumbled around the foot of this ancient island, I was surprised at the thickness of their coating of travertine. In places where it had scaled off, I saw blocks of the stuff a foot and a half through. I do not remember any such thickness at the coral reef or other points where I have found travertine. Perhaps the exposed position of this rock, which, standing out in the seaway, must have caught the full wave wash in times of storm, may account for the successive deposit. A little way from the foot, on the northeast face, I found a narrow cave, twenty yards or so from front to rear. Fragments of pottery showed that it had been inhabited, probably as a place of refuge. It could hardly have been used as a regular dwelling, for the floor was very uneven, and the sides and roof showed no traces of smoke. The rock has hardly any plant life. Only a few scraps of vegetation find foothold where a handful of soil has lodged. About the base, an unthrifty Palo Verde here and there holds on to life, its smooth greenness, more like paint than verdure, looking stranger than ever in this stark spot. For animal life, one small brown wren flitted silently among the rhomboids of this natural pyramid. The view proved worth the climb, though that was a warm experience. From here, the Sultan looked like a narrow bay, the head of which was near at hand, though to the south no land horizon was in sight. The few cultivated spots on the opposite side showed black rather than green, by contrast with the pale hue of sand or the white patches of alkali. The mountain barrier beyond was a mirage-like band of neutral tone, giving no hint of the color flood that would come when the sun passed the zenith to culminate at evening in the pageantry of sunset. Far to the south, the chocolates paled imperceptibly into mere sky. Behind, the great mountain rose in leagues of barren rock, tremulous with heat, but unmistakable as to reality. The sky was pale, hard blue, no least film of vapor softening its aching glare. Out over the water, seabirds wavered in rhythmic maneuver like some ghostly impossible snowstorm. In the afternoon, I moved on a few miles to Fish Springs. The road ran near the lake margin, sometimes on land that had, until recently, been submerged. There was little interest in the long levels through which we plodded. Pale drab of dried salt grass, the ugliest grass that grows, alternated with stretches of alkali where Kawea's hoofs broke through the white crust and sank into gray slime. Rounded bushes of atriplex, repeated without variation of size, color, or outline, and shapeless clumps of sour-smelling sueda, followed one another with dreary monotony. A bit of arrowweed or a snutted screw bean was a boon by comparison. Ghosts of drowned mesquites made a phantom procession by the water's edge, and seemed, in the tremor of heat, to be up to some weird antics, like skeletons playing leapfrog. The vague shape of the Superstition Mountains, on the southern horizon, gave the landscape an extra touch of horror, recalling tales of men, not a few, who have perished in attempts to reach the treasure supposed to be hidden in that waterless labyrinth. Fish Springs is marked by a growth of mesquites and small cottonwoods, spread over a few acres of damp land close to the border of the sea. The road, or rather track, I had been following is used occasionally by travelers to the Imperial Valley. The usual mode of travel nowadays is by automobile, which can cover the long distances quickly and, barring accidents, without danger from lack of water. It was significant of the sort of country I was entering to find beside the road a signboard pointing to the water with the warning, Fill up! Last convenient water for 45 miles. 
At Fish Springs itself, the water is brackish and tepid, nevertheless quite fair water for the desert. In the pools were numbers of tiny fish about the size of tadpoles. As I neared the place, I was surprised to hear a gun fired, and the shot came peppering near, so I let out a whistle. But I was more surprised when I saw the gunners. By the edge of the pool stood two boys, a long and a short, both about twelve years old. On the ground were a scrap of blanket, some bits of food, and a half-gallon can of the lard-pail kind. The boys were poorly dressed, one shoeless, and neither of them in the pink of condition. It was near sundown, and if these were their preparations for supper, bed, and breakfast, to go no further, they seemed inadequate, especially in view of their surroundings. The smaller boy held a long, single-barreled gun and the carcass of a dove. There was an air of uncertainty about the youngsters, as if they had been discussing their next move. I asked whether they were camping there for the night, and the half-hearted way in which they guessed so seemed to show that they didn't know what else to do. When I inquired where they came from, Indio, said the smaller and shoeless boy, who seemed the captain of the Enterprise. As he glanced disconsolately this way and that, I caught sight of the stock of an old-fashioned revolver projecting from the pocket of his ragged overalls. How did you come? We walked, was the reply. Indio was about forty miles away. Is that all the grub you have? No, I just got a bird, exhibiting the dove. Well, you nearly got a man, too. Where are you going? Borrego Valley, I guess. Do you know how far that is? About ten miles, ain't it? Do you know the trail? No, I know where it is, though, over that way. What do you carry water in? That, the little lard pail. Do you know how far it is to the next water? No. I'll tell you, then. It's twenty-five miles to seventeen palms, and when you get there, you can't drink the water. Then it's a good twelve more to Borrego Springs and five more to Borrego Valley. Now, do you think the two of you can make nearly forty miles on that can of water? My youngster was visibly impressed as I rubbed in the water question, and now asked what I thought they had better do. In reply to my question of what had started them on this wild errand, he opened up and explained that his father knowed a feller who had taken up land in Borrego Valley, and they were going there to work for him. Had reached Fish Springs last evening, camped, and in the morning started on, carrying the pitiful little pail of water. Got a few miles along, water half gone. Met two Mexicans who were thirsty and drank the rest of the water. Felt tired and hot, so went down to the lake and had a bath and drank a lot of the water. Felt bad and guessed they'd come back to Fish Springs to camp for the night. Now, I said, there's just one thing for you boys to do, and I want to see you start to do it. Roll up your blanket and things and start back for home. I'll give you a note to the people at the Oasis Ranch, and they'll see that you have something to eat and a place to sleep. Then get back to Indio as fast as you can and never do such a foolhardy thing again. It's a thousand to one you'd have got lost and died out there if you'd gone on. Will you do what I say? They promised. It was Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn to life to see those poor little scamps as they started up the dusty road. Over the big boy's shoulder, the long gun waved vaguely to and fro. The little fellow carried the can of water with a bit of blanket professionally rolled and slung by a cord at his back. The revolver butt protruded from his flapping overalls in a comical, pathetic fashion. As I gauged it, it was a case of running away from home. The Mexicans, by drinking their water, had very likely saved their lives. There is little doubt as to what would have been the outcome if they had gone on. They would have used up their water in the first ten miles. Would almost certainly never have reached seventeen palms, which is not easy to find even had their strength held out so far. And if they had reached it, they would have drunk their fill of the half-poisonous stuff and promptly succumbed. More likely, they would have wandered about on a hopeless search for seventeen palms and would have run the usual course of thirst, delirium, insanity, death. 
Tomorrow's march would be a long one, so I turned in early. Mosquitoes were such a nuisance about the spring that before long I had to move two hundred yards away. Awakening after an hour or so, I could hear Kawea stamping restlessly and had to go over and rescue him also. The night was unusually warm and sleep unwilling to oblige. At last, the murmur of the ripple on the shore and the rhythmic chant of frogs sent me into an intermittent doze, from which I arose by moonlight at half-past three, not particularly refreshed. I gave Kawea a hearty feed from the little store of barley that I had brought for helping him over the hard spots in the near future, and before five o'clock we were on the move. A heron rose from the lake as we started and flapped slowly alongside for a hundred yards, etched japanesquely on the brightening saffron. In a few moments the sun rose in his old tyrannic splendor, and our heron steered away as if it might have been one of the yellow-skirted fays of that quaint idea of Milton's. So when the sun in bed, curtained with cloudy red, pillows his chin upon an orient wave, the flocking shadows pale troop to the infernal jail each fettered ghost slips to his several grave and the yellow-skirted fays fly after the night steeds leaving their moon-loved maze this time his chin was pillowed on the cottonwood mountains and his first shot at me came in a blaze of red across the dreary waters of the sultan the road if it could be called a road continued southward, paralleling on one hand the sea and on the other a long southeasterly spur of Santa Rosa. The spur ran out at last in a tongue of yellowish rock of the Malpais kind, cut by many gullies and barrancas. Round this spur, which is known as Clay Point, my route lay. It seemed as if we should never turn that point. The going became worse, loose sand and gravel for hour after hour, and travel was slow and tiresome. It was a relief to reach the place where we must leave the road and strike westward across unbroken desert. The only mark of this spot was a heap of stones, and I felt a little anxiety on seeing that no tracks came in here, lest it might not be the turn-off for Seventeen Palms, but only some prospector sign leading into the Badlands or the mountains. I had started with full canteens, of course, but though a gallon and a half may seem a good deal of liquid for one person for a day, anyone who has traveled the desert in summer knows how quickly that quantity will be used. In this parching land, to be without water for a very few hours means disaster. Hence, a mistake of direction, requiring retracing of steps or leading one into country through which it is difficult to find one's way, is a thing to be dreaded and, I may add, is dreaded all the more as one gains in desert experience. It was the 30th of July, and the summer heat at its climax, reaching most days 115 to 120 degrees shade temperature. I stopped Kawea and glanced back at the Salton Sea, which I was now leaving for a time. It is at best a rather cheerless object, beautiful in a pale, placid way, but the beauty is like that of the mirage, the placidity that of stagnation and death. Charm of color it has, but none of the sentiment. Mystery, but not romance. Loneliness has its own attraction, and it is a deep one, but this is not so much loneliness as abandonment, not a solitude sacred, but a solitude shunned. Even the gulls that drift and flicker over it seem to have a spectral air like bird ghosts banished from the wholesome ocean. Even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to sea, but for the Salton, the appointed end is but a slow sinking of its bitter useless waters, a gradual bearing of slimy shores until it comes once more, and probably for the last time, to extinction in dead, hopeless desert. My outlook ahead and to the south was changed now that I had turned the shoulder of Santa Rosa. Before me, to the west, stretched one of the most forbidding tracts of the desert, grayer, more dreary than the rest. The shrubs grew smaller and more sparse. Even the greasewood seemed ready to succumb. For mile on mile one sees no animal life, either of beast, reptile, or bird, 
hardly of insect. Once I noted the track of a sidewinder, but this is a creature that moves by night. Desert dweller though it is, the desert sun is deadly to it. Far in front was a line of the peninsular Sierra that runs on southward down the long length of lower California. On the left, across a glistening alkaline expanse, rose the pale, uncertain shapes of the Vallecitos and other ranges, fading into the Cocopa country beyond the Mexican border. Close at hand on the right was the southern face of Santa Rosa. The shells that whitened the ground told that I was still on the minus side of zero in elevation. I looked carefully for tracks that might show I was headed rightly for Seventeen Palms. At long intervals I came on some faint wheel mark or doubtful shape of horse hoof, but they were disjointed fragments, signifying little. Every rainstorm brings down fresh sheets of sand from the washes of the mountain canyons, and every windstorm distributes the sand afresh, so that whatever travel there may be must break its own road. The amount of such travel may be gauged from the reply of the storekeeper at Mecca to my question whether he knew anyone thereabouts who had lately crossed this piece of country and could give me directions. Seventeen palms, he said. No, I haven't heard anyone coming that way for six months. The only guiding marks I saw were, once or twice, a so-called monument, chance bits of stone which the trained eye may know to have been placed by man, not nature, marking the best route to cross the wider washes. For long hours of glare and heat I pushed on, sometimes riding, sometimes leading Kawea, who plodded steadily along like the loyal comrade he has ever shown himself to be. Once a mirage suddenly grew before me, the common one of a sheet of water a few yards ahead, and once I saw a flicker of something white a mile away, which may have been a band of antelope. About ten o'clock I found a few scraps of blue stem, galleta grass, and burrow weed to eke out Kawea's scanty barley, and we stopped to rest and lunch. In saying that there was no insect life in these parts, I overlooked the ant. I should like to know whether Arctic travelers do not find these enterprising explorers always ahead of them. The moment I sat down, they converged on me. Evidently, the word was passed round that a fellow had arrived and was eating hardtack over by the greasewood, and the speed with which every crumb was whisked away showed that it was a notable event. A short half hour was as long as I could afford, since Kawea after a nibble at the uninviting forage, preferred to doze. On some unofficial map I have seen a certain Sacaton Spring marked as somewhere about here. Judging from the name, it would be marked by a growth of Sacaton grass, which could be seen for miles in this kind of country. I searched with my field glasses, but in vain, for any trace of greenness. Fortunately, as I had been unable to find anybody who knew of such a spring, I had not counted on it. Even if it could have been found, it might have proved to be like that in the next spring to the south, which is too strongly impregnated with soda to be usable. We took up our march. Occasionally, a wandering breeze blew for a moment, and I opened my shirt and my heart to it, but it quickly died away, and again the heat struck fiercely down. It was impossible to maintain any interest in the view, but that was no loss since nothing changed hour after hour. The mountain profiles merged and emerged imperceptibly, and that was all. It seemed a week that I had been creeping over this unending plain. Somehow I felt unreal, as if I were a picture of a man in my position, and wondered vaguely whether the man ever got anywhere. The sole distraction was in counting the time for my periodical drinks, two mouthfuls per half hour, the first one held for a few seconds in the mouth before swallowing. The reason for this economy was not that I feared running short of water, but there is always the unforeseen to be reckoned with. I found that this small but regular ration kept me going, and I had already accustomed myself to drink only for necessity, not for comfort or luxury. Footnote. I have since learned a good dodge from an Indian with whom I was out for some days in dry country. 
a little plug of the creosote greasewood bush say three quarters of an inch long and a quarter of an inch thick peeled held in the mouth is a good palliative of thirst much better than the regulation pebble End quote. the appearance of a signboard a fragment of box lid tied to a stake raised hopes of a word as to direction and distance but whatever information it may once have carried was gone as though it had never been there sun had bleached and sand had scoured till not a mark could be made out this sort of thing is as aggravating as a practical joke i was tempted to kick the thing sky high but refrained when i reflected that it might be named as a landmark to some future traveller at last appeared miles away to the northwest a few dots that showed black against the pale yellow foothills if they were palms they were my landmark i turned toward them lost them and found them again and again but finally knew that they were my palms not my destination itself but a guide to the place tracks became more frequent and converged toward a point in the clay hills that fringed santa rosa's southern base a faint trail grew out of nothing and led into a winding gallery of sand and boulders where strange wind-worn and sand-worn cliffs showed at every turn the palms appeared again now close at hand and in half an hour i caught sight of another group once i suppose seventeen but now only six or eight that marked our halting place for the day the water at seventeen palms is mere seepage found in two small holes if the holes were kept cleaned out for a day or two probably the quality of the liquid would improve though at best it would be strongly alkaline at this time they were slimy and ill-smelling and the water which was brown bitter and nauseating would have been dangerous to drink unboiled kawea however drank eagerly when i had cleaned out one of the holes though he is a gentlemanly horse quite fastidious about his water my small canteen was still full but as it must carry me on to Borrego Springs, I used this unpleasant stuff, carefully strained for my cooking. Rice boiled in it was thoroughly disgusting in color and taste. No amount of sugar could render it more than just bearable. The tea had a dirty gray curdle and a flavor like bilge, and when I tried cocoa as an alternative, the mixture promptly went black. Traces of former visitors were a rusty stove, abandoned i guess by some survey party who traveled deluxe with cooks and water barrels perhaps the government surveyors whose token i found nearby in the shape of a benchmark recording four hundred seventeen feet and an assayer's card nailed on a palm the usual cans and bottles were in evidence but in no such profusion as at most of these old camping spots the locality does not attract prospectors being i fancy scanty of valuable minerals there was little to interest hunters and the bad water with scarcity of forage puts a general ban on the place a few small mesquites with meagre show of beans and a nibbling of salt grass helped out kooya's supper with my back to a palm i hugged the shade till the sun went down then climbed to smoke a pipe on the hillside and view the surroundings Without having been in Egypt or Arabia, I would easily imagine myself to be looking down on a wadi of the Red Sea region. The abrupt gullies with banks of sun-hardened clay, the gravel-strewed sands, the shapeless brown foothills, the sparse thorny scrub, the solitary group of palms, made up a scene much more suggestive of Arabia Petraea than of any part of the American continent not less so was the oriental splendor of a gold and crimson sunset a strong breeze began to blow down the canyon about nightfall i found a hollow in which i spread my blankets first dispatching a warlike scorpion that rushed out at me sparring away like a little prize fighter and slept excellently till daybreak my cold breakfast was dispatched while kawea ate his barley and we bade farewell to seventeen palms with almost as much satisfaction as we had felt on arriving for safety's sake i filled a large canteen though heartily hoping i should not need to draw on it kawea refused to drink before we started preferring to fly to ills he knew not of rather than repeat the one he had tasted 
However, today we had only half of yesterday's distance to make, with prospect of good water at the end. It was sometimes exasperating to have Kawea thus refuse water, especially at the beginning of a long day's march. When he thus washed his hands of the responsibility, confident that I would not get him into serious trouble, I wished I could make an incision in his hide and pump him full willy-nilly. I determined today to make a particular effort to keep the road. The start was plain enough, for there was only one outlet to the canyon that could lead in my direction. It was a long ravine, similar to that by which we had come, winding among strange shapes of clay, the dome being the most common. Red and yellow were the prevailing colors, with mud-hued grays and drabs for a background. Ocotillos, always interesting in their weird way, had come in as I entered this clay country, but they looked starved and haggard, the shriveled flower heads a rusty relic of their vivid spring. There was little other brush to be seen, and all looked at the point of death. This clay formation, wherever found on the desert, is the last extreme of the barren, dreary, and dangerous. The vast network of gullies into which it becomes worn may easily become a death trap for the traveler. Sense of direction is quickly lost. In the deep sand and gravel of the bottoms, a trail is almost as evanescent as if marked in water. I was recently looking down again on this track from the mountain country to the west. The Indian, who was my companion, pointed to the hazy yellowish patch, twenty miles from where we stood, and said, Chichilishnua, devil's house. We call it that. Very bad place. Man get in there, no can get out, never. One time some of our people camp there. Night time one get up to go for drink. He die, never come back. A white man's chance of escape from this devil's house might be, say, one twentieth of an Indian's under equal circumstances. It is just as well, perhaps, that there are few attractions to draw travelers to Chichilisnua. Reaching more open country, we entered on a tract littered with curiously shaped objects of stone. Dumbbells were a common form, and accurately circular plates and rings, balls, symmetrical ovoids, and many more. Among them, grotesque figures of men, quite as realistic as some pagan idols that one sees in museums. The region is well above sea level, but probably water was the chief factor in shaping these oddities, perhaps at the time when the oyster shell beds were laid down, which are now a thousand feet up on the adjacent mountainside. Paralleling our course a mile or two to the north ran a level bluff of clay colored in pale tints of rose, lavender, green, and ochre, its face marked with vertical scorings as neatly drawn as if they had been engraved by a machine. It was the last day of July and seemed to me even hotter than the day before. Again I measured my water in half-hourly gulps. I found my thoughts turning constantly on water, as Arctic explorers dwell on beefsteaks. Ride for an hour and lead for an hour was the program. I had kept the trail pretty well, missing it often in crossing wide washes where the gravelly soil held no mark of travel, but picking it up again in softer places. To keep it at all, one's eyes must be peeled at every moment. For long distances, the only indication was the powdery dead leaves of the brush, which collect in the faint depression. The trained eye looking ahead can trace this dubious cue, though meeting it at right angles, one would see nothing and might cross it a dozen times, yet fail to recognize the trail one is seeking. Slowly the line of the western mountains grew higher and darker. The tint was not, however, that mystical azure that gives to distant mountain prospects the usual wistful charm, but a smoky, furnace-like hue as if the range were built of slag. I tried to believe that I saw the appearance of timber against the sky. Could that be my old friend the Cuyamaca or the Vulcan? It was cheering, at least, to imagine the green-plushed firs, the singing cedars and wise, sober pines up there, looking down with pity, surely, on the blanched, sun-drained desert, so old, withered, and gray. I felt pretty well withered myself, baked through and through. 
the interminable ridge of clay danced when i glanced over at it as if bent on giving me vertigo at last we crossed a wider wash that i guessed to be the channel of the san felipe creek one of those phantom streams that for nearly all their course run underground if they run at all tracks began to come in from some mysterious origin in the southeast then a patch of green appeared a mile ahead which i knew must mark borrego springs i halted by a palo verde that had somehow got lost out here and recklessly drank my remaining fish springs water it was hot of course and stale and flat but to drink freely with no grudging of tablespoonfuls was genuine dissipation it was only early afternoon when we reached the oasis of mesquites and arrowweed i found the spring of good cool water and we enjoyed ourselves for ten minutes before unloading on the bank above the spring there was an old cabin and behind that a fine mesquite here i off saddle then picketed coia among the mesquites which were at their best fruiting stage and left him to a dinner of unlimited beans followed if he chose by a siesta to match end of chapter twelve Chapter 13 of California Desert Trails by Joseph Smeaton Chase. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 A Desert Ride Borrego Springs to Los Coyotes. Borrego Springs is one of the important watering places on the Colorado Desert. Lying near the mountains, it is a strategic point in the operations of cattlemen whose ranges extend over the Santa Rosa, San Felipe, Volcan, and Cuyamaca country, and who once in a year or two may have occasion to drive cattle into or out of the mountains by the desert route. These drives are often for long distances, say from Arizona or Sonora, and in large herds, so that only the few spots that furnish abundant water are of service for resting and watering the stock. Borrego Springs makes a convenient one-day stage before entering or leaving the mountains. When I was camping here with some friends on another occasion, we were disturbed in the middle of the night by the arrival of a bunch of cattle that had just pulled in en route to Borrego Valley. In the morning, when the drove was getting under way, we were passing the compliments at the corral bars with two of the vaqueros. Names were exchanged. And who is that young fellow, one of us asked, pointing to a lively young puncher in red shirt and well-worn chaps, who was rounding up the stragglers. That young fellow is this fellow's wife, one of the men answered, indicating his companion. El habito no hace al monje, the dress does not make the monk, says the Spanish proverb. The old house bore testimony to many years of usage by cattlemen, surveyors prospectors and other haunters of the open spaces on the back door i found an elaborate decoration dated four months earlier the two men who signed it stated themselves to be in search of that old will-o'-the-wisp of prospectors the peg-leg mine and in lightness of heart had drawn a picture representing peg-leg smith himself looking at borrego springs from gold hill the great man was realistically shown mounted on a burrow, pipe in mouth, pick on shoulder, and Peg advanced as if hospitably greeting the beholder. Peg Leg Smith, who might by courtesy be called the patron saint of California prospectors, deserves more than a passing reference. In the course of this journey, I came upon his tracks so often that at times I felt almost haunted. To be for two hours in company with a prospector and not have Peg Leg come into the conversation is among the impossible things of life. I heartily wish that someone would find that mine and put the old eternal anecdotes and theories to final rest. Well, sir, this is the sort of thing. Dutchy can say whatever he's a mind to. I claim to know them air chocolates pretty blank well. C and I dry washed every blank gully from Dos Palms to Cargo Muchach, and I tell you, they ain't no chance for that blank formation in the hull blank layout. Why, look a here. Old Pegleg, he says, 
and off we would go once more into the threadbare history with the changes rung on buttes and monuments ledges and bearings till i remembered to go and water coea or put my rice to boil or whatever excuse came easiest to hand to make a brief statement of the case for the benefit of any citizen of the united states who may not yet have heard it this particular smith thomas l conspicuous among the tribe by the circumstance of a timber leg was a brother of that jedediah smith who ranks high among western pioneers thomas l became the leader of one of those bands of trappers who in the thirties and forties roved over the vast spaces of the west in quest of furs and adventure the peg leg itself was a souvenir of the adventures he having amputated the natural member himself when it was shattered by a bullet in the course of a fight with indians on one of these journeys the party reached the colorado river worked down the stream to its junction with the gila and crossed into california when they struck northwest toward the pass later known as warner's or the san felipe which was at that time the only known approach to the southern coast before reaching the mountains some of the party one evening climbed a low hill near camp and noticed that the dark outcropping rock was thickly sprinkled with yellow metal Strange to say, though the men were interested enough to carry away specimens, they seemed not to have guessed that they had found gold until the year of 1848, with the historic strikes on the Sacramento, turned all men's thoughts to one idea. Then it was found that the specimens brought from the desert knoll were phenomenally rich in gold. Smith was then in San Francisco, along with the rest of the world, in 1850 he got together a party to make a search for the precious butte before getting well started the loss of some of the equipment of the expedition put the leader out of humor with the affair and it was abandoned nor did he ever renew the attempt this is all ancient history and it might seem strange that the legend of peg legs find rich as it may have been should have survived through two generations but from time to time there have occurred seeming corroborations of the fact that such a wondrous mine, in just such circumstances of position and formation as are named in the details of the discovery. Indians figure largely in these later evidences, and not merely to the extent of word of mouth. There have been incidents showing that they had access to some rich store of gold in the region of Smith's memorable strike, and always the hints have been of buttes and of the mysterious black formation. These accessory details have not only kept alive the belief in the mine, but have extended the field of believers until the peg-leg mine is a household word in California. From first to last, though the last is yet unreached, the number of those who have gone out on this adventure must run to hundreds, and the tale of those who have never returned is tragically long. Hardly a year passes without two or three parties taking up the search following some new theory or clue. My predecessors at this old cabin were among the latest additions to the list. I may say here that a month or two later I chanced to meet a man who had recently seen them, safe and sound, but of course unsuccessful, well on their homeward way. As for me, though I am not of the breed that peg-leggers come of, and long ago resolved, following a well-known example, to die a poor man, yet I feel the fascination of the gold hunter's game, and have sometimes, over my campfire, played with the idea of sudden freedom from impecuniary cares by stumbling on a mine. Here at Borrego Springs I overlooked the very ground where, if anywhere, peg-leg Smith's bonanza is awaiting an owner. From all evidences, it could not be a day's march away. A little hill, such as I walk up any day for the view, but, behold, littered with nuggets that one could pick out like walnuts with a pocket knife. It was an exciting idea, and I almost resolved to make a practice of climbing all the little hills thereafter. But there came a soberer thought, of the poor wretches who had fallen to the lure, followed the gleam, and the gleam had led them on and on a little farther to the next rise, the canyon beyond, till the terrible badlands had them locked in their scorching maze. 
there to wander till, crazed and raving, they staggered and fell, scrambled with frantic terror to their feet and stumbled on, the thought of gold a frightful mockery now, till they fell once more and did not rise again. If ever the peg-leg mine is found, it would not be surprising if there are seen about it the bleaching bones of the fortunate ones who reached the goal. Then it should be renamed the Death's Head, and christened with the dregs of a canteen of seventeen palms water. Kawea and I kept Sunday very comfortably at Borrego Springs. For him there were mesquite beans in plenty, and even a picking of Bermuda grass. For me, shade and the thought of a bad piece of country in my rear. For us both, good, cool, abundant water. A roadrunner came around several times to make sure his eyes were not playing him false. Lizards with iridescent head and throat crept down the roasting boards and watched me with cunning reptilian stare. A few finches cheeped and twittered, the friendliest sound I had heard for days. A tour of the immediate neighborhood showed the usual incidents of these old camps. Cascades of cans, scraps of rawhide, horseshoes, rock specimens, and stove-in canteens. The corral gate was decorated with the skull of a steer, a satirical object for the famishing cattle as they shoved their way to the water trough. Among the names scrawled here and there were some that have gained a measure of renown in the story of pioneering in the Southwest. More recent were the autographs of a party of government surveyors, from Lieutenant Tripod, Chief Engineer, down to Pete Ortega, Chief of Ramuda. Slowly, the mapping of the dregs of Uncle Sam's domain is being completed, though it is rash to call anything dregs when date grows flourish on what a few years ago was marked unknown desert, dry lake beds yield priceless fertilizers, and any day the prospector's pick may strike a blow that will bring men stampeding in thousands to the latest El Dorado, perhaps within rifle shot of where I stand. History is always fertile in debatable points for students to quarrel over. Even in the history of the West, short as it has been within white men's times, there are matters of dispute. One of these is a question as to the route of the first Spanish expedition by land from Mexico to the California coast. This entrada, to use the Spanish word, was led by Captain Juan Batista Anza in 1774, its object being to make overland connection with the settlements of San Diego and Monterrey, established five years earlier by Don Gaspar de Portola and Fray Junipero Serra. The party, starting from Tubac in Sonora, crossed the Colorado River on the 9th of February, first picking up that stout old campaigner, Fray Francisco Hermen and Gildo Garces, who had already been knocking about for years among the wild tribes of the region and made their way across the desert, apparently at first keeping to the south of the present Mexico-United States border. On reaching the Cocopa Mountains, they turned north and crossed the line somewhere near Signal Mountain, finding water, it is guessed, at what are now called Yuha Springs. Traveling still north, the next camp, March 10th, was at a large cienega where the water and forage were so bad as to cause the loss of several of their animals. This place, which they named San Sebastián del Peregrino, is identified as the Carrizo Cienega. At this point, students of the records fall into disagreement. Some suppose that the expedition, keeping on still north, rounded Santa Rosa Mountain at Clay Point, where I had turned west for 17 palms, and then turned northwest up what is now called the Coachella Valley, entering the coast region by San Gorgonio Pass. Given our present knowledge of the country, that would have been the natural route, and many of the details set down by the explorers suggest that it was the one taken. The other opinion is that on leaving the Carrizo camp, the party struck northwesterly up the broad arm of the desert, which I had just crossed in another direction, that leads by way of Borrego Springs into Borrego Valley and Coyote Canyon that they now made their way by that canyon, and a branch of it now called Horse Canyon, up to what is now known as Van Deventer Flat. 
Whichever route they took, they reached high ground with good forage and water, and of the place, wherever it was, the gallant captain writes, This paraje station is a pass, and I named it El Puerto Real de San Carlos. From it may be discovered some very beautiful plains, green and flowery, and the Sierra Nevada with pines, oaks, and other trees proper to cold countries. In it the waters are divided, some running to the Gulf and others to the Philippine Ocean. I do not know all the parts of the routes in question well enough to venture a decided opinion, but from what I have seen, I think the southerly is likely to have been the one followed. Footnote. My Indian friend, Lee Arenas, tells me that the Cahuilla tribes inhabiting country adjacent to Coyote Canyon have a tradition that the first white men came that way and speak of a fight that took place in the canyon with strangers using swords. Anza mentions no such incident. His record of the natives hereabouts is that they were expert thieves and could pick and steal with toes as cleverly as with fingers. Further, that they made much play with their legs and feet, on which account he named them danzantes, or dancers. Lee also says that the Indians called the head of the canyon La Puerta, but this is the common designation of any point in the nature of a pass. In footnote. Anyhow, it was pleasant to think so, for, in that case, I was now on the old Anza Trail and should follow the footsteps of that picturesque company of padres, soldados, and arrieros for a good few miles. On this understanding, my Borrego Springs was probably the Awahe, a watering place of good quality that Anza or the padres named for San Gregorio, and where the party rested for a day. He notes the fact of an Indian rancheria village, and there is evidence, in the shape of fragments of pottery, that Borrego Springs was long the site of an Indian settlement. But that would be sure to be the case where good water was to be found. Footnote. It was the rancheria of San Gregorio, by the by, that was thrown into consternation, naturally enough, by the racket of the thirsty mules of the approaching party. On the other hand, it is related of the Cocopas that they were quite captivated by the mules of some pioneer of about the same period. I think it was Padre Garces. There were not many travelers on these deserts a century and a half ago. These natives had never seen mules before, and, astounding as it sounds, found them charming. Moved with compassion at seeing the animals hobbled, at night they removed the fetters and led them tenderly away to where a banquet of soothing pumpkins was spread. And when a jack fell into a quagmire, they all came to his assistance, took him in their arms, carried him to the fire, and warmed and consoled him. This is like the snug experiences of Nick Bottom. In footnote. I turned in betimes, and coyotes obliged with a lullaby. It seemed about twenty minutes afterward that I awoke to see the red pennon of dawn flying on the horizon. It was inspiring, however, to be now close upon the mountains with the prospect of being for a few days among them, with genuine trees, grass that is green, not gray, and perhaps even a brook to drink from. This variation from my desert program was for the purpose of getting mail and supplies at Warner Springs, the only postal point I should even approach until I reached the settlements of Imperial Valley. I turned now northwesterly, following the route taken, as I think likely, by Anza and his fellow explorers. To my right rose an isolated dark mass called Coyote Mountain, which Fig Tree John claims as his birthplace. One could hardly imagine a more unattractive place to call one's native spot, yet no, I remember the slums of man's cities. It is there one reaches the ne plus ultra of the hideous. On the other side, at a few miles' distance, were the abrupt foothills of the peninsula range, the high ridge of San Ysidro overlooking them and showing on its crest tantalizing tokens of pines. Near here, there is a place that has gained, not without reason, the unpleasant name of Hell Hole. It is a small bit of country, but so maze-like in its ramifications 
that to enter it is probably to remain. I have talked to a man who, with a companion, was once caught in this death trap. He narrated with vivid details the events of days during which they wandered about, trying gully after gully for a way of escape, and hourly losing heart and hope. Luckily, it was winter, so thirst, the deadliest enemy, was not to be feared, and they had food enough for some days. It was by mere chance that, on the fourth day, they stumbled out into the world that they hardly hoped to see again. There is a fascination for me in these ill-favored bits of geography, but in August, with a horse and but a gallon and a half of water, it seemed best to confine myself to guessing which of those furnace-like canyon mouths might be the reputed gateway to Hades. Patches of salt grass began to appear, mixed among wide expanses of alkali, salitres, as the Mexicans call them, for which this unwholesome grass has a liking. The country looked as if it had been flooded with a saturated solution of salt. In places, the very grass blades sparkled with the salty encrustation, and Cahuilla's hoofs kicked the stuff before us like snow. After a few miles, I saw something ahead which looked like a house in a windmill. This was a surprise, though I knew that within late years, land-hungry settlers had turned their attention to Borrego Valley. On close approach, the house proved to be a wagon and the windmill a derrick. Someone had made an attempt to find water, but money or patience had given out, and the wagon and tools were left to fall to pieces in the sun. I heard afterwards that the outfit had come by the same route that I had taken, but the men had lost their way after passing Clay Point and had been three days in reaching Seventeen Palms. Skulls and ribs of cattle, sometimes with shreds of hide upon them, gave token that I was in cattle country. Leg bones, being easy to manipulate by those ghouls the coyotes, are generally hauled off to a distance but the skull and ribs with backbone usually stay where the poor brute perished, and coyotes, buzzards, and skunks repair again and again to the feast until the ultimate remnant glistens in the sun, a melancholy monument. There is something especially ghastly about the ribs with their hollow griddle look. Perhaps it is because of the resemblance to the human skeleton in this detail that the staring emptiness has a horror all its own. One realizes the fragility of one's own frame and thinks, with a shock, What, am I such a drum? A speck of green that I had been watching for half an hour revealed itself as the homestead of a settler. Half hidden by a huge mesquite was a one-room tent house of fair size. It was surrounded by half an acre or so of cultivated ground, all that was possible with the feeble flow of water yielded by the well. The man was away, but the barking of the dog brought out his wife, a cheery little Devonshire woman who bade me be seated and rest, do ye now? The first question was, have you brought any mail? And great was the disappointment when I explained that I was bound to, not from, Warners, which is their mail station, 42 miles away. It appeared that the postmaster at Warners was under instructions Whenever he heard of anyone going through to Borrego Valley, which might happen half a dozen times a year, to press him into service as mail carrier. The next request was for a newspaper. This was another misfortune, and when I remarked that if I had brought one, it would have been a week old, the reply was, oh, that's nothing. If it was a month old, it would be news to us. Never mind, you can tell us the news anyway. This, I well understood, meant news of the war for Devon is England and Little, the country of Raleigh, Grenville, and Drake. So we sat and chatted of comb and tor, of torridge, dart, and tabby, and of the importance attached to scraps of paper. Then she must show me her garden, the wondrous beans, radishes, and tomatoes, above all an incredible rose that had borne six blossoms in the spring. I do wish it had one on now so you could have it would carry all day if you'd keep it in the shade. I do love a rose, don't you? She went on. Seems like I never can get my fill of them. Twas four years come Michael Mass that we took this desert claim. Yes, I've worked pretty hard over this garden. 
The jackrabbits are something awful and the quail too. I suppose they come for the water. My husband wants to fill up the hole where the water stands, but I tell him it would be cruel. And doves, they don't do any harm, though. I love to have them come. There must be five hundred, maybe a thousand, come round that little pool of an evening. It sounds like a hundred autos when they fly. This is my second turn at what you might call pioneering. First was in the state of Washington. That was twenty-five years ago. Seems like I strike mostly quiet places. Like it here? Why, yes, I think it's pretty good and a beautiful climate. Why, 106 is as hot as we've had this summer, and think of them poor folks down in Imperial with 120 and hot nights and poor water. A whiff as of recent baking led to my buying a loaf of the genuine article together with a little sugar, also a few feeds of barley for coea. A musk melon and two tomatoes were added as a present, when I urged her to take payment for these luxuries, she refused, but, as I was leaving, charged with three letters that had lain many days under the family flatiron, she became wistful, then said softly, You wouldn't happen to have a mite of that lard that you could spare, would you now? She could not bear to see me depart without asking this one boon. So we divided my little store, and I left with a warning that I must look out for snakes in Coyote Canyon. For several hours we plodded up the broad gray valley toward the point where Coyote Canyon came in. Other canyons were passed, their mouths almost choked with mixed colonies of Ocotillo and Choya. This is the most clannish of the cacti, holding the foothill benches for miles to the exclusion of other growths. These tracks make a strange appearance, as if regiments of soldiers in uniform of palest gray were issuing from the canyon and had halted on the slope for a review. One of these canyons on the west side of the valley is known as Palm Canyon, not to be confused with the other Palm Canyon on the farther side of the mountains to the north. I scanned it with the glasses, but could see no likelihood of water, so reluctantly passed it by. Once or twice, paler patches could be seen on the great distance of the plain. They were the clearings of settlers, but I saw no token of cultivation about these places. If water is obtained, as it may be by deep boring, a similar miracle to that in the Coachella may follow, for the soil seems good, or at least fair, in parts of the Borrego Valley. As we neared the head of the valley, the ground changed to coarse gravel and boulders. The Ocotillo and Choya took advantage of this congenial mixture to make a sort of devil's garden, to which one or two other choice spirits, like the niggerhead and deerhorn cacti, were admitted. Once or twice, in spite of our best care, Kawea got nipped by some imp of a choya. Much alike as the choya and deerhorn are, I found that Kawea had learned the difference. When a bit of the latter caught him, he dislodged it by giving a violent kick. But if it was choya, he came to a conspicuous halt, and waited for me to operate with pocket knife and pliers. At last we turned the shoulder of the mountain and entered the narrow canyon. Anza's Awahe of Santa Catarina may have been somewhere hereabouts, for it is here that Coyote Creek becomes visible. Below this point it takes refuge underground in the usual fashion of desert waters. At this season the stream was a mere thread of intermittent dampness, but in March, the month of Anza's passage, it would make more of a showing. Near the neck of a canyon, I noticed a cabin built of ocotillo canes. It consisted of one room of fair size, seven feet high, and roofed with brush. In spite of its chicken house look, it would make a tolerable dwelling for summertime on the desert. By the little pile of hay in the corner, I guessed that it was a cattleman's house of call. The ocotillo is a convenient material for such structures, and is so used by some Indian tribes who plaster the walls with mud and so make a house that answers for winter as well as summer use. This mud and ocotillo combination has a peculiar result. When rain comes, soaking the earth in which the canes are embedded, the seemingly dead sticks spring to life, put on leaves, and may even break into blossom. Two or three miles up the canyon, another interesting plant appeared. 
the agave a wild type of the century plant its circle of bayonet pointed leaves and ten foot pole of flower stalk make it conspicuous among the low desert growths deer bighorn and cattle are keen for the juicy flower stem and few of the plants would fulfill their destiny if it were not for the chevaux de frise that protects the citadel growing usually in close colonies the interlocking leaves make an almost impenetrable barrier so that the inner members of the group could only be attacked from the air thus the wild desert bees find the agave their best means of support the brush became heavier as we made our way up the canyon until at one spot i counted close together ocotillo agave desert willow smoke tree cat claw and the two kinds of mesquite we were both on the lookout for water and when a faint trickle showed above ground Kawea made for it at once sucking up a mixture of sand and liquid as if it were nectar of the finest tap i was not much more particular for the water in the canteen was too hot to be pleasant there is said to be a trail up this canyon but it was beyond my skill to follow it evening found us entering a jungle of arrowweed and mesquite in this we struggled for an hour hoping to fight a way through into clearer country the last daylight left us at an impassable place the creek close by but running in a deep channel with perpendicular walls impossible for Kawea to descend we turned and stumbled back for a mile in the darkness Kawea getting badly snagged more than once on stumps of mesquite when we could cross the creek i turned upstream looking for a place to camp reaching a sandy opening among the willows i stopped and off saddled gave Kawea a hearty feed and ate my bread and cheese by starlight breakfast had been my last meal sixteen hours before it was delicious to lie listening to the ripple of the creek and hearing Kawea nibble about these moments gain charm in proportion to their rarity and the desert traveller meets them seldom how true it is that happiness consists in trifles water a little bag of barley a few stars a loaf and cheese a tomato and a cool night coming that was about all yet even the mosquitoes could not disturb my tranquillity that long evening on coyote creek end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of california desert trails by joseph smeaton chase this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. A Desert Ride, Los Coyotes to Warner's Springs. I awoke to find the sun making a green and gold sanctuary all about me, a canyon wren showering me with cascades of plaintive melody, dove sympathizing from a dead branch overhead, and numerous bumps on face and arms with mosquitoes' kind regards. Kawea was watching for my first movement. With a little encouragement, this comrade of mine would become a tyrant. His annoyance when I am a half hour late is not to be mistaken. I knew the night before that I was not far from a small bay or valley about midway of the canyon known as Collins Valley, or to the Indians as Los Coyotes. This was where I had hoped to camp, and when, after breakfast, I went prospecting for my lost trail, I soon found that another half-mile would have taken us there. It had an attractive look, with a little patch of grass and tules, a palm or two, and many mesquites and willows, even a cottonwood. There was also an old cabin, another evidence of being in cattle country, though one may travel for many a day and see no cattle, to say nothing of implied mankind. I went back for Kawea and my traps, and moved to this better camp, where i resolved to stay for a day as i passed the cabin i heard someone exclaim well i'll be a so-and-so here's a man at last who are you anyway i glanced in and saw a big fellow stretched on a ramshackle bed that half filled the place he excused himself from rising on the score of having durn near wore his feet off yesterday clambering over these eternal mountains but hospitably told me to come in and share the casa adding there was a rattler around here a while ago but i reckon he's maybe left by now 
When I had accounted for myself, my new acquaintance reciprocated with the statement that he was Thomas McSandy. The name was not exactly that. For the present, a prospector, and that he had been grub-staked by a Los Angeles friend who was acquainted with a man whose brother, then in an insane asylum, knew of a gem mine, the location of which, as he described to some official of the asylum, was supposed to be somewhere hereabout. On this hopeful quest, he had been searching the surrounding country, and his stake of grub being about exhausted, he had given up the job and was striking out next day for home by way of Warner's Ranch. The gullibility of mankind with regard to lost mines or buried treasures is staggering indeed. The number and giddiness of these wild goose chases amount to a phenomenon. No story is too unlikely, no clue too frail to gain the belief of men in other respects judicious enough. The old Indians who, when dying, have spoken of some wondrous canyon in the Humbug Range. The prospectors found it Poison Springs, who at the last gasp had babbled of glittering ledges or placers, abandoned by them under stress of famine. The others, who in this or that county hospital have whispered to some attendant, the sure thing secret of the long-lost blue dog or holy smoke, to say nothing of the variegated legends of the peg leg. These must run into hundreds and their devotees into a veritable host. McSandy was but one of a long list that I myself could call to mind, to whose credulity no absurdity is an obstacle if their will-o'-the-wisp has the glitter of gold. But McSandy proved to have other erratic ideas. Before we had talked half an hour, he boldly announced that he was a poet. Nothing odd about that, of course. In these days of vers libre, we are all poets, if we care to say so. But in sounding for his depth, I dropped the names of Wordsworth and Byron. Ah, said McSandy, kindling, they could make poetry. Why, do you know, I can't put up any better stuff myself than what those fellows did. Durned if I can. No, sir. I looked at him carefully, but no, there was no sign of humorous intent. Candor, regret, perhaps a touch of surprise, but no more. I hastily changed the subject, which, luckily, was easy to do, for he had wrongs to relate and adventures to recount that would fill fat volumes. He was amazed, even incredulous, that his name and exploits as a detective in a celebrated case were not familiar to me was convinced that the other side still thirsted for his blood, and that emissaries of a certain famous organization were even now on his trail. He showed the revolver with which, while a deputy sheriff in New Mexico, he had got his man. He had lived everywhere from the Argentine to Alaska, and made and lost scads of money. He was full of tales of arsenic springs and poisoned desert waters, and of close calls in Death Valley, where he guaranteed a temperature of a 145 in the shade. Yet, oddly, with all these feats to his credit, McSandy showed a total absence of that sense of location which is all but indispensable to the desert man. He was even hazy on the points of the compass. McSandy preferred to sleep in the cabin while I spread my blankets nearby outside. The night being warm and not conducive to sleep, my friend unfolded new leaves of his career. I learned that he had visited Constantinople as a seaman on a United States warship, had also been a Michigan lumberman, and I forget how many other things. In spite of his lifelike details, his narrative was an irresponsible farrago that kept me on the edge of an explosion. From Turks we had come to Apaches when, I think there's a snake climbing up on the bed, he remarked in the midst of some episode. Can hear him creeping and creeping during his hide. Ain't them rattlers the limit, though? Sure death every time they get you. Say, do you think I'd better make a light and look for what he's doing? He struck a match, and no snake being revealed, concluded that was one of them blamed trade rats. But the snake topic, once started, is ever a prolific one. Did I know how a king snake kills a rattler? Well, sir, the son of a gun just naturally jumps on top of him, yes, sir, jumps clean off the ground and lights plumb on Mr. Rattler and does him up. 
Say, he's a son of a gun, ain't he now? Snakes don't jump, don't they? Well then, how about this? Up in Placer County, I killed a rattler one day, cut off his head and two inches down the neck, and then that rattler up and jumped two foot clear. Why, they're powerful jumpers, them sons of guns are. He desired my opinion as to the best course to follow in the event of finding a rattler with one in bed. To jump or not to jump, that was the question. I was strongly for jumping, but McSandy had his doubts. He feared that the rattler would get him ere he was halfway to the door and would strike even in midair. Yes, sir. I brought up the hoop snake legend. Why, yes, sir, McSandy responded. That's all right. I've seen them fellers many a time down in the Argentine. He puts his tail in his mouth and starts to roll and roll and... Say, I'd hate to have one of them fellers a-hoopin' after me. Joint snake? The feller that breaks up in little bits when you hit him and then joins up together again? No, I ain't never seen them do it, but I reckon it's so, all right. Twenty feet was his estimate of the length of red racers that had crossed his path, while as for speed, greased lightning was a weak comparison. He had full belief also of the deadly nature of the tarantulas, scorpions, and centipedes sting, with vivid instances to allege in support. When at last we had cooled off enough for sleep, his mind was still busy with snakes, and at intervals I heard him softly murmur, You bet, or son of a gun he is, until final silence fell. On McSandy's invitation, I had resolved to change from my intended route to Warner's and accompany him by a much shorter trail passing the Indian villages of San Ignacio and San Ysidro, places I had long wished to visit. I bade goodbye then to Anza and his band when the next day we turned westward and made for the mountains. I had meant to visit Thousand Palm Canyon, a second canyon of the name, the other had been taken early in my journey, which opens two or three miles farther up Coyote Creek. But through the glasses it did not look inviting, showing only the usual vast fan of gravel, boulders, and brush. I suppose the palms are hidden in the upper gorge. There were miles of tedious travel before we reached the foot of the canyon up which our trail ran, but we passed this before the sun was high, and it was still early when we commenced the steep ascent. Agaves and mesquite continued with us, but soon there appeared willows, sycamores, and occasionally a palm or two giving interesting variety. After a mile or two of warm climbing, we found a spring on the hillside and stopped for a rest and the luxury of drinking without the medium of a canteen. The ground about the spring was ablaze with a superb cardinal flower, Lobelia splendens, a plant which surely represents nature's last effort in intensity of color. Even more charming were a few wild roses. Meeting them here, their frank, innocent look seemed almost touching by contrast with the ungentle desert forms just left behind. The trail was far too steep and rough for riding. I was close behind McSandy, leading Kawea, when I saw my supposedly experienced friend stop and draw his hand across a lobe of the common Opuntia basilaris cactus, remarking that Burbank was a fraud, for here was a spineless cactus growing wild. Mr. Burbank was promptly avenged. It took a half an hour to free McSandy's hand of the worst of the hair-like prickles, and when we came to the next water and stopped for lunch, he spent an industrious hour in finishing the job. Though this trail is little known and not given on any map, it is plain, from the depth to which it is worn, that it has long been used by the Indians in passing between their desert and mountain villages. The rock that gave us shade was blackened with the smoke of ancient fires, and in the earth I found beads, scraps of pottery, and yellowed bones, some of which had a strong look of homo sapiens. Nearby were deep holes in the solid rock where generations of squaws had ground their flour. The trail now became steeper, one of the steepest indeed that I ever tackled. Kawea was a good deal worried, and often inquired with earnest gaze if I knew where I was going. We made progress by scrambles of forty or fifty yards at a time, sometimes in the bouldery creek bed, sometimes on slippery mountainside. 
The changes in vegetation as we climbed were full of interest, though the circumstances were not the best for noting them. In the wet creek bottom grew masses of the same wonderful lobelia, often six feet tall with flowering heads a foot in length. Sycamores and alders mingled with the willows, yet here and there the desert-loving palms held on, though the altitude was well over 3,000 feet. On the open mountainside, the wild plum was common, now hung thickly with yellow fruit. The California sumac, Rue Zavada, made blots of heavy color on the pale background of the rock. A little higher, the mountain mahogany, Cercocarpus, came in, an attractive individual bush, at this time silvery with the silky seed vessels. Then scrub oaks appeared, and next the ever-welcome juniper. Yuccas still held their own on rocky ledges, looking strangely out of place. Yet higher, masses of dull gold that had been puzzling me proved to be groves of the interesting Adenostoma sparsifolium, or false cedar, with bright red bark, slender foliage, and huge clusters of white blossom that were now faded to golden brown. The sturdy manzanita was another goodly sight, but most so of all, on nearing the crest, the pines, often sighed for, who now gave me kingly welcome. On this high skyline they were finely pictorial, and as much the unquestioned monarchs as ever. I have heard that it is a custom in mountainous parts of Spain to brush the face of a newborn child with a twig from a pine. I think something of the kind has happened to me, for among these trees, I find that my face unconsciously takes on a smile. It was nearly sunset when we struggled up the last rise and crossed the pass at about 5,000 feet. A short descent brought us to water, but forage was scanty, and, tired as we were, it was necessary to push on. Two miles farther we climbed a second crest and looked down on a little green valley. This was the home of old Santiago Segundo, the patriarch of the San Ignacio Indians. At the house we found Santiago, his son Felipe, three or four picturesque squaws, and a half-dozen unfriendly dogs. The old man was a memorable figure, tall and well-built, with features more of Egyptian than of our western Indian caste, and bearing a natural dignity from sandal feet to thick white hair, he looked the ideal Indian chief. Our request for permission to camp by the stream was refused, the only time I have been denied at an Indian's, but I could not complain, for the Indian has good reason to be suspicious of white strangers. It was dark when we came to a larger valley encircled by pine-clad heights, where we found the Rancheria of San Ignacio. It is a romantic situation, like an eagle's eyrie on a craggy crest of the mountain. On one hand is the desert, far and steep below. On the other, the long seaward slope, fifty miles as a crow flies, to the Pacific. Disappointment met us at the first house we tried, which belonged to the tribal policeman. But the next attempt brought better fortune, for smiling Mary Jane Segundo, the very type of good humor, made us welcome to camp, hey, anything we wished. This was a relief, for the day's travel, perhaps twenty miles in distance, had been equal to forty on the level, and I had not ridden any part of the way. When I made bold to ask if we might share the family supper, Sure you may, came the reply from the gloom where Mary Jane hovered with fork and lantern over a crackling fire. It was an excellent meal. Eggs fried to a charm, frijoles at their best, wild honey fresh out of the rocks, coffee at perfection, and such a biscuit as one seldom meets on this mortal plain. There was tasaje too, but not for me. I have had experiences with jerky that, after the lapse of years, remains a solemnizing memory. The household consisted of our hostess, her mother, who carried her years so lightly that I took her for a sister, and two cousins, Jose and Dionisio, the latter a boy. A good deal of laughter went with remarks, in their own language, of which we were plainly the object, it might well have been our appetites that were the joke. I was able to bring Mary Jane items of news of her relations on the desert. This made us doubly welcome, and it was altogether a pleasant evening that I spent in the smoky adobe. The room itself was worth observing, festooned with ropes of chile and tasaje, adorned with chromos of religious subjects, 
and hallowed by a tiny shrine with candle and crucifix. As there seemed a prospect of rain, we elected to sleep in the barn with the rats. My companion again attributed every disturbance to snakes, and twice during the night made a tour of the premises with lantern and revolver. As it happened, I killed a rattler a few yards away on first going out in the morning, whereupon McSandy declared that after this he was going to shoot whenever he heard them sons of guns snooping around. The daylight view of San Ignacio confirmed its attractiveness. The little valley was deliciously green, water was abundant, and the surroundings were almost alpine in boldness and novelty. The air was superb and the summer climate delightful. Eight or ten families make up the little settlement. Perched on the rocks besides Mary Jane's adobe was the mayonot or storage basket in which the Indian housewives keep their stores of acorns, pinion nuts, or other wild provisions. In the house were a number of handsome baskets for various uses, jars and ollas of native pottery without decoration but excellent in form bows and arrows with which dionisio as he told me was able to kill rabbits at forty or fifty yards throwing sticks for the same purpose and much of the paraphernalia of the old indian ways of life the rumor having spread that a man was taking pictures the children of the village assembled for this thrilling experience when i sent them for their bows and arrows with a view to characteristic group some of the young warriors returned with weapons taller than themselves down a steep road that followed the windings of San Ysidro Creek, we took our way for Warner Springs. This wooded country of oaks, pines, and cedars was enchanting to me. It seemed incredible that one day's travel could so change every aspect but that of the sky, though even that was a more cheerful blue, no longer a pale glory azure of the desert. Grass waved along the roadside. What a contrast to Choyas! Late flowers brightened the path, replacing gray burl weed and snaky ocotillo kingly oaks for dull mesquite whiny breadth of cedar instead of acrid acaline dust frank bird in place of furtive reptile it was a blessed exchange and yet and yet already i felt the magic the magnetism of the old wonderful desert drawing me back back to its dreariness, silence, and secrecy, its cruelty of heat and thirst, its infinite expanse, its ageless mystery and calm, its threat of death, its passionless repose. I am no misanthrope. I love my fellow men, indeed. I eagerly claim my right and mortality. But there is a presence in that quietude, a sense of wisdom and of the sadness that goes with it, which something in me recognizes as brotherhood too. The mountains, the ocean, the forest go deep in their spell, but the desert goes deepest of all. McSandy, anxious to reach civilization and supplies, had gone on ahead. Kawea and I were well content to idle in this elysium of roadside springs, fresh green fodder, and beguiling sights and sounds. Some few miles along, a neat little house appeared, the owner sitting patriarchally under its sheltering oaks. He proved to be Sibimoat, Capitan of the Indians of San Ysidro. Half a dozen young bucks were loafing on the porch, inert, hardly speaking, simply enjoying the passage of time, while their saddle ponies stood about with drooping heads. I had often known Kawea to act as a mutual friend and breaker of ice when we came among Indians. However far from home, he is spotted at once as of Indian breed, and often recognized as having been present at some fiesta or other foregathering. Aha! Where did you get that pony? Francisco Patencio Palm Springs, I would answer. Ah, see, si, I know. Good pony you get. How much you pay? And so we were launched. Indians and Mexicans never forget a horse, and more easily recall the rider by his horse than the horse by his rider. The San Ysidro Indians' farming land lies scattered along the course of the creek. For miles I saw below me little fenced scraps of bottomland planted with beans, potatoes, corn, or barley. 
the barley was being harvested with the sickle as it has been ever since the padres taught the california tribes to supplement nature's roots seeds and game by a little not too much exertion on their own part san ysidro village itself is a dreary hamlet of a dozen typical indian houses a tiny cemetery and a brush ramada for the accommodation of visitors to the yearly fiesta by now we had left the pines and were traveling through less inviting country so i was not sorry to approach a wide valley which i recognized as the valle de san jose or warner's ranch this tract of nearly fifty thousand acres is one of the last of the old land grants to remain unbroken since mexican times over the valley hung the smoke of a forest fire the road ran steadily down opening a view of the timbered vulcan mountains far to the south finding a trail that made direct for the settlement we plunged through thickets of fragrant chemise and glades ennobled with oaks and at early evening came to what was formerly the indian village of agua caliente some years ago the old population were evicted and their neat cottages coolly appropriated by the whites the place is now known as warner springs and has become a summer resort on a small scale the attraction being the hot sulphur springs from which it took its old spanish name mcsandy made for his old bivouac in the dismantled indian church apart from scruples on the religious score which mcsandy thought high-flown i preferred the open air so i chose a spot beside the warm creek for my camp it is reported by some old traveler that the indians of agua caliente were in the habit on cold nights of sleeping in the creek with a grassy bank for a pillow at this season there was no need to adopt this simple dodge further on my journey i found people in imperial valley soaking their couches with cold water before going to bed for better comfort on sultry nights on calling at the store for mail and the news i learned that two days after i passed clay point a party of three men met disaster a few miles farther south one perished of thirst the others barely escaped with their lives footnote while preparing these pages at least four cases of this kind have come to my notice in the local newspaper the latest a typical one reports the end of a prospector who was found dying beside one of the so-called poison springs on the northern part of the desert he had reached the place famishing for water and probably had drunk too much every year the desert takes its toll end of footnote end of chapter fourteen